told I need to step in to create like a buffer zone between some of the other hosts so that uh, the Valorant v Overwatch conflict may finally come to an end. But uh, between, uh, between you and me guys, I don't think they both realize that League's kind of already won that war. So, uh, so don't tell them. Don't tell them anything. But anyways, you guys already know why we're here. And if not, well, then you're in luck because we've got some of the best collegiate esports moments right here. Don't believe me? Well, that's okay, but uh, you know, here's your proof. Let's get into it. To start us off, we have the combo of Matt and Festive as they execute a brilliant mid-air handoff to close out game two and tie up the series. Ended here in regulation. Can Festive and Matt do it? Matt's there! Puts it in, and we do get the go-ahead goal. Is it going to be enough to end it here in reg? 25 seconds left right here. About two minutes since our last goal. Fifth total in this one. Is this looking like in moderately? Feeling thirsty? Well, if you are, then crollo has got what you need with these sick plays on Pac-Man. That's not always guaranteed to stock. Goes for the side special into that. That would have been an insane way to end it. Now looking for oh! the fire hydrant and guard. Slam dunk right there. Is they able to finish them off, David? At number six, see if you can count the ultimates here. Because when the dust settles, there can be only one survivor. But I don't know what Keen University are thinking. Well, okay, they're thinking it. What is going on in this fight? My days. Two to the bomb, three to the tile, one to the self-destruct. And it's we get the team. It's a, it's a lone diva. What baby is diva. happening? <laughs> no, okay. Here goes back there. You know what number play this is, right? Because J-Rod knows. And let me tell you. He's definitely keeping count. But it's gonna be J Rod who strikes first again with a nice headshot onto Boss. Gonna start oh moving goodness. down into Garage. And J Rod is just broached now through Garage. RP Small has been committed. Oh Lance oh! tries to take a peek, but J Rod's there. Finds Pigeon Mac. We're looking at potentially an ace. Austin gonna do there. Trying to scrape together some sort of consolation prize. He's blinded, and they're. Oh my god, draw. What a teammate. He's giving a. Oh no, J Rod around the corner looking for the ace. One shot at Austin. He finds the oh! ace. Good guy, Beautiful. draw. Gives it over. Love the team. A man down, the overtime clock counting, and the ball on their half of the pitch. Yet somehow, Stonehill manages to make it work in this crazy match against Buena Vista. Out and push right back out again. This is a game of inches. Who can aggress hers? And that's gonna be it. Joker from the long shot along the field. Look at this from the back of board. Straight to Joker's feet. The touch is so delicate. In what was surely a game-changing play here, Nichols State's Law pulls out a tire that can only be described as illegal to put the nail in the coffin against Missouri Western. That's awesome math already. On the bright side, yeah, Nichols has enough time to come through. No! It's three! No! Three. It's not one, it's not two, it's not three. It is three eliminations with Law's rip tire there. Absolutely incredible. Able to pick up a fourth, pick up a shy for the team kill right now. At number two, it's just a masterful display of edge guarding from Adelphi's Davian. Check it out. That roller is going to be a great opportunity to get in and pass, possibly even just through those arms. Goes for the down throw into forward or forward air, excuse me. A great combo. Could have found some great damage offside, and as that paint just racks up onto this mid man, that is more and more damage basically for free. Davion it's edge for guard. A bottom stage. My goodness, what a stall! Beautiful edge guard and English. And in our top play of this week, have you seen the movie Ratatouille? It has nothing to do with this play, but I think you'll see why we bring it up. Look at this rat, though. Look at this rat going up long, dude. Oh, he's got another. I mean, it's Ratatouille. They're chefing it up. I'm going to go find another. <laughs> Fozzy, quick trade, though. And they'll stall the push for now, but contain just a little bit here. We got a lot of PT already. Right click is missed. Oh. Yeah, right click is he was going in this round, so I can find anything but Tumble Blue. Fozzy with a quick trade. Oh, okay, let the rat do it all. Oh my. Phew. 
what a week and what a crazy set of matches we've been seeing so far. Now, with that said, we're just now passing the halfway point in the season, so that playoffs picture is definitely starting to shape up. Now, if you guys want to stay up to date with all of the ECAC action, then definitely give us a follow on Twitter at e Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a fantastic night. I'm Mr. Bepic, and I'm joined in the booth tonight by the magnificent Chixa. How are you doing tonight, Chixa? I'm doing pretty good. It is kind of surreal to be back in the booth with you. I think it's been <laughs> over a year, maybe a year it's and wild. a half. I got my start with you, so it's really wonderful to be here tonight. Uh, casting Collegiate Rocket League. We no love better. College Rocket League. Yeah. No better place to be right now than the Esports U main channel for some ECAC Rocket League action. It's week two. Both these squads we're about to talk about have a week's worth of action under their belts. And Chiksa, I mean, it's the start of the season, but still just about as hype as we can get. Absolutely. These best of sevens have been interesting already to start. Both teams that we have, one went to a game six and one went to a game seven. One with the win, one with the loss. So clearly they like to really extend these series and that makes it all the more interesting. Oh yeah, Army West Point, the team that went the full length of their best of seven, but unfortunately came out on the wrong end of it. And then UNC Greensboro Gold, the team that won their best of seven last week in six. So different sides of the spectrum right now in terms of where their, their wins and losses columns are at. But again, it's the early parts of the season. The buildup to, play, to playoffs is still very much still getting underway. So no better time than the present to avenge a loss or extend a win streak than now absolutely and uncg gold at least has experience i mean looking back through at their event history they've already competed mm -hmm. twice last season in the fall making a playoff so at least this team certainly understands how to play <laughs> in ecac of course that's why they have that win to start and i think army west point probably their first season as far as i can tell at least as this roster so getting used to how things work and if they could take things to the full length of seven i mm -hmm. expect that they're on that edge of understanding how to play up against all these other teams the fact that they've already got that experience going the distance in a series really helps a team, especially if this is kind of their, their first little bit of action in the uh, the ECAC landscape. I mean, playing in those clutch moments, you didn't get it the first time, but if you go the distance a second time, it's a great feeling to be back in a, a spot where you might be a little bit more comfortable now that you have some Game 7s under your belt. And just a reminder, all the series time, we've got two in store for you. They are best of seven, so uh, these squads have to get to four games to get the win in their column so if we do go to seven again army west point we'll be talking about that i'm sure you and i at length chicks uh, that they've been there before and we'll see how they fare against unc gold absolutely best of sevens what's important is adapting and overcoming you have so mm -hmm. much time in these series to make those changes figure out what your opponent does so well and find a way to combat that and i think army west point they should have an advantage they should be used to this best of seven and i feel like it might be ingrained in their heads that they're able to adapt and overcome Certainly, and UNC Greensboro Gold on the flip side. I mean, having a win uh, behind you, that's such a good feeling. They've been here before, yes, so maybe they're expecting to get wins, but confidence is key in these events because you usually don't have any experience. I mean, you and I were talking in the green room. You and I don't have any experience casting these players, casting these teams just yet. And so for these players, it's kind of the same thing. You don't know what you're going into, and you got a lot of time to figure it out with the length of the series being a best of seven, but the fact that you've already won want a series you know how to adjust mid series that's huge for a team absolutely so i think we're just resetting the lobby for them of course we want all players to be comfortable but i think they're finally we ready so we are here at game one of this best of seven army west point uncg and it looks like army west point will be the one to strike first Right off kickoff, no hesitation from Coco, came careening into that center circle and, and fired a missile into the back of the UNCG gold net. That's a great start for Army West Point. Again, coming off a loss to have that first goal scored within the first five seconds of the game, that's huge. 
Love that early momentum for either side of the field. In this case, Army West Point. We'll see what they can continue to do with that. Kickoff goal sometimes a fluke, sometimes just the nerves being on stream. Mm -hmm. A whole nother monster in itself. And we'll see if Army West Point can manage to do just that. Get comfortable. Find another goal. Earn that goal this time through some sort of passing play upfield, something to make it happen. It looks like they're making plays already, but that bounce just too far to put it on target just yet. Good pressure from Army West Point. They had to play defense for a quick second there in their own end, but they have returned to the offensive side of the pitch with some force, though UNC G Gold is going to do a much better job this time of defending. Put the ball back center. This is Light trying to set up a teammate there, but the defense all over the near post and will get out for a second. The Army West Point really dealing with a mountain of pressure. It's good that they're dealing with it currently. They haven't succumbed to any shots really on target or close. No saves to really account for that. Mm -hmm. And they're able to transition upfield now on this play. Hopefully able to strike. The shot will be there, but easily saved away. A demo. Army West Point coming through with aggression. But wow. that one cleared from end to end. And that will go on in. That was a seriously impressive goal because I was watching the boost meters in the bottom right there of UNCG Gold, and they had practically nothing. I mean, combined between the three of them, they had about 30, 40 boosts, and that is not usually conducive to good defense. But they find a way out, and they find a shot on great capitalization on a pretty severe mistake by Army West Point because they had UNCG dead to rights right there, but couldn't turn a goal in and then got punished for pushing up too far. Sometimes those things happen with risk comes reward, but also comes that risk really hurting you. And that way it ended up hurting Army West Point, though. They had that early goal tied game. We'll see if either team can find some way to come out on top. It hasn't even been halftime, only two minutes to left. So That's still pass. so much extra time of Rocket League for either team to make that difference uncg will find it there with instinct that started with an absolutely beautiful pass in transition it was rig that found light in the midfield to set up that offensive then light did the rest of the work in the corner that's perfect from unc greensboro they have done a lot more work in offense more more potent work than army west point because army west point has had more possession i, I think in this game one but uncg when they move into the offensive end they hit hard hard and they've hit harder than army west point has so far that's got to change if you are on the the blue side of the field right now because you got to do more with that possession you've been granted now down a goal it has to happen in the next two minutes an unfortunate touch and instinct is gifted with this one on the goal line you see right there up to the skies coco hits it right into his teammate and sometimes those mistakes just happen not a good time at all for that mistake. Army West Point stuck in defense for about 10 seconds. That was it. That was the length of the time they spent there and could not find a clear and a severe mistake. Coughs up a third goal now for UNCG Gold. That's a hefty shot on target, but the defense will stay solid this time around. Good start. Now a clear needed for Army West Point. 8-2 to two on that shot count between UNCG and Army West Point. Just a little snapshot oh. at the type of aggression that we have seen from UNCG. This is three back-to-back -back shots. A very last second save can rig. Wow. Put this one on in. Instinct finally able to find the finish. And UNCG just keeps adding on to the pain. That was a siege in the blue box right there. UNCG gold, just shot after shot, rapid fire on the blue net. Norman West Point, credit to them for staying alive that long as they were on pretty low boost and having to rotate back so quickly. The rotations had to be as tight as could be, and eventually you are going to fall. And unfortunately now, down by three Army West Point after getting that first goal in the first five seconds of the game, we thought, okay, they've got a serious advantage already. They can run with it, but that has not been the case. They've even lost possession battles since that point in this game.
They've certainly struggled, and I think that may just be the slight difference between the experience that I noted earlier between mm. UNCG having now third season in ECAC between Army West Point's first season ever. They're not used to to this level, this speed that is coming right. out of UNCG. Of course, they keep attacking the net, and it's so successful. They're finding openings because they're forcing them to open up for themselves, creating opportunities, generating them, and really finishing them off has been the game of UNCG. And it looks like they just need to hold on another 40 seconds to take game one. And they should be able to with this mountain of pressure that they are still putting on. Army West Point found a clear about 30 seconds ago, but it was a short-lived stint in the RNG. And instead, having to deal with shots like that, Light picked his mark and absolutely knocked it out of the ballpark. Top right corner, Army West Point, no hope of saving that. And again, it's Rig setting up the play. It's a gorgeous execution. This team has just excelled throughout this game. In fact, we're at the point of it being a blowout. Two more and we could potentially see a Brazil. I'm not exactly sure that's going to happen, but this is enough of a bloodbath to me that UNCG certainly earned this game number Definitely. one. Can Army West Point find one to go with the road? I don't think so. A missed opportunity there and they will need to recover in game two. They just need to settle down and take a deep breath in between games one and two. There were a lot of misses that I hope were uncharacteristic, especially in defense, and that allowed a lot of space to be given the, the UNCG way, and obviously, they have a we saw precise shooting, precise passing, and Army West Point just committed too many mistakes to put themselves in too deep a hole to dig themselves out of. So game two, we just have to see them hit the ball more. Honestly, Chick says it's, it's easy fixes for <laughs> AWP, and I hope they have it in them to, to take that extra step and combat UNCG at the point. Yep, UNCG, 15 total shots, five goals, four assists, very great goal participation across the team. Instinct as well, mm -hmm. three of those goals himself gets that hat trick. You noted earlier as well, Rig really helping out on the assist front and really causing his team to get goals because he pushed in that first man position and had someone else finish for him. Great overall job. The team knows their place. They know their rotations and positions. They understand what they need to do for success. Now is that time I mentioned earlier. Can oh Army West Point <laughs> adapt and overcome? But at this point, I just don't think so. There comes wow. a point where the playmaking difference of a team is just too much for a defense, no matter how good they're playing, to overcome. And that right there was a perfect example of what UNCG can do, what they have been doing. Yes, they've been capitalizing on mistakes. I talked about that in between games one and two, but there have been moments in offense for UNCG Gold where they pull out plays like that. The drop down from Instinct was absolutely pristine, and AWP can't do much against a play like that. Instinct again with the finish. He is the finisher for this team and it looks like oh. There may be one on the other end of the field a shady sunglasses I love that name able to find this one here a very quick turn onto that ball and finishes it off beautifully Plunged UNCG's transition defense into chaos right there. They were still trying to recover, and then they're being demoed by Shady Sunglasses down the field. That was a perfect play to quickly respond to what was a phenomenal goal just moments ago, and now potentially a lead for AWP. Now the defense will hold strong for UNCG, but the fact that Army West Point has recovered from their Game 1 beatdown and now is applying pressure to UNCG even after going down early on in Game Number 1, that is a testament to their resilience and if this keeps up then we got ourselves a series seems like coco trying to cause some of that chaotic energy up field a couple of contests army west point keeping uncg in their half can coco find the centering touch he oh. does late but shady sunglasses already left on that play 50s in the midfield, such a vital component of controlling this game, but it will pop out and Light able to find the finish to give UNCG their lead back. 
The aerospace has been dominated by UNCG. That is another instance. The ball lofted out in front of the blue nets, and whoever it is taking the shot for UNCG has proven that they can take it, hit it with pace, power, and accuracy. And a 2-1 to one lead, it's still a one-goal lead, but that's what they had about this point in game number one, Chicks at UNCG. <laughs> they started out from behind. That was not the case here, but they went up 2-1 to one and did not look back. It's just unfortunate. Army West Point really needs to contest earlier, find Ooh. options, make UNCG uncomfortable. They're given so much space right now, and they keep generating plays because of it able to connect with their teammates with that vision and it's been really wonderful to watch that success on the field for uncg but we want a good series we want oh this my. to go the length but what's just popping off right now a redirect here a field could that be any more beautifully done I can watch that replay about a hundred times before getting sick of it. That was an absolutely beautiful shot. Light pulled out of nowhere as well. I mean, sitting down the field waiting for some sort of pass. And if you're Army West Point, you, you see that developing because it's right in front of you. But don't expect that kind of shot to come off a Light's front bumper. Though they can still respond. A beautiful goal still only counts for one point on the scoreboard. And Santa's going to turn just a little bit too late. And Army West Point going to be first forced back into their own half. At this point, I'm starting to think it's just mechanics diff. Mm -hmm. UNCG has found such really phenomenal plays of field. How they keep connecting with one another is not an easy task to do, but yet they keep finding one another. And it's, it's creating such beautiful plays. We'll see if they can add more on, but Army West Point, they need to attack. Where's the contest on Extinct? It comes a little bit too late, and they now have no boost to get out of their half. A miss oh. here, though, for Rig may open the opportunity, and Shady Sunglass demoed with zero boost. Just sitting there. They're a sitting duck in the midfield, and that kind of sums up Army West Point's attack so far, though. It's a good start, and a relatively open net. The gap was closed, but it's still an opening for Army West Point. We'll see what they can do, though, Rig. I want to say not much as they break out. Look to pass center, though. Intervened with West Point doing a better job of stepping up, gaining territory in that center third. But they have to translate that into offense because with about 70 seconds left on this clock, they're still down by two. And UNCG very much set on making it three. A couple of bumps on that rotation could cause an opening for Army West Point. But they're still a little too late to the ball. The only other thing that I can note that's an issue right now for Army West Point is the boost game. Every time we see an Army West Point player with the ball, what do they have in the tank? Absolutely nothing or nothing. near nothing. When it comes to a UNCG player, tons of boost. It's either they're picking up those small pads and making the most of it, or they're just stealing the big ones and holding on to that boost pad difference. Boost. I mean, it's everything in Rocket League. You can't right. make a play without it. So if you see an UNCG <laughs> ends up keeping this boost difference, I think they're going to continue to dominate on the field. Well, 15 seconds left, and Army West Point need something at this point just to take into game three, because more than likely they'll be down 2-0 in this best of seven, and that double commit not going to win the ball. Instead, Instinct finds a teammate down the field. No surprise there. That's what UNCG did all of game two. It was just stretch passes down the pitch, and typically a shot followed immediately after. 3-1 to one, the final score, Army West Point. They... Did a better job limiting UNCG's chances that game, but they still weren't able to come up with enough on the offensive end to make up for their defensive lapses. I mean, again, three goals, all three of them assisted by one mm -hmm. another on UNCG, and I think every play they made was just such a gorgeous pass upfield. They know right. how to make those outlet passes. And I, I don't know, I really think UNCG just has maybe the better rank right now, the better mechanics, as I mentioned, the more mm -hmm. boosts. They're just playing that game a little bit better. All the fundamentals are working out in their favor. On the other side of things, they're up 2-0 in this series. 
Army West Point needs to take this next game, or at this yep. point, I think it's going to be a sweep. That's just how a lot of best of sevens work. It's very rare to get a, a reverse sweep in a best of seven situation, let alone in a best of five. One of the rarest instances in competitive Rocket League is that best of seven reverse sweep, you're right. And so that means Army West Point has to step up somehow. And like, like you were saying, I don't think it's gonna be the mechanical abilities of AWP that caused them to win game three. They have to get scrappy. The goal they scored in the last game was Shady Sunglasses up the field, finding a demo. And with that opening, taking a shot this time though, it's Santa finding an open lane to the net and they have to hit about every opportunity they get. Santa does that here. Honestly, they just need to win kickoff goals. Let, let Instead sure. of Army West Point, it's going to be kickoff goal point. Got it? All the time, here and now, keep getting those <laughs> kickoff goals. Since, I mean, this is their second one, could we potentially see a third? This one a little bit too far to make that connection, but it's good that they're starting with that early opportunity wow. that one just sneaks on in and santa has two early goal leads for army west point well it wasn't exactly a kickoff point there but it was certainly capitalized on mistake point that was very nicely done a side flip things got weird in that orange corner and that caused the defense to panic just a little bit and an open shooting lane developed like i said earlier army west point has to hit just about every shooting lane that they are gifted and that was an instance of them sending in a second goal with that sort of opportunity. So, great start to Game 3. Dream start for AWP. Now they got to defend for four and a half minutes. <laughs> Easier said than done. <laughs> you mentioned being scrappy earlier, and I think that's good to mention. Let's get those bumps in there. The demos. Just the... Yeah! The demos! Here they come! Please! <laughs> <laughs> That'll open up more opportunities for Army West Point. If you can't mechanically beat out your opponent, you may as well just try to mess them up. And I think, notably, they need to limit Instinct's opportunities to shoot since he has been the main oh goal scorer. Santa just comes on through with that save. That's a big save. The Army West Point really needs a clear right now. UNCG's doing that thing where they just swarm. They smell the blood in the water and they begin to circle like sharks. Oh, uh, clear is found. So big for Army West Point. Though, light in the air. Beats one as an open shot and they'll double at home. Absolutely gorgeous again. UNCG flexing their way to the midfield. That couldn't be any more beautifully executed by light. The mechanics out of UNCG. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I wish I could make plays like that, but I'm not that good. That's okay, because you don't need to have fancy shots to score goals. Instinct finds a well-placed shot to put that one in for UNCG. Kickoff point didn't look so hot right there. Too much creeping forward to that near post as the play went quickly through the blue box and UNCG was all over that defensive mispositioning by Army West Point. Now we're level again and you said it would be easier said than done defending for four and a half minutes. Army West Point couldn't do it against this UNCG attack for more than one minute. So their offense I think is going to have to carry the load here or else they're in a very tough spot in this series. We'll see what they can manage to do light in a 1v2 situation. Opening up in the backfield is a great demo, but UNCG still can't get this upfield. They finally managed to do so. Fantastic catch by Santa, but he's getting bumped on his area. The clear comes through late and light is already back on it. Four players mm. all in the same corner. Make that five but the 50 is one and army west point looks to charge up field that net was open for a second army west point good job not panicking in that kind of situation and getting themselves out of dodge though right back or to shoot his rig and they'll hit their mark no surprise there uncg up one you need to contest that ball that pass cannot be allowed to go center field that shouldn't be an open opportunity, but instead UNCG has all the time in the world to find that ball, and they able to put that shot right on target. A very well-deserved goal, and at this point, they have managed to give themselves the lead in just under two minutes. 
Army West Point are starting to struggle in that transition defense mode. There's a miss from Santa as they try to get back in the middle of the play. Shady Sunglasses bumped off the rock, but they do get back to it. Not in time to win that challenge. Drop down shot from Instinct. It's on target, but too slow for Santa to let that drop through. And Army West Point going to find their way out, though. Only temporarily. UNCG beginning to flex a lot of might in that center third. Just hanging around, though. Army West Point doing a better job of contesting that up in the air. Trapo was very speedy to that ball and that got AWP a chance in offense here. Just off target is the finish there for Shady Sunglasses. It is Army West Point able to finally push their way into a shot, a combined team effort to just beat out their opponent on the defensive side. Well-earned goal, tied up game yet again. Nicely done. The offense starting to carry the load just a little bit. Army West Point, they can stay solid for another 90 seconds. They've had opportunities in this game. That one was almost another, but Instinct got in the way just enough to make sure the shot wasn't on target. Final 90, and UNCG going to start it off in the offensive zone with a wonderful clear, but no real shot in Army West Point. Big boom to the other end. Comes light off the corner, easily contested. Shot comes through for Santa. Army West Point looking to get their lead back. Minute left, golden goal territory for either team. Do we eventually see overtime? Does someone manage to get that desperately needed goal? As we mentioned earlier, Army West Point desperately needs oh. this game in the series in order to have contention to win it or at least come back or else UNCG will be up on match point if they're able to end this here and now. We'll see what happens in these remaining 30 seconds as the ball has ping pong back and forth from either side of the field. Neither team oh. wants to give their opponent an option to score. AWP's close. That was a missed opportunity there with the shot just barely going wide and they continue this. They will have the last several shots in regulation, though. Almost one there for Instinct. Uncharacteristic miss. AWP the other way. Ball is centered, though. Two orange cars collapsing upon it. Still up on zero seconds off that back wall. Missed touch, but no one's there for Army West Point to capitalize. So we do get a little extra period of Rocket League here in Game 3. All tied up at three apiece. Is this a kickoff goal? Central, I think we've passed that early goal area, but UNCG still on the upper foot upfield looking to find themselves a passing play. Denied thus far, Rig able to find the uh -oh. center. Does he find another one? Just barely misses the opportunity. A floater here, instinct to keep it on, like the shot just off the post and Rig all the way, third man in rotation back, unable to come through until now. It was not a lot of boost. There still isn't too much boost on the side of Army West Point. UNCG sieging on the other end. Good attack by Santa. They'll move downfield aggressively to pressure that last man off the back wall. A miss. In comes Trapo to shoot. Goes far side. But there's a defender there to usher that ball out of danger. UNCG precarious there for a second. But their car control and mechanical ability get themselves out of it. That'll be the case here as well. Hard ball across the orange box. But... Nothing doing. Army West Point slowing things down here in the corner, but they've got possession. That's huge. Double commit, possibly a oh. triple commit. Everybody on the UNCG upfield ready. They're looking to take that risk, but the transition, they're already back in midfield to go and siege that net yet again. Three in the corner for Army West Point. Shady Sunglasses able to finally get some boost, and that'll inhibit him and able to get that upfield. The clears coming desperately though from Army West Point. They need to Good find bump. some transition outlet pass. This one's placed beautifully by Trapo and Army West Point finds the goal they need to win their first game in this series. 
That was great work. Beautiful finish by Trapo going far side with that shot, but that play developed because Shady Sunglasses was positioned aggressively upfield looking for bumps. You saw a UNCG player flying through that center to third, not really attacking the ball in any sort of way. That's because Shady Sunglasses had just gotten done pressuring them into that bad spot, and Trapo did the rest of the work. Phenomenal job by AWP to keep themselves afloat with that buoy of theirs in the defensive end. I don't know how it holds all all that weight, but even with their Lobu situations, they found clears, they found pressure on the other end, and eventually it was too much for UNC Greensboro Gold. Hey, they got scrappy, and it ended they up did. working on out pretty even, though, across the scoreboard. Both teams, same amount of shots at nine, just one different save, one difference in the assists, and, of course, just one goal difference that game. So both teams played pretty at point, rising to the level of their opponent after being down those first two games, and pretty difficult, 5-1 and 3-1 remember yep. were those starts and sometimes it's hard really disheartening to come back after such difficult really scores but they find their way they surge forward they get that first game can they get a second to tie this series up we will really see it's got to be their offense again. I mean, they, they they really shook things up there. They still lost the battle in the aerospace. UNCG, every time the ball was afloat in the blue box, they were up top, off the ceiling, off the sidewall, wherever, to hit a shot from uh, high up in the air. But in offense, Army West Point would find clears and then do work on the ground. Not the case there, as that was Trapo getting up and making a huge save up in the air, where, of course, Rig was dribbling the ball. But... The save was made, Army West Point finds the clear as well, and that's a good start to game four. Talk about difference makers, Army West Point now, Trapo has come alive in the remaining part of this series, getting of course that save just now, as well as earlier getting the goal to win that game in overtime. So. Sometimes people just rise to the occasion. He has done just that. Can he finish another one? This one is Shady Sunglasses to finish off the play. And Army West Point finally getting into the groove of things. Trapo returned the favor of the last game's overtime goal. They swept the line there, got light out of position. They should have been on the back post, but they were on the near post because they had to jump over, rotating out Trapo. And Shady Sunglasses hit the shot, almost did it again. Close opportunities for Army West Point. They're back in this series. Chicksa, I was getting worried after game two, but AWP very much starting to exert their will on a UNCG team that is, I imagine, a little shaken. Absolutely. I agree with you a thousand and ten percent. Oh. We, of course, don't want to see a sweep, but sometimes we fear that may just be happening. Army West Point continues to find ways to control themselves on the field. Here's a cross court. An early jump and rig is able to just put it in front of everybody on the field. Oh, that hurts. Santa just crept up a little bit too far. Didn't realize Rig had that much control of the center third in the ball as well. And uh, Rig definitely realized that Army West Point had misrotated right there and placed a shot on. That's all you got to do sometimes. Catching out the defense, the name of the game for UNCG because those slight mistakes are still in the game of Army West Point. If they can't iron those out, then goals like those are going to cost them this series. See what they can manage to do now on this comeback. It'll be UNCG that gets the ball upfield. They'll find themselves a great shot. Can they continue to put shots on field? They were shooting an absolute fest earlier in this series, but now struggling to find consistent passes and consistent aggression. Army West Point on the transition looks themselves to keep it up. A pass here, Trapo up just a little late, cannot find contact, but still the pressure is there for Army West Point and they are making UNCG nervous. This team just won't quit. Even when they make big mistakes in defense, it seems like 10 seconds later, they're on the other side of the pitch doing work in offense, but they have to do the aforementioned defensive grunt work to 
Score goals here. With two gone, we trapo all alone. Light off the back wall, drops it down. No one quite expecting that ball to be there, except for Trapo. He was able to usher it to safety. Now in the corner, clearance very much needed for Army West Point, but they'll get it only as far as light at that center third. Instinct in for a challenge, and they'll win it out right off the side wall. They go, but out of boost, so can't do any magical things that we've seen them in the past execute on the Army West Point side, so it'll be UNCG again resetting from their own end, but still looking very threatening. Say Instinct and Shady Sunglasses, that'll go and said to the Army West Point on that 50. Santa, not the greatest touch Looking to overcome is Army West Point, leaving the ball and faking this one light. Left back, able to control up field. It's been a tense oh, it's open. game at that. Open shot, open pass. Shady Ooh. Sunglasses comes through on the save. The tension just continues to build. 1-1 one, one. scoreline, just over a minute left. Could this be any closer in game four? Oh my, that net's open, for real this capitalized. AWP moved up awkwardly. They forced into an instinct into a tough spot and they hit it backwards by mistake. And his last man, that is the cardinal sin of playing defense in Rocket League. Great work by AWP again, finding these scrappy goals to get these slight advantages. Oh my goodness, Army West Point, they're making the comeback of a century if they're able to take this game that will tie the series two to two just when they thought they couldn't overcome they have done just that can uncg use their mechanics to the best of their ability in the remaining 45 seconds they will certainly look up field but awpe is ready to put it back right on the orange half they continue to rain shots in. They manage to find yet another, and they are just out of the chaos in the remaining time. Santa has another opportunity to set up a chance on net, though. Trapo side flip to chase. Sunglasses can't get back to make the, the best play on that ball. They got a touch, but it ended up in the back of their own net, and that hurts if you're an Army West Pointy fan. Oh, my goodness. Do we see another overtime epic? Oh my. D do we? My heart can't handle, handle another do one. Do we? Say it now. Overtime. Oh. When's the goal going to be scored? When do we think the goal is going to be scored if it hits overtime? A minute. Two minutes. Fifteen seconds. Two seconds. At this point, we may just be seeing that overtime. Only three seconds left. Up field. The pass down to the ground but oh, this no. one stays up can rick get to it no we see overtime in game number four awp's gotta be more careful than that that was an opportunity that would have been a uncg lead in game had there been about one or two more seconds on the clock and instead of triple zeros but they live to fight another day and that's a shot on forced two up off the ground for uncg rebound from shady sunglasses on net again forcing defenders out of position to make these saves but uncg more than capable and they'll get it to that center line trying to reset and grab more boost which they have plenty of they've got enough and all three of their players tanks to maybe execute a transition here but army west point won't let them still circling in that offensive end, but they have been slowed down now, and chances looking few and far between. Oh, I didn't know if that demo would come on through for Army West Foot, but they're not able to connect just yet. Santa upfield, the fake oh almost goes on in, but Rig able to find the touch outfield already over a minute in overtime in game four. Army West Point fighting to tie up the series. But yet UNCG, they had such a dominant start. They want that momentum back. Can someone find this finishing goal soon? Upfield, Army West Point looks, but again, attacked by UNCG, shot to come through and Trapo again, able to find the save. Another 50 in midfield. This one won by UNCG. 
Army West Point fighting on the back foot, only able to clear it as far out as midfield, where the ball just keeps coming back. That's not the uh, greatest. Touch of three in net. The finish isn't there yet for UNCG and RB West Point barely surviving right now. But they have survived, and Trapo will make their way out. Chance to shoot for Shady Sunglasses goes top right. The corner rejects that shot. We play on in this overtime that has given us everything. Pressure from both sides, gobs of pressure from both sides, I should say. But the defenses have held strong, and UNCG's defense going to hold strong in that instance. Moving forward, ball across the blue box again. But... There's no orange car in the area to finish that opportunity off. So, UNCG tries again. This time it's Santa that rejects and keeps this overtime going. But it feels like UNCG is gaining more and more agency on the field at the moment. Though a lot of it just got stripped away by that AWP clear. Saves a plenty. Eight on the side of AWPE. Nine on the side of UNCG. Everyone just denying the opportunities on the field and that has kept this series to continue to go on we are three minutes into extracurriculars someone is going to make that mistake it's going to mistake that ends it all eventually on the field it's not going to be the most calculated play we see at least i highly doubt it it's going to be something that seems so absolutely silly that they had to play four minutes extra five minutes extra time for it to happen on the field speaking of that it could have been it had santa not been in the area to keep a level head and intervene with that play now trapo down the field has that opportunity taken away by the UNCG defense, who now is a bit scrambled instinct, nearly bumped off, but they'll win the race to the rock and beat two AWP players in the center third to now set up UNCG gold in offense. We'll see what they can do with it. Still stuck in this corner is light. And with the play slowed down, it's be challenge taken after challenge taken. Good read by Shady Sunglasses to find Santa down the field. And UNCG unable to find the game winner that will put them up 3-1 this series and get them very close to clinching a second win in their back pocket. AWP just will not go away. The ice water float four and a half minutes into this OT. Do we see a double game at this point if we hit five minutes? It's almost looking like that AWP has done pretty well on the transition front, but it's been the defense that has just held sides of the field. Where's that demo? That oh, upfield no. demo? Did I say a mistake? Oh. This one not finished. It's too high and out. And UNCG had the opportunity to end it. They just could not finish. UNC oh. Greensboro squandering a lot of chances. This one, I wouldn't say squandered. That was a tough ball to get back to. But still, another chance going their way that AWP will be able to turn aside. Big clear from Trapo, though. They actually do pick up that center 100. Retreat back into their own end with and defend using. That shot blocked at the point of contact. Shitty Sunglasses trying to win a race to the ball. And they can't quite. Instinct there, though Santa in the middle of the play. That scrum in the orange box setting up Trapo for a shot that'll be sent high and wide. AWP pushed back into their own end once more, but opportunities abound. That shot short. Rebound from Light, no good. Second rebound, not there. Everyone's going back collecting boost. Boost, something that's been so incredibly important in this series army west point has been able to dial that in able to control it just as much as uncg but again someone cannot play 11 straight minutes of rocket league without doing something there horrendous to oh. open it up but ring finds the save on the goal line and the time continues like one of those ticking clocks that just never seems to end but you know it's gonna end and eventually it'll end but we don't know when it's gonna end because it just keeps on ticking we've got to be approaching record territory i mean six and a half minutes of overtime does not happen all that often i have been nothing short of impressed 
by both these teams in defense and in offense. Not finishing opportunities, but creating chances to find those game-winning goals, those pivotal moments in the series. I mean, whoever gets this third goal is going to have a world of momentum on their side. And so far, no one willing to step up and make that play that'll get you that mountain of momentum. Great work by Trapo to read the play and almost score an open net, though. Light back in time and... Well, 50 their way deep into the AWP half. Seven minute mark eclipsed and we're still ticking. Hey, Mr. Producer in the background, do we have a record for the longest overtime <laughs> on the Esports U main channel? If so, please ping me if we have almost reached that time. 720 in extracurriculars. There it is. <laughs> Instinct. <laughs> Frozen on the ground right there. That's just that's it, Chixa. I can't believe that's how it ends. He didn't jump! He didn't jump, Epic! What? What? Oh. What? What? I'm speechless. Instinct wasn't expecting a shot from that spot. Hey, they had rotated the far post to turn it's around. <laughs> That's the new record. All right, I, I'm disappointed. That's how it ends, but slight misreads will burn you in Rocket League, and Instinct got burned right there. That one stings if you're a UNCG fan, but Army West Point fans, rejoice. You've tied up this series in an emphatic way. They said that even might be a new ECIC record. Wow. They just blew everything out of the water. I need mean, not to mention 20 shots. And, and like 11 saves and the other side 17 shots and 15 14 saves hello oh my goodness i i just what what, what can we say more what what can we say 12 well, minutes and and change of rocket league well if you are either team right now you really need those deep breaths to recollect yourselves because I awp got the breath. win and that that kind of helps with the fatigue you feel after a game like that but if you're uncg gold that's deflating you had a 2-0 series lead that's now gone moment and this series is tied this is an incredible best of seven we're seeing right now not to mention the minimum amount of games we now see is six yep in this series I mean, they just keep extending the series in more <laughs> ways than one. I mean, we've already gotten about five games worth of Rocket League played mm -hmm. time-wise, but yet we still have another minimum of two games to happen. So we're just going to be waiting for these teams to figure out some technical difficulties. So, um, epic. I usually don't yeah, but... like technical difficulties, but this is a, a very good moment for technical difficulties because those players have got to be feeling it right now. Hand sh I mean, this is why I don't compete, but I know my hands would be <laughs> shaking right now. Like, I, like, I like one of those, you know, the shake weights, the, the exercise things that you, you exercise your forearms with. That, that kind of speed, but in both my hands. And it's very hard to hold a controller or play with your keyboard and mouse when your hands are that violently shaking. <laughs> I'm trying to picture that. That's kind of funny. <laughs> kind of funny, not gonna lie. Anyways, that big tradition now. Best of three left. The series is continued. Who wins this series? Oh my. I mean, UNCG should be ahead in this series. They should have won by now, in all honesty, with how good their offenses look, with how, with how potent the plays that they can create. But Army West Point just has an aura about them that they won't quit. They will not go away. I'm going to go with them in seven just because I would love to see this series in seven or essentially nine games with all the overtime I assume we're going to have played <laughs> by the end of it. But Army West Point's my pick. UNCG a tough out. Chicksa, how about you? Hmm, I'm going UNCG in six. I say they Makes regain sense. and take both of these back. I say two loss. They're so angry now. They come back. Oh they get back in it. But... Of course, I just want some good Rocket League, and thus far it has been a phenomenal Rocket League on the front. UNCG angry! The demo on the goal line to open up a play, but nobody there to find the shot. UNCG fighting to get that lead back. You know they want it just as much as AWPE wanted to get back in the series, and they did just that. This is a game now of desperation 
on both sides and you can feel just how much emotional impact is on the field. You can, and honestly, a little surprising to to my knowledge, it feels like AWP is the team playing with more urgency at the moment. They're winning more races to the ball. We'll ignore that one. That was great speed from Rig in defense, but AWP has really stepped it up in this game five. They're continuing the momentum gained in that last game. Those shots off the crossbar up until this point have thwarted their scoring chances. Trapo finally finds the back of the net for an AWPE lead. Trapo, absolutely crack out. He has just been on fire <laughs> this past couple of series. I'm just saying, he facilitated that start earlier, that save, and that goal in overtime, and that has given that momentum shift to AWPE, and they have just rolled with it. Five shots in the first two minutes, UNCG with a zero. Clearly, someone right now is just beating them out, and that is AWPE. Trapo wasn't cracko enough on that play, though. <laughs> he didn't find <laughs> contact in what was a relatively open net situation, though. But how AWPE has been playing in this game, as long as they keep controlling the midfield nicely, they should be all right. But they coughed up a shot chance. The rebound is on target, but Shady Sunglasses back on time to make sure it's not in. 1-0 we remain, but AWPE starting to let mistakes creep into their game. And UNCG, that's how they made their money previously in this series. That can't happen again. Consistency can be everything. It's something that I don't think we've really touched on just yet in this best of seven series. But when the game is so long, you need consistency. You need to be able to rely on your fundamentals. Since at any level of the game, you're going to make mistakes. They're just bound to happen. Whether you're right. in the pros or whether you're in bronze, you're, the amount of mistakes is the only difference. But There's the one. mistakes will happen. And when they happen throughout the series, those are the plays that you can make off. Rig passing to light, Shady Sunglasses jumps too early. He needs to stay patient there. That first shot was not gonna be on target. He needs to right. wait for the second one. So as the game continues, you're gonna get that fatigue and you're gonna see who has those fundamentals in order to stay consistent and win the series out when it gets so long. UNCG trying to build upon the tie game that they have just found themselves back in. 100 seconds on this clock and offense. All UNCG lights all over that play. AWPE got bodied in their own box and UNCG up 2-1. <laughs> all hail the almighty light just bodies, as you said, the defender on the goal line. I mean, if you can't beat them, just bully them, right? Maybe, <laughs> they didn't just maybe body not one that defender. one. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, that's true. They they bullied the whole roster, but we don't we don't condone that here. Only only good Rocket League plays, and that's what UNCG is about to pull out. <laughs> we hope to see it. AWP now down by one. They look to get back, really merge that difference. I mentioned earlier in this game with two minutes down, AWP with five shots to zero. At this point, they now have seven shots, but two, seven. UNCG has been able to tie that shot count across the game, but that won't matter since all it takes is one to finish it off and another mistake play. Nobody contesting this ball. Shady Sunglasses finds himself another. Great shot. Shady Sunglasses knew they had to go far side with that. And we've seen a little bit of the inaccuracy bug plaguing both these rosters, in all honesty, in this game five. But there, uh, not the case. Two to two, AWPE now trying to build off of the tie game that they found themselves. Then we re reverse the field with AWP having to respond a second ago. They do, and now they have to respond to this, rushing back into the middle of the play. Make sure UNC doesn't have any easy opportunities because at this point, Ooh. easy opportunities, if you're giving Ooh. those to your uh, opponent, then you deserve to lose games. I was scared for my life there and I wasn't even the one playing. So many bumps right on the goal line for UNCG, but they can't finish Miss. it. Here's an opening and this shot misses the target wide right. 15 seconds, Bepic, another overtime. It's looming. Can they finish in the last 10 seconds? AWP may have an opportunity. 
Trappo out center field. Shady sunglasses shot too wide. This one bound to touch the ground. Overtime in game five. A AWPE fan should be happy about this. Even though they didn't get that zero second goal to take it in regulation, they're 2 0 in overtimes in this series. Could make it 3 0 with that opportunity. Trappo wins the ball outright, turning on his shady sunglasses, but. No real shot developed. Unlike that, Santa on net. Defense holds for now. And as third man, Trappo has to turn back. 1v1. Have they been beaten? No, not quite. Shady sunglasses, though, rotating back into the play. Ending up with an instinct goal to end it. And I think that was actually an own goal. No. No. Oh, dear. I cry. Sob. <laughs> Absolute sob. You and CG able to come back with their first overtime game in game five. They win it pretty early on. And the mistake that plagues the goal line defense of AWPE to finish that game. Another absolute close game. Almost even on the scoreboard for either side. At this point, UNCG has match point. Yep. But I just don't know if I think they can finish. I mean, I predicted they'd win this next one. Keep that in mind, just in case I'm right. Because, you know, casters are always right. Or whatever. Of course. Or we're not. <laughs> well, um, I, <laughs> you're, you're right, first of all, the casters are always right. And you're also right in the sense that that, that didn't feel like a game that UNC Greensboro should have won. I, I think that's the first game in this series where Army West Point had the majority of the advantages. They had the best opportunities, and they just committed too many mistakes, I, th I think, in defense to come out on top of that game number five. So, 3-2 in the series, UNCG, I mean, at the beginning, you and I would have both predicted this to be the case, but now... I'm not so sure. Army West Point has really battled back, and now they got to force a Game 7 just to stay alive in this series. Possible Game 7 afloat. Oh. Saves like that. They're going to make us even more nervous. I think that's been the general feeling anxiety. So much of it. This game, a miss here. Someone for the opening. Santa gets there way too late. We're, we're getting into the, this game has now lasted over an hour. Can these teams play for over an hour straight? We get the real gamer hours here. <laughs> Let's see who can finish it out and score first. It will indeed be AWPE with first blood. I mean, these are real gamers, and we've seen that throughout this series. That just keeps <laughs> going. Great finish by Shady Sunglasses. That's a real gamer name and makes a real gamer play being on top of that situation. Realizing that UNCG was in a sticky situation again in defense. They've been forced out of position a lot in this series by Army West Point. And that's another instance where AWPE forces the defense to an awkward spot and capitalizes on it with a goal. See if they can continue to capitalize on opportunities. A fantastic a save by Shady Sunglasses. And you're correct. In the past, also connecting this one, a drop down, sent up field to instinct, patiently waiting, the touch a little too strong, but he's unable to find contact. Instinct, so icy earlier in this game, has just fallen off, maybe the nerves oh. playing, but as I say that, he comes back through. I just, you know, needing to bug him a little bit. And there he goes and makes a play. That is not an easy shot coming from that angle. That was a much needed finish too because UNCG for the first time in a little while had strung together a series of consecutive clean beats to the ball where they had outright one possession and gotten the ball into the spot that they wanted it to be in. So 1-1, one, one, they create their own goal scoring opportunity and tie us up. Three and a half minutes left to play. It feels like we've already gone through four and a half minutes of this game, but there is still so much left to be seen in this game six. Absolutely. Time will continue to tick down slowly, like we said, but seemingly never endingly, especially if the score stays even. But one thing we know is it's been pretty rare for these teams not to find another scoring chance throughout the remaining min minutes. Instinct will see if he can create an opportunity with the rest of the UNCG scene. 
They'll again try to connect themselves upfield, but the jump's too early. They need to remain calm. Take those deep breaths, as you mentioned earlier. UNCG, they have the mechanics to play in the field. They just can't let those nerves get the best of them. Mistakes are plaguing them right now between misses and backflips and just not the touches that they need to execute on the field. Well, this, that's two touches that Rig needed to get it down to instinct. Perfectly played in the AWPE corner by Rig right there. They were the facilitator early on in this series, and they're the facilitator here. It's net UNCG gold, their spot on top of the scoreboard for the time being. But we were here in the last game. This is what got us to overtime. Army West Point was down a goal in this exact same spot, and they found an answer quickly. Two minutes and change. Shady sunglasses shot oh. it. It's off. It's off the post. Just barely pokes its way away. Army West Point still has time to come back in this one. And they have an opportunity as well. Santa getting it centered to either one of his teammates. They were both right there. Shot taken by Trapo, and it is turned aside by the defense of UNCG. That's a big clear down the field. And of course, there's an orange car in the vicinity to make a play on it. Though Rig couldn't do too much with it. And again, the same case. It's Instinct that steps up. Takes a shot, though. Easy save for the likes of Shady Sunglasses. A clearance necessary for Army West Point. Trapo's got some space to work with. Has one to beat. Can't do it. Light keeps the ball in play for UNCG Gold. At this point, they're just wasting clock. They're minimizing opportunities for Army West Point that really need... They need at least one good opportunity in the next 70 seconds, obviously, to keep themselves afloat in this series, but they're just playing defense at the moment. Instinct. The 50 in the midfield. Can UNCG just buy themselves more time or maybe Ooh. more of a buffer light? continues to eat those Wheaties. Another bodied play on the goal line gives themselves the lead. UNCG, they're fighting. This is the end all be all. And they're a minute to win this one. And for the last several minutes, UNCG is back to their controlling ways. This is the team we saw in games one and two that controlled the possession game so well with their mechanical ability and their ability to read the game a lot better than their opponents. AWP stepped it up the last couple of games, but and the one that they need the most to force that game seven, it has not looked good for the last couple of minutes. Mistakes abound and challenges lost. The boys in blue, though, it's improving a bit when it needs to. 30 seconds left, and a clear was found a second ago. Oh, they have to return to that former state of glory. Consistency, Ooh. mechanical ability in the favor of UNCG, and it took them a little while to get back in their groove, get back in the control of the game that they liked, but they've managed to get back to their old selves. Four goals all four assisted again. They have connected in more ways than one in the remaining time of this game. And that has continued to give them success. Ring, Ring puts on another, just more back onto it. And we see the scoreline that we saw in game one. It just took them a while to get back into it. This is the uh, epitome of my statement earlier that we've seen UNCG return to their former state of glory that they had in uh, the first two games. One back for AWPE, and they would need a miracle. I mean, as casters, we're always supposed to say it's possible, Chixa, and it is mathematically possible for them to tie this game up, but I'm not so sure it's happening. Oh, no, no, no. This is over. This is done. Okay. Done deal. UNCG has relived their potential, came out strong, finishes it with that save, and they might, my prediction, look 100% correct. Great work by UNCG, especially in that, that game five was, I think, the difference in that series. Army West Point had just battled back, had just won that long overtime, and then we go to another overtime, and the game immediately after, and UNCG weathers the storm. They played a lot of defense in that game, and they still came out on top, putting them in a good position here in game six. I think we saw the effects of those good feelings in the, the five to two scoreline. So they, they cap off a, a very rocky series, and 
get to 2-0 on the season. So they got to be feeling good. That was a hard-fought series, and they got the W. And I got my prediction right. Sorry. Yes. I just need to make sure I, I say that a couple more times. I'm always right. No, no, no. But yes. Anyways, <laughs> that was our first best of seven tonight. And I think it was a phenomenal one to start off. In fact, we said it earlier. It's more of a best of nine with oh. how much oh. overtime. I mean, <laughs> records were broken, guys. Hear it now. We got to see it. But yet, we still have one more best of seven to see. So I think we're going to be taking a quick break, and we will be right back with more ECAC action coming right up. I really think that there's been a sorely missed opportunity for developers to take a step back from competition and take a step forward with community. Mm. Um, and if, if they do that, I think we all win because community, I would argue, is the one thing that no one's trying to solve. Mm -hmm. We're trying to solve recruitment. We're trying to solve competition. Tell me where's community. Mm -hmm. Honestly, any one of you, go ahead, shout out what's the national community for Scholastic right now. Any title, tell me. Yeah. Where do I go? How do I meet and hang out? Of the storm. How does you community zero? There's yeah. nothing. It, it yeah. doesn't exist anymore. And it doesn't exist statewide. It doesn't exist school wide. It doesn't exist region wide. It doesn't exist nationally. It doesn't exist digitally on Twitch. It doesn't exist digitally on Discord. It doesn't exist through any form of skill based development. It doesn't exist on any form of, you know, uh, skill based learning or just pure socialization and fandom. Mm hmm huge missed opportunity you want to take their time and make it more efficient in my opinion uh tell riot scholastic politely to stop what they're doing with competitive and their integration with lcs should be you know uh twitch you know symposiums and summits and conversations and learning and uh all sorts of wonderful things and promoting camps and educational learning activities and rssa sponsored curriculum that will move the needle. I don't see any of that. So Chris, that was that was pretty much the last topic. You you kind of wrapped it in a nice package called community. And I was kind of thinking more from an organizer and a broadcaster point of view around growing fandom. And how do we get fandom around collegiate esports to look more like traditional sports across the board? And, um, you know, that helps us go out and sell sponsorships in the place of which trickles down to all our member schools that we represent. But when we go to brands and we can't check that box of, you know, a billion impressions and a million views, um, we still are challenged with selling those sponsorships. So my last and final is, do we have any secrets around how to grow fandom or grow community on let's just start with on campus i mean I got the big one real quick okay best way to grow community food nights it has nothing to do with playing the game i'll give you a real life example we used to do dollar burger night at the university of cincinnati we would just go out to bar louis we used to have bar dollar burgers every wednesday we'd post in in at this time those facebook groups tell people where to show up six people 12 people showed up the first week by the third month we had 40 plus people coming and it was the biggest revenue night of the week for bar louis every week purely because of us but we had friendships we had relationships we had roommates we had all sorts of great wonderful things come from that and that translated to our lands our club meetings and everything from that mm -hmm. it was uh, nothing beats food nights um just like pro sports we need to focus on tribalism and the way that you create tribalism is you have to prioritize in-person experience, in my opinion. Um, I think that there's a lot of companies trying to become unicorn online platforms. But at the end of the day, I think we need uh, pockets and hubs around the country that serve as, as regional and local hubs. Um, mm -hmm. once, you, once you get a group of people together that share their love for the team that is on their campus... They start to develop a bond 
around that. Um, you can do that online, but it won't be nearly as effective. Mm -hmm. um, professional esports is is having this tribalism problem because it's the majority of it's online. It was it's resulted in um, fans following players more so than than the teams. I mean. That that's a pretty broad topic, though. Like we're starting to mm -hmm. see those trends in traditional sports as well begin start to occur. Um, people will follow LeBron and and specific players on different teams to wherever they are. Um, but I think I think for collegiate specifically, um, schools need to create meaningful live experiences. And if we're talking explicitly about fandom, you have to make the students on your campus care about the team uh, mm -hmm. first. Uh, that that's 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 the biggest thing. Um, either you create a level of pride through community engagement, or or through the team itself. Um, at a lot of schools, the groundwork is there for this. Welcome back to the Esports U main channel. Still Bepic and Chixa, and we're not to the next series just yet. We've actually got an interview coming up with UNC Greensboro Gold's Instinct. Instinct, are you there? How you feeling? I'm feeling all right. I feel like I just played like 20 games of Rocket League within <laughs> about 40 minutes. So, Well, you, you essentially did. That, that's what it felt like. And <laughs> the first question I'm going to ask you is definitely the culprit of that. Everyone watched it, the seven-minute overtime that you guys unfortunately were on the wrong side of. Where were you guys at after that game? How are you feeling? Horrible, actually. I was, like, borderline asking Rick, like, hey, look, call a timeout. I got to take a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, you could kind of see it at the end of that overtime. I just got wound up in net and couldn't get around to make the save. But yeah, it was a very long overtime. It it felt much longer than seven minutes. I'm sure. <laughs> what was your game plan going into game number five after that? Since you guys did regain, you got those two games after the two overtime losses. So what was going through your mind? Did you give yourselves a pep talk? Did you talk new strategy? What was your way to come back in that series? Um, well, after that game, I kind of talked to Rig. I said, hey, I want to, I, f I felt caught up as third a lot that game. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we just kind of focused up and I started getting at it more, like going for stuff that uh, in game four, I wouldn't have gone for. But yeah, that was pretty much it. Just kind of focusing up and ending out the series. So was that what let Army West Point back into was like a lack of confidence in your challenge game or what, what allowed them to win those two overtime games in games three and four to get back in the series? I'm not sure. Uh, I think what allowed them to, the main thing was they, I noticed both of those games, they had more shots on net. So I think they held more pressure against us. Um, we kind of fought back through those games, but I think at the end of the game, uh, what decided it was the fact they had more shots. Makes sense. Well, congratulations. A well fought victory. Of course, is there anyone you'd like to shout out, give some love to before we let you rest up after that long series? Yeah, I'd like to shout out my two teammates, Light Rig, all of UNCG Esports, especially the Rocket League teams. So, but that's it. All right. Well, Instinct, thanks for joining us even after that very, very long series. Go take a nap or something. I We, we appreciate it. <laughs> I'm going to thumb brace. <laughs> my thumbs are killing me. Oh, yeah. Right. Heal right. up. All right. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you. We got one more series coming up of Rocket League UA Albany versus CSI in just a little bit. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Collegiate Esport Commissioner's Cup 2022 once again. I'm still septulence, but this time I am joined by the CEO of New Street, Eric, who's going to get to tell us about NFTs, which I'm really excited because I told you this before the interview. I'm, I know nothing. I'm like a newborn baby about this. Yeah. So I, I would love to hear <laughs> kind of about what you do, and then we can talk a little bit more about the esports side of things. Yeah, so absolutely. We'll get into the NFT side in a second. But just to quickly explain what I do, yeah, of um, course. Eric Witchin, thank you for the intro. Um, <laughs> CEO of New Street, and New Street is a media and analytics platform for collectors. 
Um, so you can think about it as like the, the world of collectibles has, has grown significantly over the last five to ten years. Um, and what's happened is we've, we've had a lot of marketplaces evolve. So places yeah. that are going to sell you things. Like if I want to buy a pair of sneakers, I have to go to no less than 10 to 12 websites in order to figure out the best price. So, right. you know, the value proposition for us starts with, you know, as a collector, where can I buy these things on the internet and where can I get the best deal possible? And then furthermore, we add media and insights, um, you know, sort of like a financial technology company would do, but around things that I personally care about a lot more right. than stocks. Right. So, so that's, uh, that's us. Absolutely. So looking at it, you know, NFTs being one thing, esports being the other. Yeah. Where, where's the oh, link? Yeah. Where's the connection so, there? So first off, let's demystify NFTs a little bit. Oh yes, please. So, so first of all, an NFT is 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 the first time in human history that we've been able to prove that something digital is scarce. Yeah. You need to take that in for a second. So basically. You know, we've been creating things on the internet and with digital art and otherwise for many, many years. Uh, we're buying in-game items, we're, we're doing a bunch of things, and we've been taught that because you can copy and paste those things, they have no value, right? Enter the blockchain, and the blockchain allows us to be able to prove that something digital is truly owned by one particular sure, person. Sure. So you can copy and paste that thing as many times as so you want. Is it like you a don't certificate own it. then? It's absolutely like a certificate of authenticity, sure. certificate of ownership that could represent a digital asset or a physical asset just as equally. Right. There are people playing with this in, in real estate markets. I mean, so, you know, collectibles, uh, you know, is just, is just one of the areas that this thing is interesting in. But in terms of esports, I think it connects very, uh, very much to, um, you know, when you think about all the work that you do uh, as a gamer, um, in these ecosystems, um, what happens if one day this ecosystem, this company that controls this ecosystem no longer exists? All your in-game assets and all the things that you've worked so hard no longer exist too. And so, of course, you know, the, the primary use case of these assets in ecosystem are going to be within the ecosystem, maybe forever. But it'd be really nice to be able to pull them out of the ecosystem, own them separately. And so if those companies are foregone, you know, go, go by the wayside someday, you still have these things to say, hey, I used to play this game. Right. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, and so that's really where I think the value comes in. Okay, so that, that, that's... Preservation that's, of value, so to speak. Yeah, so that, that's a great kind of segue into the other part. You, you've got all these positives. So people that are looking at it, they're kind of shaking their head a little bit. They're like, oh, this is going to be damaging. This can be harmful. Of course. It, what, what is kind of the, the, the counterpoint to that, uh, I guess? Of, of course, of course. The counterpoint is that I think the misperception is, is these NFT games are coming to take gaming away from gamers and, or the fun out of games. Uh -huh. and, and the fact of the matter is, is that like, a lot of the, the current NFT gaming is more of a replacement for casino gambling than it is for anything else. Sure. I mean, these are not meant to be competitive with the games that you guys are playing here and shouldn't be seen as such. So it's almost like two completely different industries. Okay. You know, the graphic engines and all the things that are behind the scenes on these things, they're just not there yet. I mean, if you look at the, the like the, you know, it looks like some of these look like Minecraft 10 years ago. Right, right. But, but that being said, really it's the, it's the connectivity to economics, uh, to the other, the rest of the web and whatnot that makes a lot of these things really more interesting. Sure. And those things haven't even happened yet. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So it's, to kind of pull us away from the eSport, back to the NFT kind of topic, and you and I did discuss this a little bit before the interview, is people are often talking about how NFTs can be damaging or harmful to kind of the, the real world, literal environment, oh, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. environment Definitely. itself. So Definitely. what is kind of, for somebody, you know, compared to me who knows nothing, someone who actually knows what's up with NFTs, what's the stance on that? Yeah, so, so absolutely. So it's one of, the, one of the most strongest negatives about NFTs sure. right now is the carbon footprint that um, that these blockchains leave. And, and just to get not too technical, but, but just to talk really quickly through it, there's these, these things that essentially are used to confirm transactions. It's called a consensus mechanism. Okay. Essentially, it's, it's how do you prove that the ledger is accurate. That it happened, right? right? And so, so Bitcoin and, and Ethereum currently use this thing called proof of work. Okay. And that uses a lot of energy, tons of energy. I mean, energy of small countries. So I do agree that on a per user basis, the electricity that's being used right now by the network yeah. is absolutely higher than it should be. That being said, Ethereum in particular is going through a change this year that's going to reduce the emissions by something like 99.5%. Wow. So it's really like, it, it's kind of like one of those things that is a current problem, but that problem gets solved really quickly. Right. And I sometimes question the areas that these narratives come from. Because yeah. when you think about it, right, like negative narratives tend to come from industries that don't want something to succeed. 
And you know, you know, you, you look at the, the things like you know crypto industries or sure. whatnot. And there's a lot of industries that stand to lose uh, if crypto wins. So you know, I'll just leave it at that. But but there's a lot of false narratives being perpetuated, especially around the environment. And the fact of the matter is, is whereas they are currently concerns, they very quickly become non-concerns. Sure. And a lot of actually the current blockchains that are being used actually already uses consensus mechanism. Okay. So so really take very 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 little power. Yeah, so I guess the question is, are you afraid that even after they fix this, the 99% goes up, sure. are you afraid that's going to damage the, the longevity of this idea, of this concept? You know, I think I think that it, it has the potential to, right? Sure. Because, you know, we're still in the, the early adoption phase. Right. And so anytime you get, you get a narrative as strong, especially environmental ones, which I am very attuned with, um, you know, environmental concerns, you know, it alienates a large group of people. So there are groups of people, um, you know, that uh, like lobbyists for all intents and purposes that are are taking the counterpoint and are right, essentially lobbying right. for the crypto industry. So lobbyists everywhere, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess, so we've, we've covered the NFT portion, we've covered a little bit of the gamer portion, but a gamer watching this, somebody gaming. Absolutely. Where's the benefit for them? What, what's the benefit of kind of the, so, the gaming NFT? Absolutely. So, so I would say right now, um, very little. I'll be honest with you. Sure. But it's coming. And, and where it's coming is in the ability to own these in-game items and digital objects that you worked so hard right. to collect, um, that commemorate things that you've done, things that you've won. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it connects to a lot of different things, particular in esports, but also just in everyday life. Yeah. Um, you know, ticketing for events is, is a, you know, there's a lot of ticketing vendors that are, that are moving to this as some way to keep these tickets immortalized in your wallet forever. We're you know, just that once in a while I'll find a little piece stuff. of paper that, that reminds me that I went to a concert in 1987. Right. But, you know, generally speaking, that you know, I don't find those that often. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things, and I think that a lot of people get sort of, um, you know, any, any nascent industry is going to have cash grabs and scams. Right. Um, the Internet had that in 99 and 2000 as well, um, but here we are. So, you know, that's kind of how I think about things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. I know that I have learned a lot. I hope people watching have learned a lot as well. But I really appreciate all that. Thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate it. First, can you just tell me a little bit about yourself? Hi, so my name is Caitlin. I'm a part of Farmingdale State College's eSports club. I am captain of the Valorant Green team. I am a second uh, second semester sophomore at Farmingdale State College, and I'm 19 years old. Okay, do you like Farmingdale so far? Yeah, it's, a, it's really great. Uh, the program I'm in is very specialized, and it's not offered um, that often in the East Coast, so it's pretty nice. I enjoy it. And what's your major? My major is aerospace professional pilot degree. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Thank you. So is this your first time on an eSports team? No. So I've been a part of the Valorant team for two semesters. And this is um, my third semester. And it's my first time ever being a captain. OK. Oh, that's awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about what it's like being a captain? So a lot of times I'm organizing the team, making sure everyone is properly set for upcoming games, um, getting scrims for our, our team, and kind of just making sure everyone is there, present, and possible, and able to play the games that we're going to you know, be participating in. We're participating in two leagues this semester, so it's kind of hectic. Oh gosh, yeah, definitely. I can see that. How is it different for you as a player versus as a captain? Do you feel a lot of responsibility? I basically have the responsibility of choosing who you know really plays, what uh, type of characters everyone's playing, and what positions and roles we are all doing, as well as um, being there not only as a team member but also being seen as in a leadership role and having that sort of respect there and being able to delegate um, everyone's role in the team. So it's definitely a lot uh, more different, and my voice is most definitely her. So <laughs> I, I like it. I like being a, uh, a captain. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, what games do you play, or what is your main game? I know you mentioned Valorant. Right. So um, I play Valorant, but um, I started off with Counter-Strike, and I really always have been interested in FPSs. 
So um, it, that background has always been there. So my transfer onto Valorant was pretty pretty easy. That's cool. What have you done to improve yourself in game over time? So one thing um, for my teams, especially, I have open communication where we're able to really give our constructive criticism without taking offense. And me as a captain, especially being uh, it being my first semester, I find it really important that everyone is able to come to me and communicate like, hey, Kate, I don't know um, how I feel about doing this or uh, I want my voice to be heard about this specific thing. And um, just basically taking into consideration everyone's voice and having that open line of communication is really helpful. And that's something I find really important. Okay. And do you carry that strategy into your everyday life as well, would you say? Yeah. Um, communication is really important to me, um, especially in aviation with crew members. You're always trying to communicate properly and efficiently to get the assigned goal completed. And that works in video games as well as in aviation. So um, I feel like it transfers very well. And I put my 100% effort in everything I do. I put 100% in um, the team and the leagues that we're participating in, communicating with um, opposing teams that we might be going against. Um, all those things, I take it really important and can transfer it very well into uh, everyday life. Can you tell me a little bit about what you think about CECC and just competing in general? It's a lot of fun and um, we're so grateful for the opportunity to participate. And, um, you know, this is something that every single member of our team has said. We've never had the opportunity to really compete in a fashion where it's not only fun, we're able to make friends, talk to other people from different schools. It's just an amazing opportunity and something we would love to participate in the future as well. Yeah, we're really happy you feel that way. <clears throat> when your team is competing with other teams, are there any specific teams or schools that your team kind of looks out for? I think we all have the mentality of it doesn't matter who the other team is. We're going to put 100% effort and we're going to um, maintain our mental. Even if the other team is full of radiance, it's not something we're going to keep in mind because we will be able to beat them. Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good mindset. Uh, as you probably know, March is Women's History Month. And you, being a woman in esports, how do you think that has an effect on esports. What does it mean to you to be a woman in esports and as a captain? Just could you talk about that for a little bit? Coming into um, being a woman in aviation, which is already um, really a small a niche type of thing, especially women in video games, things like that. It's just um, we're kind of the minority. And keeping that in mind, um, a lot of times you have to represent yourself properly because you are representing such a small community. So um, I, I, I feel proud and honored to be a part of um, the Women's in Aviation as well as being a woman in esports. And it's a lot of fun. And just understanding that us girls are here too and we're as good as everyone else and that we have the opportunity to be a leader in esports um, and that we're equal to everyone. It's uh, really important to keep that in mind because we're here, even though you might not see us too often. I know you said as captain, your voice is heard, but when you first started to be a captain, did everyone take you seriously being a girl? Was that respect there or did you struggle with that? So I would say initially when I first got on the team, I was put onto a support role and, you know, everyone knows that women normally play healer when it comes to going into any game. And now I'm, pl I'm playing a more of a controller based or sentinel uh, which is very crucial for holding down sites so by playing that now and then having those semesters in my backpack of of experience everyone has treated me with uh, respect and uh, i i would hope it stays that way and either way i demand respect because i I reciprocate that respect to everyone else. So it, it's definitely difficult, especially for girls starting out. Um, that toxicity is there, especially even now whenever I play a game without my team there, that toxicity is there just for being a girl. But as long as you, you know, don't have that mindset of them affecting you because you're better than them anyway, <laughs> it, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Definitely. Well, that's good. I'm happy that you're getting respect that you deserve, and that's awesome. And thank you so much again for your time, and I really appreciate it. No problem. I just wanted to add that our esports team, our esports club as well, started only with 13 students and two teams in 2019, and now we're up to 19 different teams and over 350 students in um to date in 2021. 
like that progress is there and even if you have such a small like if you think that things are so small realize that a community is there for you especially being a female in esports that that community is there for you definitely that's a great way to end it thank you so much and thank you so much for sharing your story i really appreciate it again and your time just thank you overall that's awesome Keep no doing problem. Thank, thank you thank for the opportunity of course i hope you have a good rest of your day you too thanks bye Hey guys, KTAD here, and just like that, another season of ECAC Esports regular season play has come to a close. Over the last eight weeks, we saw a crazy amount of hype competition from some of the best collegiate esports has to offer. And as usual, you guys have me one last time to break it all down and to show you guys what we thought were some of the top plays this week. And Honestly, guys, I, I don't have much more to say. Just check it out because I think we've got some really incredible clips here. Let's take a look. In our opening clip, it's Professor Dementium with a straight boot off the stage to kick things off for Bloomfield. Got himself one. Kick back off stage, though. Good <laughs> the air dodge is going to be that Bowser. He'll do it again, and he'll also bring himself that down so nicely. He gets quickly back before that talk is able to take any sort of advantage but uh well you're gone the spikes come through a clean kick to wrap things up and we've well, got one he's got one stock for his troubles up next the duel of donkers and robeast have some things to say with this beautiful one-two combo to close the door on albany hit the intersection and go straight up Welcome back to the Esports Use production of ECAC. Still Mr. Bepic and Chixa in the booth. Chixa, we had a marathon of a last series between Army West Point and UNC Greensboro Gold. How you doing after that one? You know, I hope my voice can only recover. Drink water, guys. If you <laughs> yes. ever want to commentate, drink lots of water. I mean, like, three bottles worth. No, I'm kidding. Uh, about a good bottle after that last series. But otherwise, I'm feeling good. We got some fantastic good. Rocket League, and I can only be excited for our next match. Yes, UA Albany versus the College of Staten Island, our next match. Both these teams 1-0 coming into week two. Feeling good, Albany 1-0 with four straight games won. They swept their opponent last week, and that's always something that stands out on a stat sheet, Chicksa. I believe it was Staten Island. I think we got to flip it. Staten okay. Island swept. Yeah. Albany won 4-2. They both have dubs nonetheless. Exactly. And, you know... I like to do my little bit of drama. Now I look back on the series. <laughs> Spring 2021 playoffs. CSI Staten Island beat U of Albany in a best of five, three to two. These teams have history. U of Albany has been here, I think almost four or five seasons at this mm -hmm. point. Staten Veterans. Island has been here twice, at least. So it can only be that much better. But of course, I keep talking. They're already playing. Let's get into the action. Well, 30 seconds, you didn't miss too much while you were giving us the context of this series. It's been very back and forth. Not too many opportunities on either side. Staten Island with a couple. And here's one big one. 11 team there to finish off a pass from their teammate. And that one looked easy. Man, it's a gorgeous pass again upfield. And there's no contest. No boost on the side of U of Albany. And uh, Staten Island will indeed get that first blend at 420. Blazing. They are feeling good with their 4-0 record and a 1-0 game one lead. That's a double, though. Can they turn anything? It's, it's fancy footwork in the midfield, but doesn't go anywhere. So Kaiju is allowed to move up for Albany. And expired the same through the corner. Doesn't find much. That's Mux in the middle of things and now transitioning out. Takes a shot, but not too much going to come from that. The defense is holding so far. Already feels like such a different series between our last one to now. Much more careful Ooh. on these passing plays. This one put right upper left 
corner for expired and like that they tie it up within seconds you're right that's what what it has felt like the first minute 15 of this game everyone's kind of picking their mark with the ball even when they're controlling it in the center third or in defense it's still they're picking their place to go with it and right there kaiju gonna pick the back of the csi net that's a quick 2-1 lead now for albany kickoff goals they've plagued us a little bit today and mistakes as well yep. mux should not be placing that in front of the net but it's great capitalization off of you albany and just like that they get a lead and ooh, expired a chance to go up with that ball and we get a third, but now they'll have to play defense as the, the lone first man. They will get there, but the rebound from Mux beats the two other defenders that were trying to rotate back into the play. That's a tie game. Pow, pow, pew, pew, like that. Four goals, a minute and a half. What is happening? Apparently, there has been no defense found on the field to start off this series. It's going to be a high-scoring game by the looks of it, but at least everyone's energized. They're ready to play in the field, and shooters got to oh. shoot. <laughs> There's another shot from Expired. Everyone kind of parted the seas that Expired could take a shot there from their own defensive end. And now using it as a clear of sorts, CSI going to be pushed back as UA advances, though. Midfield, once again, is where we will fight for possession. Expired moving forward. Gets two defenders to jump. They'll pass it out center to Kaiju. The defense going to intervene. Big clear for CSI. And that ball, I think, was on target. At least very close to it. And the entire defense trying to get back to make the save, which they will. Albany going to try and find their way out of defense, though. Shut down. 11-10. Set themselves up for a shot, but couldn't make contact. Unfortunate. From what I can tell, CSI has done a great job thus far in generating some offensive pressure. I think facilitating that Mux in particular, you see of course the season six SSL tag, so clearly has the mechanics behind him and so far has the most points, has been upfield and has finished off a lot of the opportunities for Staten Island. On the other side of the field, I think it's gonna be Kaiju mm. mainly generating that offense Expired is going to be working that intermediary and in, uh, iJazz Bros. We're going to hope I'm saying that correctly to be working that back half. Well, there's 11 team facilitating the offense and Mux forced to bail out. Drifty, the third man, couldn't do much with it. Expired. A chance in the midfield to get something going for Albany, but what we're seeing right now is a game of ping pong developing, though. We're kind of floating over the center net, which doesn't happen too much in ping pong. Usually it goes and bounces on either side of the table, but here we are stuck in that center third until now. Kaiju! A monstrous double tap from the skies down to the bottom of the CSI net. 3-2. Did I say it or did I say it? You said Kaiju it. Kaiju facilitating for you of Albany. That is a fantastic play. You can't get any more textbook on that double tap. We've seen a similar one earlier on the stream today. It has just been mechanic central and it's oh. absolutely gorgeous to watch these players connect. CSI just trying to get a little bit too fancy on the blue back wall there, taking away a surefire goal scoring chance, but that's all right because Mux is right there to give them another surefire goal scoring chance. A demo got mixed in there. Yep, Drifty, the culprit, taking out the last man and we're tied up once more. Did I say it or did I say it? It only you takes a it. couple minutes to really figure out who is the driving force of each of these teams. And, you know, we can see it from upfield, but does each other side and team understand that these are the players you need to target? It's that type of quick thinking, or at least the thinking in a best of seven match that you need to figure out. If I was you, oh, Albany, no. get rid of Bucks. If I was Staten Island, get rid of Kaiju. But if I was Staten Island in this case, I would not double commit and I would communicate on that goal line. That was not a pretty play. Staten Island going to concede a lead that they worked hard, not a lead, but a tie state of the game that they worked so hard to get themselves into with a with an ugly own goal. So we're going to move forward past it because immediately they're finding their fourth and it's 11-team against their second of the game. And CSI, what own goal? They've tied us up once more. Mox able to set him up 
He's always charging upfield, like getting ready to make a play. Fantastic work by both teams. And uh, how many more goals in the remaining 50 seconds? Yes, Perhaps a fifth. anyone? Almost, Six? actually. 1v1. There's a chance. Ah. Oh. I was hoping to really cap off your point with the gold check, so, but I don't think the defenses are going to allow that, unfortunately. That's a booming clear down the field, though, and CSI maybe could find a, a total ninth, but instead getting in each other's way. Mux now trying to end that. Driftsy alone, ensuring it out to the corner. Not going to find a score just yet. Kaiju, no, oh, nothing. It's been close, it's been not close enough. One thing we know is one goal is needed to end this game. It's gonna come sometime, whether it be now or later. Slowly, Dripsy just barely reaching, stretching out to find that save. We'll give his team a little more time, but is that enough time to protect Dripsy? Another squishy save manages to send this game into overtime yet again. We've seen a lot of overtimes tonight. We'll see how lengthy this one gets because something apparently is in the water. All these players are drinking the overtime juice. And well, we'll have to find our ninth goal eventually. Or else we play forever. This could be it. Relatively open net. Now expired. Back in time. Transition defense moment for Albany. And once again, it's the same thing on the other side of the field. Though back to it much faster was CSI. Let themselves an opportunity, but couldn't do much with it. 1v1, 2v1 going the other way. Actually, though, Mux makes it a 2v2 and from behind interrupts that play. Keeps us going in OT. Expired looking to generate that pressure for University of Albany. Not managing to do so just yet. Waiting, of course, on that mistake or that play. We saw so many goals early on in this game. We have yet to see one in a little bit now. I mean, we've seen clearly longer droughts, <laughs> over seven minute droughts <laughs> before scoring, but still it's been a while relative to what we saw earlier in this game. We'll see what team manages to do it first. If I had to guess, it would probably be U of Albany. They have had the greater shots, 12 to eight this game. So by relative means, they seem to have more offensive pressure. But we'll continue to see uh, nonetheless if they are indeed the one to finish it off. A couple of shots here and this ball still hangs wow. in front of net. All three players for Staten Island up. But nobody is there to even uh, shoot that one on. That was about as precarious as it gets. But the defense holds. And on the other side of things, trying to put pressure on and net that fifth. Off the back wall goes Driftsy Mux. Nearly handed a free opportunity to shoot, but they couldn't put it on target. Couldn't react in time, and I'll forgive them for that one with how fast the ball was moving. Still, CSI churning in offense, and looks like they'll come to a grinding halt as Albany finds themselves a clear, and they're right back into their offensive end, making CSI really work on that near post. Good boost control. 11 team, possibly with the flip reset. Doesn't look... Like he manages to connect with it. They'll continue to be on the half of Staten Island, but Mox able to barely poke it away. Slowly, Albany is trying to work their way in. Big clears coming out for Staten Island, and it's given them time to rotate space in order to move the connection here. The shot by 11 team, not on target. Driftsy as well out of position to continue this play upfield. It has been difficult as we're now nearing the three minute mark. Do we hold two Ooh. records in one stream? Nope. I don't think so. I Jazz Bros able to finish it out for U of Albany. 5-4, our final in game one, and I hope we have not used up all our goal scoring chances in this first game of the series because that was an electric first game of this best of seven. UA on top off the back of 14 shots, just nine of Staten Island, but both teams really had good looks in that overtime. The transition offenses have impressed me so much tonight. These players' abilities to put threatening looks on target almost immediately after entering into their offensive zones. UA Albany, or UA was just able to do it and finish it more often than Staten Island in that OT. 
it's really a close game all around. And I was impressed as well with the difference makers on the team. Clearly, everyone knows their place on the field, what they do in yep. order for success on each team. It's now that adaption period that we keep talking about. Barely, you know, U of A was able to take game one. But can they repeat that process? Can they continue to hold on to the offense? I mentioned earlier that they had that greater shot count. They held it throughout the oh. game. But that doesn't do much when Dripsy styles on them all and is able to set up a Mux. Now, I wasn't paying enough attention in that play, and I thought it was Mux carrying the ball towards net because they've been the player to step up and show out in offense, at least in game one, but it was Drifty setting up Mux. They're both in that KC Fennec, so that's why I confused them, but apparently they can be used interchangeably with how good they are. That was an <laughs> impressive start to game two for CSI and a much needed rebound. Kaiju looks off the backboard, mistouch here, and iJazz Bros as well cannot follow it up. A good look for U of Albany, but no finish comes out of it. They still are knocking on the door, put another shot on target. Kaiju up again, but can't drop this down. Expired the catch. Kaiju looks to come in, cross field, ball, it'll be cleared one end to another. 11-teen gets this one in the back of the net. A buffer goal, much needed for Staten Island. Just a little too overzealous in the midfield there was Ajaz Bros. Stepped up a hair too far and CSI was all over it. Nice punish on a simple mistake that happens at all levels of Rocket League. Always gotta be aware, keeping your head on a swivel when your opponent errs in your side of the field because those quick hits can make a difference and uh, two goal leads, such a huge thing in these games, which uh, even in the last series were so tight. Make that three. three. <laughs> <laughs> Jinx. You, yep. you owe me a Rocket League goal or, or something. I don't know. CSI's got me. <laughs> Absolutely. Another goal for CSI, and this is the regain. The uh, maybe a wake-up call that they needed to come into game two since it was a close game one. It has thus far not been a close game two. Great work by the entirety of the Staten Island roster. They've continued to put on pressure. Driftsy may be the least points, but we have seen his mechanical ability at work to make plays happen. Oh. But the passing <laughs> triangle of University of Albany is able to come on through. Expired sends it upfield. Or I jazz bros to expired, excuse me, able to finish this one. That play deserves five stars and a chef's kiss. That was magnifique, beautiful display of offense through the midfield. And UA going to get themselves an important one back because there's still three and a half minutes left. Got to play defense, though, and that was scary as CSI moved up for potentially a fourth. They're still going. UA has to play solid defense here. Make sure they're stable on the back end so they can move forward and put more gorgeous passing plays together in the uh, offensive end. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll see. Can U of A keep their momentum going? At this point, a double commit in midfield is not going to do them a justice. Mux to continue upfield, but a great contest. Driftsy hits it off the backboard. A miss here expired, but stopped by Driftsy as they look upfield to set someone up. Mux the pass almost oh the double tap but just barely off target Driftsy still holding that midfield control and keeping the offensive pressure up for Staten Island I can see why CSI was undefeated coming into this series because they have got playmaking abilities that was nearly another play made turning it into a fourth goal but just a little bit off on the shot UA will advance Kaiju to that back wall of CSI and Inspired tried to beat the defender in the corner Nothing being found really by either side. Neutral 50s abound, and we'll stay at just a two-goal lead for CSI for now. UA was slowly advancing forward, but now they have to retreat. 17, over one, under one, through one. Dripsy looks to finish, but can't find it and sneak it in. Denied. 
University at Albany is able to send it away. Almost finds the open net on the transition, but Driftsy is back. In fact, Driftsy has been absolutely everywhere in the field. A rotational mastermind keeps himself involved in all these plays and thinks staying involved has given his team success. Everyone finding their place on the field. Wow. Another shot coming through from Driftsy. Of course, 11 team initially with that demo and Mux creating that pressure. Great work by the Staten Island. Definitely trying to put in that fourth and put this game on ice, but they can't find it. UA's defense is immaculate. I mean, that in and out save from Kaiju that you know, about 20 seconds ago now is still swimming around in my brain, even though we've definitely moved on now into the orange end. It's still infecting my mind with how nice it was, but they've got to turn that into offense in the key since they went down by two. They have to find just about anything at this point under a minute to play. It's a side flip from Kaiju, not going to help their efforts, and Jazz Bros, a backflip. Didn't have much boost regardless. They couldn't get anything done in the CSI corner. We're just stalled out right now. A couple misses, awkward play, but nothing is being moved forwards, and that's the direction UA needs to go desperately. Drifty up in center field, still holding that center field presence, but not the greatest touch will leave them on the defensive foot. Mox able to get past one. That's an open net, but I don't know. Oh. Maybe he's just strong enough to push it on through. Mox eating his Wheaties as well, just stronger on the goal line. What car control and, and, and knowledge to get their Fennec into a position like that knowing exactly where that defender was going to go with the play and dunking it home. That is, that's beautiful. That, that takes the Kaiju save out of my mind. And now it's the, the Mucks fourth goal for CSI. Oh, the fifth goal added to my mind as well because these are some beautiful plays that Staten Island are whipping out in garbage time. They don't even need these. This is just for show to display their strength in offense. Their dominance, complete dominance on the side of Staten Island. I think Mux in particular makings for a star or at least will name him the MVP at the end of this match if they continue to win this series. Game two is over. It's over with a Staten Island complete win. 5-1 ends up being game two and Mux, the rest of the team really showed out in this one. Yep, in game number one, UA outshot CSI 14 to 9. In this one, it was 10 to 4. Staten Island really stepped up by way of Mux with those four goals. I mean, that's an impressive game, too. And I think that's about the only way we can describe it. Staten Island really did a great job of rebounding, but this is a best of seven, and rebounding is the name of the game. They did it once, they might have to do it again if Albany is the team to step up in the next five-minute period we get of Rocket League Chicksa. And honestly, we saw a lot of out of Kaiju in defense. Need more out of them on the other end of the field. Absolutely. He made that double-tap read earlier. It was a chef's kiss goal. It was oh, yeah. executed to perfection. We know he has that ability on the field to make those plays, but he needs to keep doing it for his team or else they're going to run into more issues. Someone needs to be that facilitator, and Kaiju seems to be the one on the side of UAlbany to make that happen. I don't have as much faith in just mechanical ability out of expired mm -hmm. or I Jazz Bros. That makes sense. They've not stepped up and made one of those electric plays that Kaiju made in the first game. Though, the, the, the nice passing play that cut up the Staten Island defense in that previous game, the one goal that was scored was absolutely beautiful, uh, made by Albany. But, even more than just one, when Staten Island's cooking the way they are, almost found just one in the first 10 seconds of play, did Albany. But crossbar uh, wasn't too keen on allowing that to happen and we'll stay on we'll stay at zero zero only temporarily at least eventually a goal needs to be scored for somebody to win in it's thus far been a high scoring series nine goals in the first game six in the second even if one team had the majority of them still a lot to be desired though we'll see if the Albany oh. can adapt this game, and a great clear out will give Staten Island that space to now look upfield. 
That was one of those step up plays that I wanted to see from Expired. Instead, it turned into a Staten Island clear. You're right, though. Short lived. Good defense. Ajaz Bros a miss there. I'll call it a fake because Kaiju was right behind to make a play, and that's the player you want behind the ball if you were a UA fan, though. Couldn't do anything with it there. CSI going to win that bout of defense versus offense. Uh, played on the orange side of the pitch, and they are going to win that transition outright, finding the first goal of game two with that 11 team shot. 11 team. It's a jump. He jumped that pass right in midfield and shot it right on target. You can't make a better shot, a better play. We say always contest that ball early, but if you can get a shot as well with it, that makes it all that much better. Great job for Staten Island to continue their dominance. Oh Mox looking for something, almost connects with it, saved away and sent towards the other end of the field. UA struggling right now in this series, looking for some sort of comeback, but they continue to get denied on the pitch upfield the look is for staten island a demo just to add on to the torture staten island completely uh -huh. outplaying their opponent right now mux finds another in this game already seems like it's being run away that's a training pack goal right there. That's one, that, that's not even like a, an SSL training pack. That's more of a diamond training pack goal where the ball just slowly leaks out center. It's on the ground. It's perfectly set up for Mux. And I, I didn't get a chance to see who that last man was there for UA, but I did not envy them whatsoever being in that spot with Mux firing an absolute missile on target. So 2-0. CSI and they're just generating higher quality opportunities and more opportunities. They've got quality and quantity on their side at the moment and that does not bode well for UA. Certainly not. We'll see if they can manage any sort of offensive pressure but it's just been them on the back foot as slowly the tentacles come in from Staten Island and they just constrict the entire of the Albany squad looking for a clear outfield. They managed to find one to expire, but can he get much more? This one, a rolling touch. Mux able to get it out the corner. I just bro shot wow. on target, but an easy save and sent away again. Staten Island looking quite unstoppable at this period of time. Oh, and the pinch clear as well to catch out all of UA who were moving up. I Jazz Bros wisely turned around quickly, but regardless, they were ready to move up, but disallowed. Now a real chance to move up, though. On the back wall, Levantine gets work done defensively, though. Free chance to shoot. It's good. Uh, Jazz Bros puts a hard ball on target, and good things happen when you do that occasionally in Rocket League. 2-1. I mean, when your mechanical god isn't stepping up, become the god yourself. Step sure. up to the plate. I Jazz Bros coming through for you at Albany. They needed someone to start it. Can they find a second with him? This one just barely off target and sent away. But a good look, maybe some momentum, some pep in your step, if I will. Oh, that's oh no, that's not the pep I, I think you were talking about. An own no. goal from UA, that's the worst time to commit that as well. 11 a great ball center just to put pressure on, but uh, Jazzbro has to have a better read than that. Oof. <laughs> that's yep. all I gotta say. Major oof. But those things happen, mistakes happen. I mentioned earlier, if you're bronze or you're SSL or even if you're a pro, they happen. You just cannot let them plague you that little bit of room 11 team got he got a taste he wanted more he got that more <laughs> another goal added on for staten island they get that 4-1 lead right now wow it should be 3-2 right now something like that maybe even 2-2 if ua just puts home a couple more opportunities and doesn't make that egregious mistake on their back end they're in this series but CSI has just outclassed them a little bit too much with their playmaking abilities. 11 team Mux and Drift. I, I was going to highlight one of them, and then I just went and said all three names because they've all had electrifying moments where they've had that flip reset play or double tap or just hard shot on target developed from nothing. It's impressive what CSI is doing right now to a very good team in U of A. So 4-1 to one doesn't tell the entire tale 
of game three. It's going to be two to one in this series, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that Albany got that first game to keep things close, even with Staten Island cooking as much as they are right now. Certainly, and you no, know, I mentioned earlier about each member of a team knowing their place, knowing their position, but the best teams are players that can switch into any position and fill that role where needed. We're sort of seeing Staten Island slowly just have each player fill in that role that needed. Have whatever ability, if you need to be first man, you're first. If you need to defend, you're defending. If you're in midfield controlling that midfield, you're doing all of the above. This is 11 team game to shine. It's not Mux or Drifty this game, it's 11 team. And those are the strongest rosters, oh ones that know how anyone at any moment can just come through. It feels like we've seen, at this point, 11 team, 11 team goals. That's just how many they have put in. I mean, they had several in ga game one that saw nine, and they really stepped up here. You're right. Drifty will add one to the tally. Styling and profiling their way to a sixth CSI goal. Oh, that's just salt in the wound. Insult to injury. May I add on? Nine seconds. They might get a Brazil, but it has been incredible the work that College of Staten Island has put on this game. We're nearing a couple seconds left, and I cannot imagine how University at Albany feels right now. I don't know. They're being outscored 15 to 7 in this series. But the takeaway that they should have from that statistic is that they're only a game down. They can come out in game four and step up like they did in the first game that we saw of theirs, where they scored five goals on a CSI defense that has looked pretty solid. They added themselves four saves on six shots. That is a solid save percentage from a CSI squad that was also churning in offense. Their defense looks solid. They're their offense unbeatable and University of Albany has to find some way to combat one of those two sides because at this point I don't think you're going to solve both both those pieces of the puzzle in one game. I, I have a really hard time believing that they have any chance left in this series and I hate you know denying a team that opportunity but right now I I just can't see College of Staten Island changing their ways they're just so freaking good and you can see them continue to do just that they need an early goal university at albany right now they need something a lead confidence all of the above because you can even tell in our interview with instinct he got nervous at times they got frustrated but they came through desperately right now university at albany needs that same sort of push well, first 30 seconds have come and gone for this game number four, and they've been playing offense for all of them. I think this is our first venture into the blue side of the field, and that's great news for Albany. Now they got to defend, of course. That's very important. Once you do have to play defense, you got to make sure it's still strong, and for the time being, that'll be the case. Though 11 Tina, a chance to shoot. No, couldn't find the second soft touch. Rebound, no good. Kaiju first on the scene. That's a pass out to the side. CSI playing the long con right now. Not just going for shot after shot after shot. I mean, they are, but they're not set in that way of offense. They're slowing things down now and playing control on the blue side of the field. Open shot, open finish. Mox slams it into the back of the net. And slowly they broke down the defensive line. Nobody even close the net to save that one. Good work by Staten Island. Sometimes slow and steady wins the race. And in this case, slow and steady opened up the floodgates. That's the difference between both these teams right now. I mean, they're getting chances. Both sides are. But CSI able to do so much more with their chances on the blue net. And looks like they might find a couple to add to their chance tally, though. Kaiju says an emphatic no, pushes the ball deep into orange territory into the corner. But Mux will find control through the midfield and will place a testing ball into the blue box. UA going to pass that defensive test with flying colors, though they couldn't get out. And that is the important part at the moment. Clears a must for UA, and it's just not in the cards at the moment. Dripsy! Oh. Dripsy connects off the back 
board! What a shot! I watched it unfold slowly! You stopped speaking at just the right moment to make such an exclamation point occur on the field. Wow, Driftsy, an unbelievable step up moment, and, and CSI keep doing that. They keep, it doesn't matter which player has the ball, there's still a threat. And I'm, I'm glad I got to stop speaking and just watch that <laughs> unfold because that was an absolutely beautiful play. Really gorgeous stability. I believe, honestly, at this point, every player on the Staten Island team has scored some sort of double tap. Some sort Feels of like crazy it. mechanical play. If not, something else was justified in me saying that they have shown out and shown up. Or shown up and shown out. I mean, they, yeah. they've done all four. They, they, they've <laughs> shown up and shown out and shown out and shown up. It's It's been that impressive the last couple of games from CSI. They've outscored UA now 13-2 to two in the last two and a half games. That's after losing game one. Make it 14-2. to two. Mux puts in the third for Staten Island, and that's an impressive transition. They've outdone. They have dominated. They have outplayed. The words are absolutely endless with this team. And if only they had won that game number one, they would keep that perfect game record. But looking to have a very dominant oh. play. You know what? Expired wants a little light. Give him the spotlight for just a second. The ground pinch from the sidewall. Beautifully done. The doctor ordered it and expired filled the prescription. That was a step up moment for UA. And we talk about that being the case for CSI all the time, but expired finally took the ball and did a lot with it. That's a solo play that gets the comms back alive. I mean, after being outscored by the margin I had just talked about, you start to get a little bit deflated, I imagine, for UA, but expired didn't care and found one on the board here in game four they can add to it there's plenty of time for this comeback to happen now expired churning in offense and caps off a bunch of zigging and zagging with a big dunk to make it three two they're coming back what is happening is there a curse upon us expired pop off potential question mark certainly two back-to-back -back goals will do just that can he find the third here and now he manages to get control of this ball only for it to be taken away drift seat something ambitious almost finds contact to finish that play out but now this game is looking much closer than we anticipated we're seeing csi's lead about to expire if the aforementioned player has his way with the end of game number four but Still down a goal, this is crunch time. UA not wanting, I imagine, to go down 3-1. Most competitors don't, and Expired can turn on this ball as the defense awkward, but 11 team actually recovers. Expired pop to I Jazz Bros, who would just narrowly overrun that play. Still going is UA in the offensive zone. Kaiju put a ball just a little bit wide. That allows CSI a big, big clearance, though. UA not done, Kaiju back center, Expire drop down pass to Kaiju in the corner, puts it back middle for I Jazz Bros, they'll keep it vertical, as they're not quite content to go at net just yet, though I'm liking what I'm seeing from UA, just still need that finishing touch. Good catch here for Kaiju, we'll see if he can beat the one-on-one, -on -one. instead Expire will look to take over, he's demoed for his efforts and Ooh. University at Albany, not much time left to find that tying goal that they need. They've come so far. Can they finish this last gap? I Jazz Bros, the boost, but already taken away and bumped the ball. Can't touch the ground or that end all be all. Expired. Seemed to expire on that play. Wasn't moving. So the ball touches the ground. That island will take their third game and now end up on match point that was much more hard fought though such an impressive performance out of expired to even give albany a chance in that game where they looked so down and out of it but csi holds on and that's what good teams do even when 
your in in your mind if you are CSI lesser opponent in the University of Albany is fighting back you've got to stamp out any hope that they have in that final 90 seconds of play even with momentum shifting towards UA Staten Island ho- held on they found the saves they needed to they found the clears they needed to and they're now up 3-1 in this series where They'll be 2-0 and on the season if they do win this next game and uh, cap it off. Heck, if they win one of the next three potential games. So they're in a good spot, Chicks, uh, CSI, to start off their season undefeated. And they've got the mechanics to do it. Absolutely. We'll see what this game holds for U of A. They'll find time at least to be on the offensive side of the field first. But... Whoa. That shot comes through out of nowhere and almost gets first blood. The follow-up saved by 11 teen off the post. Denied is you at Albany. They can't find that goal that they desperately need early. And now they have to transition defensively. Mux will do it from end to end. He finds it for Staten Island. And right back there, they assert their dominance. That was the most impressive play you will see probably all month from a Rocket League roster. The 11-team save off the post. They're, if they're there a tenth of a second later, it's a goal. But they get the save and then mucks the double to transition out and then dunking two defenders to set up the first score of Game 5. That is... Wow. CSI deserves to be 2-0 and if they're making plays like that. And Albany have to combat that to get three straight game wins. That's near impossible. <laughs> near impossible but yet sometimes probable if it occurs and it just seems like Staten Island seems to continue to impress only one minute down and they have that one goal lead but it seems like they control the entirety of this game no Mux way. able to almost come back to it but still the fact that he's able to put on that pressure make the defense nervous I would be shaking in my boots if I was on the defensive line there. And good thing I am indeed not. <laughs> no kidding. And again, I do not envy Albany's position, but they've done a great job of controlling this game at the very least, shutting down the three CSI players. They've not had too many opportunities to work with, though the biggest one they did, they scored get themselves that one goal lead but albany has had the bulk of the possession in this game five and that's important that's how you set yourself up for success just have to find a way to finish off those plays not allow transition goals like that nearly was csi inches from netting themselves a second might get back within that inch margin in a second with driftsy behind the ball double tap opportunity doesn't find it but 11 team chance to shoot no good the defense stays strong Strong for now, still keeping it in the air. A pass here from one to another just off the post. And now, transition now. We'll see if it's quick enough for UA to get a shot. Kaiju playing with this one. Gets it taken right off the top of his car. Expired. Unfortunately, a back flip and 11 team to just mess up the rotations with some demos in the backfield. Drop down, another oh, demo, wow. open net, but way too hard. Make that a double instead. Mux adds on to the scoring for Staten Island. Should never have had a doubt. Mux put that first ball way too high, but that's essentially still an open net, even with the defender closing in and it being a double tap required to turn in the second goal for Staten Island. But Mux makes it look, see, look easy and Albany now they, they, their offense has so much pressure on it right now to find two unanswered against the CSI Ross that doesn't seem keen on stopping their scoring spree, let alone allowing a goal in on the other side of the pitch. That's three. Driftsy and Mux combining for this one, and CSI getting very, very close to clinching this series. <laughs> At first, we were a little nervous. We got scared. UA managed to find a very dangerous shot. But the transition came through, and it's been all CSI the rest of this game. Two minutes is all they need to hold on to end this series. And I have a feeling they're going to do just that. Can they add more, though? Cause for pain. A little over eager. Don't get complacent. That one will bounce from end to end, and UA finds one. 
All right. I, I didn't think that would go in. I mean, 11-teen and Mux both on the ball. I guess Andristi didn't have any boost, so... I was worried that the ball would hit the crossbar and stay out, I'll admit, but UA have that fight in them. They just refuse to give up in this series. It reminds me of Army West Point and our previous best of seven on the night, but this is a, a much tougher beast in CSI, and with their two-goal lead intact, 90 seconds to defend it, UA still has a very, very uphill battle in front of them, but they've got the star power to make it happen. 17. We'll look to continue the offensive rule shooting one. debut. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah! There's a rule one! This is a 2v2! Could this go in favor of one side or the other? I Jazz Bros upfield Mux back. Denied here. Gets a huge 50. Another touch will stay on the side. No, it's broken up! My heart. I can't blame UA for breaking that up, though, because it was Mux and 11 Teen, the two players on the field, and that is a 2v2 that would give a, any duo a lot of trouble. So UA back to full strength, but so is CSI, and that means they can find a clear here and get an extra flip to there. Now I think that was Drifty behind the ball in transition right there. 11 Teen and Drifty combining in the corner to brush UA aside. These are great challenges, just getting a bumper, getting a wheel, anything on the ball to slow the play down for University of Albany. CSI's defense looking strong, and UA still needs two. Mux off the corner, looks to continue with 11 Teen. They're still burning this clock. UA, they need an opportunity, and they need it now for the potential to even think about coming back in this game. It'll go from end to end. It seems like still in the control of CSI. Another demo, just more cause for chaos and more clock to shut down. It's zero. This game is a one. CSI will take it in 4-1 fashion. A dominant ending for them. They win in four straight games and they add one more on the end to their score. In fact, game score equals series score. Huh. That's a perfect way to cap off this series. And if you want a synopsis of how this series went, if you are just joining us, well, unfortunately for you, the series is over. But in game number one, UA scored five goals. In games two through five, they scored four. CSI shut them down completely. And then games two through five, CSI score. Let me do quick math. 18 goals. It was 18 to four in the four straight that CSI won. That's impressive. CSI's a contender. Yeah. I mean, I've said it before. They've been here before. In fact, they've been here a lot. And it's quite impressive to see both teams that have experience that can come out on top just like this. But yep. I mean, it may not have been as long as the game that we would have liked, but it was still a very good series. And I could see why CSI has done so well to start off their season. Indeed. Well, we're going to get to learn a little bit more about CSI and their great start to the season in a bit when we find an interview with one of their players, more than likely so. Stick around if you want to hear all about their adventure in that previous series, because we'll be right back. I can't say that. I'll get in trouble. There's one for each game, so teams this weekend, somebody's going to have to explain to TSA why they're coming home with an extra trophy. Fine. We're fine. This is going to be great. Why is everybody staring at me? I'm not even doing anything yet. Is it because I'm in a suit? It looks nice. It's new. I'm stressing. I'm stressing. It's all right. We win these. We absolutely win these. I've never seen us lose these. I love him. I, think he, I don't remember his name. What is going on, everybody? And Oh, are we ready? I'll start over. Okay. What's going on, everybody? We are here at the Collegiate Esport Commissioner's Cup 2022 in Atlanta, Georgia. The players are just now entering the arena for day one. A lot of them had the opportunity to be here yesterday to get jerseys to get familiar with the area and to get to know one another but today the friendly gloves have to come off and they are all here earlier i was talking to these guys this mannequin when they didn't have anything else set up i could see it from all the way down there and i thought it was a person and i stood there for like five minutes and i was like why is he standing like that and i thought it was like a smooth criminal i thought somebody was giving us like a michael jackson impression and then it was a mannequin i was really embarrassed to admit that oh my god that's a lot of people hold on let's go over this window let's go over this window it just keeps going there's so many people outside there are so many people outside we're gonna interview people when they come in i don't really want to go outside it looks like it's gonna rain and this suit is new so oh there's there's Doc Haskell. Hi, Doc. How are you? He, he brings a full notebook with him and, like, writes notes down. It was pretty insane. He had it yesterday. He's going to be coming through this metal detector right here. I don't know his name, though, but I recognize his hair. Jen. You're Jen? All right. We're going to interview Jen, who's supporting Kennesaw. I'm going to ask you a couple of very simple questions. Okay. Um, are we ready? All right, great. 
College. I really like Georgia College's uh, color scheme. It's just red, white, and blue, I think, but I think they did it in a really clever way. Mineral area wearing hoodies, even though it is 75 degrees outside here in Atlanta, Georgia. Absolute legends. If only Nick could hear you. Nick, come back. If he's over 100 feet away, he can't. And you were whispering something, and he started smiling. I'm like, are you whispering? Oh, yeah, because he's, he's got his headphone in if we're close enough. But Bless you. Because in tight. Because in tight again. You're welcome. Right, I'm going to go find him. Oh, oh, there he is. Oh my! Oh, okay, okay. Real, real stuff is starting. Real stuff. Competitive integrity needs to be upheld. We gotta get out of here. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble. I'm really. I, I get really embarrassed when I get yelled at. Thirty is so Okay. Wow, it's not 10:30 yet. It's only like barely 10. <laughs> Woo! All right, it's gonna be. It's gonna be a long. Hey, what's up? Surprise interview. Join me over here. This we have a cool backdrop. What are we here for? Rocket League. Awesome. I'm not going to ask what school you go to because unless you swap hoodies, that seems pretty clear. No. Nope. You know, I got I got my jersey on with my name on it. Oh, you do? We show us your jersey. Look at John T. Turbo here. Yeah, exactly. That's not his name. I just keep calling him that. Yeah. His name is John, but it's... My it, name it, is John Turbesi. Yeah, that's not John T. Turbo. Yeah. I get the message that I'm going to Nebraska where I met you. Oh, <laughs> that's so crazy. So context, if we're probably never going to use this, but I'm going to talk about it. Turbo and I met at a LAN like over a year ago. That's so not crazy. Over. What is going on, everybody? And Welcome back to the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. I am Seb Dillens, joined by a man I have interviewed probably well over 10 times. It's going to be my good friend Neb here from Bay State Overwatch team. Neb looked at me and before he started his last series and he said, we are not dropping a map for the rest of the day. And so far, he has lived up to that title. But Neb, is there anybody you're thinking, we've got to get them out of the way, we've got to take them down? Uh, no. No? Just looking at it, each fights its own, every game? Going into it, just taking it as it comes? Uh, I have the confidence right now that we're not going to drop a single map. I, I love Neb because he not only is he confident, but he's correct. Bay State is one of the best Overwatch teams I've ever seen. So it's it's always good to hear from I love the confidence, and I love Bay State, so I hope they do a great job this weekend. So what qualifier? Did you win a qualifier to get here? At large bid. We're looking at Rocket League. We're thinking high odds, low odds. What do, where do we think we're walking away? I think I think pretty high. I think we're, we're doing pretty good. Is there anybody that you're looking at, you're like, please do not let us go up against them unless we absolutely have to? I mean, really, everybody's good competition. So. And sorry, what was your name? Ethan. Ethan. Ethan from Mineral Area. Yep. Very exciting. Well, Ethan, good luck. Thank you. We'll see you soon. What kind of pass? A player pass? Let me get you a lanyard. No, you actually have to like, tape it to your chest, like really awkwardly with masking tape. Okay. And it's going to fall off. Yeah. It's going it's to be uncomfortable, I promise. That's a guarantee. Okay, cut that. I'm going to sneeze. Okay, great. I'm great. Everything's good. Who do we interview? Who should we interview? I don't know. I'm just here. I need caffeine. Hey guys, KTAD here. Now, I've been told I need to step in to create like a buffer zone between some of the other hosts so that uh, the Valorant v Overwatch conflict may finally come to an end. But uh, between, uh, between you and me guys, I don't think they both realize that League's kind of already won that war. So, uh, so don't tell them. Don't tell them anything. But anyways... You guys already know why we're here, and if not, well, then you're in luck because we've got some of the best collegiate esports moments right here. Don't believe me? Well, that's okay, but, uh, you know, here's your proof. Let's get into it. To start us off, we have the combo of Matt and Festive as they execute a brilliant mid-air handoff to close out game two and tie up the series. Here in regulation, can Festive and Matt do it? Matt's there! Let's sit in and we do get the go-ahead goal. Is it going to be enough to end it here in reg? 25 seconds left right here. About two minutes since our last goal. Fifth total in this one. Is this looking like a yeah, moderately? Feeling thirsty? Well, if you are, then Krolo's got what you need with these sick plays on Pac-Man. Not. Always guaranteed the stock goes for the side special into that. That would have been an insane way to end it. And now Krolo looking for oh! the fire under an edge guard. Slam dunk right there. Is there able to finish them off? David? At number six, see if you can count the ultimates here because when the dust settles, there can be only one survivor. I don't know what Kid University are thinking. Well, okay, they're thinking it. What is going on in this fight? My days! Two to the bomb, three to the tire, one to the self destruct, and it's we just get the team. It's a, it's a lone What baby is diva. happening? <laughs> no, okay. Tip is back there. You know what number play this is, right? Because J Rod knows. And let me tell you, he's definitely keeping count. 
gonna be J Rod who strikes first again with a nice headshot onto Boss. Gonna start oh, moving God. down into garage, and J Rod is just approached now through garage. Firefish Wall has been committed. Oh, Lance oh, tries to take a peek, but J Rod's there, finds Pigeon Mac. We're looking at potentially an ace. Austin gonna do there. Trying to scrape together some sort of consolation prize. He's blinded, and they're. Oh my God, draw! What a teammate! He's giving a. Oh no, J Rod around the corner looking for the ace. One shot on Austin, he finds the oh, ace. Good guy, beautiful. draw gives it over. Love the. A man down, the overtime clock counting, and the ball on their half of the pitch. Yet somehow, Stonehill manages to make it work in this crazy match against Buena Vista. Out and push right back out again. This is a game of inches. Who can aggress first? And that's going to be it. Joker from the long shot along the field. Look at this from the back of board. Straight to Joker's feet. The touch is so delicate. And welcome back to Esports U's presentation of the ECAC. This has been week two, and we just saw College of Staten Island get an emphatic win in five games. And now we've got 11-teen with us, who was very much a part of that emphatic victory. 11-teen, how you feeling after that really dominant win? Feeling really good. I'm feeling really good about it. Uh, glad to hear it. I, I have one in-depth question after that, just kind of how you're feeling question. What changed after game one? Because you guys obviously dropped that game one in overtime. What changed to go on that serious run that you had? Yeah, I mean, I think the whole time we knew we had it. It's just game one. We came in a little slow. We were whiffing mm. really easy balls. Uh, but warm-up came through, and, and, and we took the rest in stride. All right. Awesome. I want to know what your comms are like, what your hype is like. You guys score so many phenomenal goals, whether it be backboard reads or little deflects, or I was getting hyped here in the background. What What is it like <laughs> if I were to position myself in your Discord call while you're playing? Yeah, so, I mean, we, we have pretty standard comms. You know, I'm here, the boost amounts, all that. Uh, but we, we do get a little rowdy sometimes. You know, in that game, I think we went... Oh, 6 0, something like that. Uh, w w most of us were using French decals, so we just started speaking French and then. <laughs> yeah, we just. Yeah, we, we goofed off a little. So, so what are your strengths, would you say, as a team? Is it your mechanical abilities? Because those were definitely on display. Would you say it's more team plays that you guys excel at? Yeah, I mean, we've been playing together for almost two years at this point. Wow. So we're we're pretty comfortable we know our positioning really well um and so even when we're a little down we still know how to connect the ball to each other Shows. amazing well congratulations of course on the win and two wins your season's going off pretty well only that one game that you guys lost at the beginning would you like to shout out anybody uh before we let you go have you rest i know for me it's a little late and uh your series wasn't as long as our first one but Anybody that you'd like to call out? Yeah, I just want to shout out my teammates for always being hype as hell. And shout out Alberto, our esports director. Of course. Well, I appreciate you joining us in the booth after that solid win. You guys really popped off there, games two through five. It was an impressive victory. But again, thank you for joining us and have a great night. Thank you, you too. All right, as 11 teen, a part of College of Staten Island's Rocket League roster, who I would say is a contender to win uh, the ECAC. They look pretty darn good. But we're about to sign off for the night, Cheeks and I. We had a great evening. Appreciate <laughs> Esports U for having us on. Appreciate Coltoon in the background putting on this production. Of course, all of you for watching. Make sure you stay tuned for a rerun of the VOD that played earlier on Esports U 2. So more esports action if you didn't get enough already tonight. But we'll see you next time. For Cheeks and myself, Mr. Bepic, we say good night. We'll see you later. Oh, wait. <laughs> Those arms goes for the down throw into forward or forward air, excuse me. A great combo. Could have found some great damage offside. And as that paint just racks up onto this mid man, that is more and more damage basically for free. Davion looking for a bottom stage. My goodness, what a stall. Beautiful edge guard and England.
And in our top play of this week, have you seen the movie Ratatouille? It has nothing to do with this play, but I think you'll see why we bring it up. Look at this rat, though. Look at this rat going up long, dude. Oh, he's got another. I mean, it's Ratatouille. They're chefing it up. I'm gonna go find another. <laughs> Fozzie, quick trade, though. And they'll stall the push for now, but contain just a little bit here. We got a lot more work to be done. It's out of CT already. Right click, it's missed! Ooh. That right click is huge going in this round. It's not gonna find anything but Tumble Wheel. Fozzie with a quick trade. Oh, stop! Okay, okay stop let the rat it. do it all. Oh, my. Phew! What a week and what a crazy set of matches we've been seeing so far. Now, with that said, we're just now passing the halfway point in the season. So that playoffs picture is definitely starting to shape up. Now, if you guys want to stay up to date with all of the ECAC action, then definitely give us a follow on Twitter at ECAC underscore esports. Or if you guys want to catch all of the matches live, you can find us on Twitch at ECAC underscore esports. Mondays and Tuesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, Wednesdays at 7 now, as always, a special shout out to our partners over at Esports U for expanding on our broadcast coverage. We definitely want to give them a special thank you for that. But, you know, that's it. That's the show. That's all we've got this week. Come back next week. Hopefully we've got a new host. Hopefully they've stopped bickering and all of that. But in any case, I've been KTAD. It's been a blast. And I'll see you guys next time. AC week number two here uh, on Esports U2. Myself, I'm Relic, and I am joined by the wonderful Trippin. Of course, uh, the pretty pictures brought to you today by Professor Layton. But Trippin, uh, you're the one who can speak. Uh, Layton can't. So I'll ask how you are doing. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, man, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm really happy to be here with the ECAC. I think first time on one of these broadcasts, which is going to make it even more fun uh, to see what the teams in this conference are going to have to offer. Again, collegiate level Rocket League play just the second week of a young season. There's a lot of time left to make those moves when they get to that point. But we're like, how, I mean, sorry, Relic, one of these times I'm going to get your name right. Um, I mean, how, how are you feeling today? I mean, if you're hosting, usually no one ever asks you, right? How, what's up with you? Well, first of all, I changed my name specifically to be more simple to say, and yet people somehow managed to be, oh, it's the old name and how... I'm doing all right. And actually, I need to redress the balance. Leighton's doing great as well. Don't you worry. I did ask him before the show. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing great. I'm super excited. We're bringing uh, all of you out there two best of sevens today uh, with varying teams of various intrigue. Uh, you can see up the top there, actually, that we have some a bit of a surprise, or not a surprise, I guess a little bit of a tease as to what teams we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're looking at Cali State University, Monterey Bay. We're looking at Keene University and Trippin. One of these teams had a great first week. Uh, and one of these teams, not so much. Uh, yeah, that's exactly how it went. I mean, the tale of two perfect uh, opposites here. Uh, we have the Otters coming in 1-0 and oh with their 4-0 and oh sweep over SVSU Rocket League Red. And Keen, on the other hand, got swept by SFU RL White. So both these teams looking, you know, to, to build on what, happened last week in one way shape or form otters obviously they they just want to keep rolling right once you sweep a team you yeah. want to just keep sweeping you want to get those easy wins in there in these best of sevens keen on the other hand they want to build on getting swept they want you know a, any victory for keen this week is a building block is a good step going forward just to get off that oh and four schneid but some tough competition certainly when the team is riding as high as the otters are we might have some Spock like single eyebrow raises, I think, from a bit of a, a bit of a dichotomy, really, where we're talking about the Otters. Yes, I did say correctly, California State, Monterey Bay. Yes. But we're in the East Coast. Yes. Athletic Conference. Yes. You know, honestly, look, I'm just I'm just a bloke from the other side of the pond tripping. <laughs> I'm not going to ask questions if you don't. <laughs> Hey, I'm not going to either. I think it's a road trip that may have gone bad. But either way, we're getting into game number one here. See, on your screen, Ooh. a shot coming in from Keene University's identity. That one will go wide initially. They're going to just get things moving right along very quickly. Uh, Arella coming in with those quick shots. Some more pressure here in front of the orange net. That one's in for Garrett. 
It's not just an early birthday save, it's an early birthday goal for the birthday boy. Garrett's 46. We hope you had a wonderful day. Certainly a great way to start off your evening. 1-0 to the Otters and not even 30 seconds past. Beautiful play. Yeah, you love to see that quick goal. And as you mentioned, happy birthday to them. An answer from Keane as they win the kickoff into the corner. They look for a pass out as well. This one across the face of the net with JCU. Not going to be able to get there in time. The ball was cleared out downfield. Here comes Cali State with the dunk on Indemnity. Struggling to get that ball out of their own corner. It's going to be rough for a bit. Finally, GCU with clear into the corner. Uh, apparently, it's called Kane University. And you'll, oh. you'll have to, again, you'll have to forgive us. Uh, for me personally, I've never seen that arrangement and it not be called Keen. So... I will, I will absolve myself of any responsibility, but we will definitely call it Kane from now on. We'll definitely call that as it is. A decent clearance, but not decent enough. A free shot rattles the backboard there. It's another shot, rattles the backboard, and away it goes. And a nice, oh my word, this is actually going to roll in. What, how, and why tripping? I mean, this is one of those situations where if your third is just not in the right position, you're going to struggle a little bit on those counterattacks. But oddly enough, the third was in a pretty good spot just unfortunately did not have the mechanics to lay it down and actually make that save and now we're tied up one to one and definitely looking a little bit better here for Kane Ah, oh, named after a political group. Well, I'm certainly interested in that. It's actually part political, part philosophical major myself. So I always love learning new things. And what I'm learning about both of these players is it doesn't really matter about the record from week number one. Both look pretty confident, both eager to get more goals on the board. That rattles the crossbar. That goes underneath the crossbar in Demity and Kane 2-1. Initially a little bit nervous here about the shot. The touch from Aftershock quite poor off of the backboard. The initial shot was missed, but Indemnity happy to come in and play clean up crew and get Kane that two to one lead as we move into the kickoff here barely 90 seconds into game number one we've already got two oh, one man. make it three to one already it's JCU with a third goal oh defense calling up the defense where did you go we could see after shot going for oh that's a really aggressive kickoff looking back at this otters play here both players both anchor players not even looking back only looking forward going for both hundred mid boosts if it works you're in a great position if it doesn't Sorry to spell it out for you, it's not. And that is why Kane now holds themselves a two-goal advantage. 3-1 in total. We haven't even hit the three-minute mark, so still plenty of time to either score more or to see the Otters, to see Monterey Bay head back into this. They're going to surge forward with an attack here, almost stumbling over each other, however, on the left wing. The clearance, pretty decent infield, but they're in the right place. Kane University, the counter-attack, that goes wide, and Gareth just watches brief as that's a lovely demo, and forces that back into blue possession. You know, I really hate to pick on one particular player, but Aftershock is having a very, very rough game up to this point. A couple of touches that they have had have been perfect passes to Kane, and then right there also had a back pass that nearly went awry as well as the ball is boomed off the back well here for Kane. Garrett going volleyball style over the top. Back and forth between the two, now Aftershock chasing it downfield in the right corner off the back wall in front of the net for Red Blur. And make a very easy routine save here as we approach the two-minute mark remaining. Kane still holding on to a two-goal lead. Yeah, but Monterey Bay putting together some nice passing plays. They've given up possession now. It's going to hit the backboard. And ultimately, as long as they continue to try and find their teammates, uh, the chances will come. And with chances, statistically speaking, you should get goals. That almost won a little bit too far left to be on target there was someone in the way already but i'm liking these clearances from the otters looking much better less than two minutes two goals not hard to find oh it's another one that rattles the post and as i said earlier you create chance after chance eventually you will find that breakthrough goal it's only one away now from a tie game yeah that's really what i was hoping for just so many great opportunities here for monterey bay and not quite able to get the job done can't quite get that goal to go in finally they sneak one in after just throwing shot after shot shot at the cane net Not only down by one with a minute and 40 seconds here to go and of course fans this is only game number one and they're already making it awfully interesting so make sure you guys get yourselves comfortable for the rest of this game 90 seconds left on the Ooh. clock that shot is on target from jcu kane extends the lead back to two 
Or is he a Count? Because apparently he's called Juku. Oh, that's just a poor miss off the backboard, however, from Garrett. Difficult, certainly, to read. Uh, and, and when you do miss those, you look a little bit silly, but difficult in the first place. Ultimately, a great read from Kane University. Lots of players around to try and get a shot away on target. They re-establish that two-point lead. And with 80 seconds left on the clock, they're looking good value. It's going to be on the side wall here. Coming across this indemnity, looking to beat Aftershock. Aftershock will get the touch. They'll drop it down. It's Cal Flick. They'll still keep floating. Finally cleared off the backboard. Right out to midfield and denied here from Kane. A great 50 at midfield. It's down, down in front of Juker. They're going to slot this one all the way across. Not going to find anyone to shoot that one. Garrett's touch will come right back out to midfield. Ball moving side to side quite a bit. Finally starting to go in favor here of Monterey Bay. Eventually, it'll just be boomed from Kane all the way back across in solid defense from them. Running out of time, but enough to score one. And if you can score one with a kickoff situation, five, ten seconds to go, you're burning. Hal Flick hits woodwork again. And the Otters, I mean, they'd rather, I'm pretty sure they'd rather themselves be beavers at this point because the woodwork <laughs> certainly proving to be their biggest nemesis here in game number one. That's a miss. Hal Flick, double tap. Oh, what a read. What a punishment. And what did I say? Kickoff scenario incoming. Hey, finally, we see something go well off of the backboard for this squad. So many times, Relic, like, we have just seen time after time again, as you mentioned, Woodward getting absolutely beat down by the shots from Monterey Bay. Finally, they're able to get one to go in on that double tap. 15 seconds left to go. They've got control of the ball as well, looking to make up one. There's a cross Ooh, all the way. On. It's going to be aftershock to take the lead on the last offensive attack. They'll float this one in front of the net. Going up is Cal. They Will they have the touch? No, they can't make it. Now Garrett has to be a little bit more aggressive here. Falling all the way back. Zero seconds. It'll oh. hit the ground. And King going to take game number one. We should warn you, the Professor Layton curse, of course, uh, if you've just joined us, our producer for today, Professor Layton, the Layton curse is that it always goes to game seven and it's a seven goal thriller there in game number one. And Cal Flick is going to be wanting to play those final few seconds back. Uh, they shouldn't, honestly. That is such a cute finish if he manages to make connection with it. And even if he does make connection, the angle of shot that he had to perform there, so acute. I, I doubt that even some pros would have been able to hit that one on target. But hey, look, great first game from both teams. Mistakes here and there, sure, but a lot to be positive about, of course. Kane University walking out with the win. Just one step ahead throughout that mid-game, and the Otters looking to correct that as we head into game number two. Yeah, of course, the best part about a best-of-seven series is that that first game, a lot of times, doesn't really matter too much. Uh, if you get the momentum from a victory, that's awesome. Um, but if you end up dropping that first game, especially only by one goal, there is plenty of time to get back into the series. It's not like a best of five where if you lose that first one at that second game, there's a lot of pressure on you to make sure you win that game and you don't get stuck in a situation where you're already on match point. There's a little bit more time in the best of seven to make up for it. But the, the, on the flip side of this one, though, Kane now getting their first win on the season. Monterey Bay getting their first loss on the season. Both teams in unfamiliar territory. How do they respond? Well, Garrett gets two people to miss with his Jedi mind powers. And it's going to be see some <laughs> one and Kane zero. This is not the shot you're looking for. <laughs> and uh, a, a nice ballerina display there as well in front of the ball. Unfortunately, no one hits it. No one finds the money. And that's 1-0 Monterey Bay. Good start. Now we'll see whether they can continue this sort of momentum because this is certainly the form that we were seeing from them in, in the final couple of minutes of game number one. That's it. Almost an instant response. Cal Flick putting up a big save. Kane back on the scene here. A miss with the infield pass. Indemnity got that 100 boost. Nice horse kick there to bring it back into a dangerous zone for his team. Juku, that's going to fall back to the midfield line. Red Blur forced back himself here. We're able to win the challenge. It back it goes into dangerous territory for Kane University. Calvick. A miscontrol and a clearance ultimately. It's going to be indemnity in the corner, passing out in front of the net. Garrett has to make a touch here, and they do to get it over one. The last one, Injuku coming back, able to get enough of a 50, but the ball moving side to side is going to give Garrett an opportunity, and they will unfortunately not be able to connect with the goal. Aftershock continuing it, looking to get this one back pass. Great control on the play. That's a play in Rocket League I personally absolutely love. 
you don't always have to keep moving the ball in the right direction in terms of where the opponent's goal is. You just got to make sure you're able to find your teammates. Does not work out 100% in their favor, however. We go through another minute of Rocket League gameplay. Still the same score. Yeah, it's your solo queue strategy, isn't it? Where you either look awesome or just shoot the ball at the net. There's no thinking beyond that, just doing. And actually, it does pay sometimes to look around you, to communicate, to see, well, maybe the best shot isn't going to arrive here, even when I'm the closest to net. I've got a teammate on the way. Let's go backwards. Let's set up something better. That's a missed touch from Indemnity. And Juku in the way to be able to put up the save after shock. No relation to the shock of uh, previous Sonic's fame, of course. Uh, and certainly not the afters of Sonic's fame either. Not able to do much there. Another shot goes on target for this blue net. Another save coming through from Calflick. And a lot less goals in this one, Trippin. But currently, the only sc uh, score that matters for the Otters is that it's theirs. You know, they got one on the board. But Kane University continuing to ramp up this pressure. And that's another shot on target. Another save. Otters defense holding. You know, Kane kind of taking the approach from Monterey Ooh. Bay in the last game. Just shoot the ball as many times as possible. And now it's going to be Monterey Bay is putting a couple shots on target. But the defense holds strong here for Kane. They look to find a game-tying goal. And they're not going to be able to do it on their own back half. Need to get a clear here. And they do. At least out to midfield. Aftershock will knock it down. Solid control of the ball. Looking for a teammate at midfield and finds him. It's indemnity on the backboard. That touch leaking out to midfield. Straight up, straight back down. Cal oh, is man. there. Oh, Wifty, Wifty. It's Aftershock versus Indemnity. Indemnity's going to win it. Garrett continuing that pressure. It's still around on the back wall. And finally, the pressure can be released. Massive let off for Kane. That was probably game. Had the Otters taken their chances. And Aftershock, probably uh, the biggest head in hands moment of all. Just needed a bit of power. But that's it. That's a lovely flick. And that is surely redemption for Aftershock. Finally, the 2-0 lead they've well deserved. It's finally going in for them. And they've just had so many great opportunities really to actually get a goal scored and haven't been able to find it at least in this game they got to get this victory to shore up the series at one apiece and that is certainly a good way to start doing it we've seen that Kane is able to score when they need to it's going to be a little bit better offensively the double tap is not gonna go Gara's gonna get challenged that one will go wide as we enter the final 60 seconds of game number two Cal Fleck, that's another win and that's on a plate for Garrett's 3-0 and possibly the gain sewn up. This is a great overall play and just not a whole lot that can be done defensively here from Kane. We see a great play by Monterey Bay to extend the lead to three. And now with only 60 seconds left, there's not a whole lot of opportunity here for Kane. I've seen it done before. I've seen three goals in less than a minute. Hell, I've seen three goals in less than probably 15 seconds. It's just a matter of whether or not Kane is going to have the wherewithal to be able to make that happen. And at least so far, the way that game number two has gone, I don't think that they are going to be happy with the results. It's a question of how big's your bottle, isn't it? 125 milliliters or a full two liter? We'll wait and see as there's 40 seconds remaining on this one. Another save away from Garrett and a shout out to the defense of the Otters on this particular occasion. Really stout, really strong, great rotations in their own third. Garrett, that's a lovely pass. That's a great passing play. Shot on target, goal. C can ask questions of the defense, Strippin, but you cannot deny pretty. The give, the go, the give back, and Cal Flick is right there. And the placement is very good as well on that near post. That's an incredibly difficult shot to make. It's a really easy to, to hit that ball behind all the defenders, but to hit it in front of them and to get that slot going the other direction is just a thing of beauty there for Cal Flick. And Monterey Bay showing that that first game, a little bit of a flu, just kind of giving one to Kane. Now with 15 seconds left to go, this one is most certainly in the bag and we'll move on with another great save in front of the net continuing to deny Kane an opportunity to score a goal we will move on into game number three of this series tied up at one apiece it's a space race but not the kind you're thinking of it's not the u.s versus russia it's 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 more Kane university versus monterey bay and the space that we're talking about is the midfield and once you get to that final third the otters able to dominate the midfield so many great passing opportunities leading to a lot of chance creation leading to four goals that's now seven in total for the orange team 
looking at Kane University, uh, a lot of space left open at the back, allowing their opposition to move, not necessarily at will, but a lot more freely than what they were seeing in their final third. Uh, really struggling with chances and a lot of their good op options being snuffed out by this awesome Monterey Bay defense. To see them not score a single goal uh, is pretty shocking, I would say, for all of us, given that first game. It's all about how they can now adapt from here on out to try and redress the balance. Yeah, it really wasn't, you know, Kane's fault that they didn't get any goals scored in that last game. It was just the defense from Monterey Bay was that good. Uh, they have an opportunity right here in front of the net to Kane to try to make something happen. A very aggressive third play. It's going to work out in their favor for just long enough, but Calflick will eventually push this ball downfield, popped into the air to the sidewall. Aftershock knocking it down. There is the big boom and clear down the sidewall. Coming back, and Kane looking very aggressive with this positioning early on in this game. And oh, nice. Juju trying Woo! to show that that aggressiveness will pay off, and it does. They find Paydirt. 1 0 for Kane. I hope he's smiling because that's a cute one. That is really classy. Beautiful touch. Slips underneath the crossbar. Unsavable, even with the defender there. Just misreads it slightly. Great credit to Juku, though. That's how you respond after a 4 0 drubbing. That's not how you respond on the kickoff, however. Red Blow with a big save. And that's been a couple of different times that we have seen the kickoff just go very, very poorly for one of these two teams. And ultimately, Kane is able to survive it for now. And they'll get a clear as well, but it'll be a handover of possession for Monterey Bay. They'll bring it out from their own back line. Now, Juku is there looking for a pass. Won't find it. Might work as a Ooh. fake. That one will hit the crossbar out in front of the net. Not going to help. Oh. Very aggressive third positioning will backflip this one into their own net. And that is one of the most impressive goals you're going to see. So you got the double commit there. And Indemnity is probably looking at that thinking, did I really just, did I? Was that me? Was that, can't, can't be me, surely. That's unfortunately just a panic moment where one of these players, your anchor, has caught themselves far too far up the pitch. They try and do something with it rather than just leave it. Lack of communication, yes. Maybe a bit of overzealousness, yes. The result is still the same. It's a tie game. Well, what I want to see at this point now is how Monterey Bay is going to react, knowing that oh. Kane is going to have this very aggressive. Play. Oh! Apparently, it just doesn't matter because Kane is just built differently, and Red Blur is going to be the one to score it. Indemnity knocks it down. The best 50 I've ever seen. It goes right to Red Light, bumps over the top, and then the almost impossible angle shot. Just dominus things. That's all I got to say. Can we talk about the puff? the pop off that rear wing that is dirty a give and go with themselves and to have the composure to put that away at the end when the angle was always going against them that's a beautiful individual play and that was almost another bit of individual brilliance from juku as red blur stops the cal flick push forward it's not going to stop garrett however up it goes and away it goes from kane university with that lead reinvigorated Quite honestly, I feel like at this point, Kane is just playing redirect simulator. Every single time the ball comes around the face of the net, that seems to be the touch oh, they're man. going for. And Garrett's going for the big double off the backboard, and that's a game-tying goal. It's, it might not be G, but it's certainly S. Garrett S. And that, I mean, look, we're starting to raise the skill ceiling of this series. More mechanical prowess, seemingly one on top of the other. Another kickoff, gonna go the way of the Otters. Go sideways, picked up by Calflick. Inwards towards goal, away it goes. Garrett's not gonna get there first. Forward, it's Juku, beats Aftershock to the punch, and that's a tap-in, and that's going to be put home by Indemnity. You can't put them down. Yeah, this is, again, that just aggressiveness from Kane, relentless pressure to push up all three players, and it's a little bit too much for Monterey Bay right now. They're not able to counterattack. A lot of times, those, that's what you have to do. If you're not getting nice, big, booming clears away from that attacking team, you're going to struggle mightily when they put up this much pressure, and that's what has happened. Oh. A little bit of a backboard miscue is going to lead to a clear off the backboard. As we respawn, we see the touch there, the floater on target. Get Garrett S will be there for the save. That's a good call as well from Garrett. You can see their aftershock could have gone up. Didn't stop any potential follow-up shot from happening. Not going to stop that one, however. And for the first time in this game, Trippin, potentially a really important moment. Two-point lead for Kane University. Their firepower has returned to its full force. The cannons are firing away. 
uh, and it might be a little bit too much for the otters to deal with as we hit the two minute mark. And they do still have two minutes to recover in this game. There is no time, way. especially if that one oh. manages to float in. It doesn't. It goes a bit wide. But come up on some pressure here. And they, they, they have to regain at this point, though. you got to get that momentum stopped for Kane. Uh, you have to stop giving them that ability to just score at will. And Aftershock will have a look here. They will not be able to connect with the ball. And Relic, mistakes like that are going to make this very difficult to come back here from Monterey Bay. It's a better opportunity than I think they gave themselves credit for. There was time to line up the shot because RNG was still in, pro in progress. The demo had already been made. That's going to be a push off the backboard. Garrett intercepts another potential attacking run. Goes up, got no boost. Not that the Orange team knows that. It's a decent clearance away. Double commit. That's straight to the midfield. Oh, what a miss that was. Open net, unpunished. What can the Otters do with that? Infield, looking for Cal Flick. Finds the pinch, goes a little bit too far wide. Aftershock steps in, back into the center. Juku away. So I'm going to roll up the side wall here with 60 seconds left to go. It's Garrett to pass it out to the infield. Great redirect opportunity. That one go off the backboard. Will they get there in time Ooh. to shoot? They will. It's Aftershock finding the net. And they will get a little bit of this comeback opportunity. I like the look there from Red Blur, but no one is expecting Cal Flick to make that touch. They get it right out in front of the net and give Aftershock a freebie. 50 MPH, it's not exactly the most powerful shot, but the, the way he places it is away from the trajectory of all the defenders in net. That's a really difficult skill to master. And Aftershock, in a split second, has been able to utilize it to find himself and his team a one goal. Well, I mean, that was a one goal uh, back into it, but it, it's now got to be another two goals because that is two major whiffs in the offensive phase here for Monterey Bay. It's a free shot. I'm glad Juku didn't get a touch in it. It might very well have rattled woodwork. Otherwise, Kane, five, Otters, three, 48 seconds left. They keep on shooting themselves in the foot. Yeah, you know, quite honestly, Monterey Bay just did their best Kane impression right there uh, by pushing up an incredibly aggressive third. The difference was that uh, Kane has been hitting that touch consistently and Monterey Bay ends up with the whiff, unfortunately. They're down by two goals here. 30 seconds left to go. They've struggled to come back in games before. Kane has been on an absolute tear since an early struggle in this one. A great 50 by indemnity at midfield now as we hit 20 seconds and a counting. For Monterey Bay to try to get back oh. into this one. An opportunity at midfield will be denied. And we'll have just the final 10 seconds left to count out. Garrett from the back. Right, at this point, time a, a cruel mistress and running away a little bit too quick. For Monterey Bay's liking, we saw a seven-game thriller in game number one. We saw the Otters up their count in game number two. They've been able to now match that goal output from game number two with four of their own. But Kane find one gear further. Five, a famous five for Kane as it's a nine-goal sensation here in game number three. Again, most important score, though, Trippin, is the one uh, at the end of the game when we're considering that macro scoreline. It's 2-1 in favor of Kane. Yeah, I mean, quite honestly, we have no shortage of goals to talk about in this series, nah. which is certainly making things awfully interesting. And this is one of those uh, situations, I think, where we have two very offensive teams who just happen to be mechanical enough to play defense. Not really any coordination on either side for defense. The offense has looked great. We've seen so many good outlook pa outlook passes. We've seen some great play off of the backboard. Uh, I've seen you know all kinds of fun things and highlights that we can talk about here, but the defense has been lacking on both sides. I, I think that the overall winner of this series is going to be the team who can step up better defensively and take more control of the ball and just stop giving up those easy possessions, those easy goals, and most importantly, those aggressive third man players. That has been driving me absolutely bonkers. Uh, I know that's a style that I like to play, but I hate to play against it. And when I'm looking at competitive Rocket League, it's a tough one to watch as well. Quick shot there, one way, going back for Juku, the other and aftershock with the save. And it is so strange as well to talk about defensive failures when game two was a shutout. It was it was a 4-0. Yeah. Yeah. Like, How? <laughs> the ability to defend is there. They just seem to... Memory of a goldfish, right? Memory of a goldfish. And if we see more of that Monterey Bay, then Kane University's got a lot to be scared about. Got a lot to be scared about if Aftershock finds that double touch. Uh, not on this occasion. Garrett slows the play down. Indemnity, the pop up here. Cal Flick. Doesn't have... Oh, they do have the pace to get something on it, but not enough. There's a demo on Indemnity there who was rushing forward. Missed touch. Juku not able to get a piece of it here. Away to the midfield line. Nice rotations round from Kane University as they continue to look 
hope and prod find a way through aftershock again possession lost and that's certainly one thing which we can uh, discredit this otters team for they do have a tendency to give away possession cheaply and kane university that's why they found so much joy in game number three yeah and they have that possession again duquesne university and a missed touch here off the backboard from Aftershock. We knocked down by Juku. Needs someone behind them to help out. And it's going to be just thrown right in front of the net. Cleared back to midfield again. And now that battle for the midfield possession will begin. It's Calflake who's going to be the first one to try it out. It's going to go off the ceiling here for Aftershock. Clear by Juku. Will bounce around on the corner. Garrett making the turn. Getting the beat on the ball. It'll soar off into the other corner. We're approaching a two minute mark here with neither team being able to score a goal relic after nine in game number one. It seems to be either feast or famine for both sides. Out into the midfield once again. Oh, Indemnity. Oh my word, it almost came off. It was actually no contact from Indemnity. The shot from Blur very almost good enough on its own. Kane starting to flex their creative minds. That's a very simple shot on target. Forces a save from the keeper after shock in this case. There they are again, out to the midfield, helped on by Garrett. That's actually on target, would you believe? Juku does what they can do. Bit of a difficult starting position here. They're trying to look for demos on the way out. Garrett finds one on Juku. But it's a little bit too to the part of the side here. Garrett's backboard and away once again. All right at halftime, still tied up at zero piece. Garrett trying to change that, starting up some offense here and getting a pinch to roll up into the corner. There's a free look in front of the net. No one from Kane is able to touch it till the last possible second. They'll clear it across. Monterey Bay will continue with that pressure. There is a pass onto the backboard. It is going to be denied. Back out to midfield. A lot of players from Kane University look a little bit panicky here. Offensively, Aftershock taking some control. Couple wave dashes, keeping that speed up. Garrett now will play it in the corner. Out in front of the net. Very dangerous spot in front of the box. The save made yet again. The shot, here it comes. The save yet again. A couple bounces around. Absolute pinball style right now in front of the net, but it's still not in. Indemnity did not know what happened. Uh, and they're very lucky as well. The power of the shot just skying upwards and hitting woodwork once again. Garrett's that's going to end up straight with the orange team. That's fallen nicely for Juku, who helps it onward, if not a little bit sideways. Finds that second touch. Difficult for Calflick. Forced back. Up goes Garrett's. Makes the interception. Back in it goes once again for the orange team. Away it goes, but that's a double commit. Garrett's not going to find that 100 boost, but is going to chase the ball down. Infield, aftershock, going sideways. Surely the shot on target, the better option here. Picks up that 100 boost on the way out. And it's a nervy game, afraid game. No real consistency, but finally a breakaway moment for Indemnity, who finds the go-ahead goal. 106 left, Kane with the lead. A oh, great job chasing this one down by Indemnity and making a perfect read on Aftershock's touch. And they're chasing that ball downfield. The teammate comes up behind them and tries to help out. And that goes to be the downfall here for Monterey Bay as they found themselves down by a goal. But now with the kickoff situation, they have an opportunity to reset a little bit. Kickoffs have been a little bit stronger for them so far in this series. Aftershock off the back wall, leaking out in front. Here's Cal on target. That would be nice. saved by Red Blur. And now finally cleared by Juku because we have 50 seconds left. Garrett's forced to go wide, and there's a demo on Juku. They're one light here in the midfield. Indemnity goes wide himself. Good opportunity there. The Doink away, just basically playing keep away uh, for the sake of his team here, Monterey. It's a little bit too route one for me, a little bit too simplistic. Just looking to clear the lines, and then that's it. There's no forward thinking. Indemnity Kane starting to look better and better. A little Doink there, and we might have been talking about 2 0. Garrett's towards the net. Juku away. I think he was hitting woodwork anyway. 50. Calflick over one. Where's the third player? There they are, but a big save from Indemnity. There's the follow-up, and it goes wide again. You cannot say that the Otters haven't had their chances. They have, and then some. Here's another great defense once again. Garrett's wrong place, wrong time. Aftershock puts it back. Kane on to match point. Boy, does Monterey Bay want that one back right out in front of the net relic, and they're not able to send it home. The opportunity they had and that they needed, you said, where's the third man? Just a tiny, tiny bit late. I mean, we're talking a matter of a second or two. And for all the times that I've been upset about the aggressive third man, that was the time where they needed, shockingly, uh, to be more yeah. aggressive, to actually get that goal to go. They don't find it there. And then, as you mentioned, now we're on to match point for Kane. A very solid look for them so far. 
but I've seen this episode before, <laughs> and I'm definitely thinking Monterey Bay is going to have an adjustment and an answer for that last game. I would not be surprised to see that myself, Trippin. I think what Kane has, of course, is that two-point advantage in the series. Mm -hmm. They've got the confidence. They know that they found something that works defensively for them, just as the Otters found something that worked defensively for them in game number two. I don't really know where it's gone. I guess you could argue that there were a lot less goals in game number four and therefore really should we be criticizing them that much was it more their offensive side of things which let them down i would say on the basis of that game number four yeah it probably was but kane is is running away with the momentum now demo on garrett's back into the midfield and i love these offensive rotations from kane it's another shot on target unlucky not to be 1-0 Ah, that's real close there. The cherry picking just about works out for them. You're saying how much you like that offensive rotation. They're just back there waiting in the wings, Arcane, to make that shot happen. That time, it does not work. Now, going the other way, Monterey Bay doing the same thing. They have to play this one off the backboard. It's 50 down, and Denby getting credited for a shot. Now, it's cleared out by Garrett. It'll be a race all the way down to the orange net. Red Boar will be the one to initially win it. Aftershock back out in front of the box. That one's cleared to the side wall. Aftershock keeping it in. There's the boom. It's a deflection. Might it be there for Red Blur? They pass it out big time midfield. And Ball is going to bounce free a couple times. Up and loose. There for anyone to get. It's Aftershock. Let's it rest on his hood. Nice. Not able to beat the second. There's Garrett. They're looking to go again. A bit too aggressive. Otters trying to perhaps surprise. Shock. Catch out Kane University. Another infield pass intercepted. Garrett's towards net. One on one. Challenge won by Kane University. Red Blur transfers it down to the backboard of the blue. Shot off target. Shot not away as it's once again into Aftershock's hands. The chase forward doesn't prioritize the boost. Takes it round one and there's no connection. Although it's a scuff connection actually, but not on target. That was the most important moment that the Otters to strike. Infield once again and no luck for Aftershock tripping. They're so close. Incredibly speedy, aggressive offensive rotations there from Monterey Bay. Just trying to get those goals on the board and play with that lead for longer. That shot will be off target there from Kane. I got to admit, that's one that you absolutely hate to see as it'll bounce free into the corner. Aftershock hitting that one down. Indemnity knocking it the other way. It'll bounce all the way back as we approach halftime here in this critical game number five. Kane University just won victory away here from getting their first series win of the season. Oh, like demo that. in front oh, of the net yes. is not going to help. Look at Monterey Bay getting physical. Your temptation here is to just try and block the clearance. Calvlick absolutely chooses the right decision. Demo one, potentially demo two of them, because that ball is going to go back out into the box. And as long as one of your teammates is there to shadow strike, that's a free shot of net, baby. Well done from the Otters. Much, much needed breakthrough. Just on the stroke of halftime, Kane University, are you going to let this one slip away? And now it's really going to be up to Monterey Bay to hold on to this lead. We've seen them do it quite well before. They've also struggled to do it versus Kane. So not really a whole lot of opportunities from the prior four games for either of us to really figure out how this one is going to go. We haven't seen really any consistency at this point. So I'm not even going to try to speculate. I'm just going to talk about the game that's happening <laughs> that has two more minutes left to go. Kane's still on that match point, pushing up offensively here. Off of the backboard, rolling down. It'll go the other way. Garrett moves forward as Juku's in hot pursuit. And you can see that the one major adjustment that has been made by the Otters is they're going for these strafing runs. They're not necessarily looking for the challenges. They're looking for the next play. And that is exactly what Garrett has done. A pickpocket 2-0. This is a great job here by Monterey Bay to secure a stronger lead and a nice cheeky chip pass out into midfield in the 50 just far too late. Ends up being a wide open net. Now Kane is going to be fighting from two goals behind with 90 seconds left to do it. The opportunity is there, but the late comeback has not been one that either team has been able to pull off. It only seems to be with an abundance of time on the clock that either of them are able to make any significant pushes. And it's only time ticking away the longer it takes Kane to score their first goal this game. Oh, I love this from Garrett. Just slow down the play. I love this from Aftershock. Slow down the play, but bumped out of the way and forces a save out of Cal Flick. Aftershock, bold attempt. Doesn't come off. Bit of a miscontrol here. Back to Juku. 
challenge won by Juku, but there is the follow-up clearance from Garrett sideways. And another challenge won here for the blue team. Lovely bit of keep away from Cali State, Monterey Bay. That's dangerous. Glances across goal out to the midfield line. Garrett forced back. Again, waylays the 100 boost. He's going to run back around and get this 100 on the midfield line. Bit of a mistouch there from Calthic, but really selfless plays here from Monterey Bay. If they see a potential situation developing, if there's a bit of a, a scuffed shot, if there's a bit of a mistimed hit, there's always someone there to rotate back in around and make sure that it is cleared away from a dangerous area. 20 seconds left. Yeah, and that is a much, much better look than we have seen in a couple other of these games just to get the ball out of danger as many times oh, as possible. Man. They will not get the danger away there. Indemnity will put the first one on the board for Kane. And I think for your Monterey Bay right now, that's why you had a two goal lead in the first place, but now you've got a one goal lead to hang on to with 16 seconds and a kickoff incoming. Clinical, unsavable, in off the post. 16 seconds, weirder things have happened. But that's a good first sign for Cali Bay. Demo on Juku, back into the center. Difficult, and they've done the full turnaround. Didn't even need 16 seconds. Well, I have absolutely caster cursed myself. As I said, neither team has been able to make a late comeback happen. And Kane, in the final 60 seconds of the game, has managed to turn this one around. They've tied the game up at two apiece, but there are still nine seconds left to go for one of these two teams to get a late second hero victory. It is a neutral kickoff. It's going to be Cal, who will start things off out to midfield. They will be denied. There's a redirect opportunity. Garrett will come in and knock that one away. Now, zero seconds. It bounces off. The ceiling comes oh, down man. to the ground and Relic our first overtime. CSUMB, they were in the driver's seat and they find themselves thrown into the passenger's department. That is a real nervy end to this game. Garrett almost finds that double tap. Cal Flick, that's gonna head off to the side. Aftershock wins the challenge. Can he find the second touch here? No, it falls down and not on target. The savior being Red Blur. Speedy Gonzalez moving into the midfield, moving forward. Infield, it goes once again. Indemnity, the savior. Two goals in five seconds. Ends up with Red Blur once again. Infield and away. Workman clearance. Juku and a demo. It's currently as tight as you want it, Trippin. What a finale we may have here. Oh, this is looking real good right now. Just as an overall game, we're here for the content. There's a touch off the sidewall. A double commit oh. defensively. One will go back. Red Blur skies this one. Looking for a secondary touch and a drop angle. They're going to find it, but Cal is going to find a save. Now they'll go in offense the other way. Aftershock and get beat on the 50. That will take off the pressure here as we equip the first minute of this overtime. And Cal will start things over yet again. Has the ball taken away, but now it's Garrett with 80 boost on the sidewall. Gets bumped a couple times. Can't make the decision. Gets called off. Shot on target. Saved by Juku. Answer. Rebound off of the post yet again. Desperation demos coming out from Kane, but it disrupts the play enough to be able to prevent what was almost a certain third goal going in, taking this to game number six. Juku, the pop up. Met in the air by Garrett, who more and more often we're seeing trying to put on the cape here to be the superhero, to drag his team through into that game number six. He's got to remain faithful to his teammates here simply because he's not going to be able to challenge this the rest of this series on his own, let alone this game. There it is. Nice if you'll pass. And that's exactly why you keep the faith. Hell quick. CSUMB take it to game number six. I just love the awareness here from Garrett and from Catholic to stay up on this offensive play. Garrett gets bumped off the ball, doesn't have a ton of boost to work with, but does an excellent job on the wall of getting that recovery, making sure they can get back to the ball, pass it out in midfield, and right there is a teammate just waiting, just on a silver platter. Serve it to me, please, and let me score this goal. Great victory there for Monterey Bay. They still have another one to do, Relic, before we get to that aforementioned game seven we knew it was going to happen this entire time not to leak the script or anything but this is a monterey bay win that's coming up in game six so if there's any <laughs> point in time that you need to go like get a drink go to the bathroom want some snacks or something uh now is the time to do it because we already know what's going to happen off that momentous game six. Oh, tripping it's not about the destination it's about the <laughs> journey even if we know what's going to happen you want to find out how big or how little that scoreline is. Let us make no, let's, let's not mince meat here. Let's not mince meat because Kane University did so well to scrap yes. that overtime out of nothing. They were not part of that game for a solid three minutes. And then all of a sudden, great goal, excellent execution from Indemnity and a kickoff goal. 
and that's how quickly Rocket League can turn. Just as here, open net, the ball trickling wide. It's not even a case of whether you can or can't at this stage. It's about the trying. I know it's very anti-Yoda, isn't it? But trying something different can sometimes catch out your opponents. And I think that is what we saw from CSUMB in that game number five. The, 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 the willingness to try something different, to, to change things up. And Kane University, now it's up to them. And they respond with some adaptations of their own. Yeah, at least the first 30 so or seconds of this game, a little bit ugly here from Kane. And this one is pinched off the backboard, redirected luckily. We gotta wait for Red Boar to get all the way back here on defense. Aftershock will challenge them with a touch in the corner. They'll go up for the 50 and knock it down hard off the ground. Garrett will call off Cal Flick. Does he get a little bit of air dribble control? Goomba stop attempt and Evolve just leak out, out to midfield. Aftershock with one touch, looking for a second. The tight angle off the backboard. Pass in front of the net. Gonna be denied by the defense. Going up is Indemnity. That touch right out in front of the net. Aftershock will capitalize in Monterey Bay. Another goal. Aftershock had a lot of time to figure out what he wanted to do with this. And Red Blur just a little too slow. Maybe should have angled that car up a little bit further. Of course, Dominus, plank build, got a bit of a longer hitbox. And so you've got to use that to your advantage. It's an easy mistake to make, but it's also not a great mistake to make at this particular point in the series. That is another lead going the way of Monterey Bay. And Kane University, if they go to game number seven, uh, you would worry for them because that would be two games unanswered. Gonna be a free oh, man. low goal for Aftershock. Just coming right off of the analysis from Relic. Cal Flick is like, you know, we're not quite done with this one yet. Let me dish up Aftershock real quick for a wide open free play goal that is just not gonna be missed. And I think that that really has been the transition for this Monterey Bay team over the course of this series. I think if this is game one or game two, quite honestly, as easy as that goal was, I think Aftershock might end up missing that one. That happened so yeah. many times early on where the woodwork was just getting beat down by these many shots. But now that Monterey Bay has cleaned up that offense a little bit, we're seeing them score a lot more often than they are just throwing the ball away. And that is helping them immensely. And now Kane finds themselves in a 2-0, possibly 3-0 hole. And that one will be saved. Will it be cleared as well? Yes. So Kane now has three minutes to make up two goals again. And, you know, we've seen the best of... of the Otters defense, we've seen the worst of the Otters defense. They don't have to worry about defense because of how much they're dominating this midfield. Kane have hardly had a look at the net. In fact, really, this is their best opportunity. And even then, they're still in the viewing seats. They're not able to get in and amongst the action themselves. Big clearance from Garrett. Looking for that second touch, almost finds the top pocket there. Incredible that they almost managed to find a third from that particular scenario. Garrett sees Aftershock on the far line. Excellent. Intercepted. Still finds its way to Aftershock. Actually, halftime comes and goes, and it's a 2-0 scoreline. Kane looking for something a little bit devilish there, but look, they've been able to score two goals within the last 30 seconds. It's not all over yet. Rope drop right down in front of the box. It's saved by Garrett. Now going the other way. Great boost steal here from Dooku, hoping to help out. Aftershock will put a shot on target. It's going to be Indemnity who will manage to get in front of the play. And finally, this one will clear downfield. Rowing up the side wall. A good opportunity here to shoot for Kane. And they'll just let that one go. He cleared out the other way. Now here will come Juku off the back. Well, they won't get the touch. A very, very awkward opportunity. But Red Boy was going to be there. And I think, you know, Rev, like we were talking so many times before about just flat out missed opportunities. And that's another one right there to put another nail in the coffin. It's another mistake from the defense of Kane University as well. Whereas we wouldn't have been seeing this in game number one and game number two. Now it's starting to become a lot more prevalent. And you can see the confidence from Cal Flick there throwing themselves into a 1v2 challenge and coming out on top. Over to the far side, Cal Flick once again, little boost. Again, not that Kane know that, and the eventual follow-up shot is snuffed out. Garrett round the corner. No third player there, but as long as the possession remains in the Otters' hands, they could just drive this one to the finish line. Yeah, that's the thing here right now. You don't even need to shoot the ball right now if you're Monterey Bay. Like, sure, if you get an open opportunity like that one, sure. Garrett, just go ahead and lay it in. Uh, just take your third shot and score your first goal. Absolutely, why not? But they didn't have to. They did a great job there for about 30 seconds, just holding on to the possession, just making sure a different player from Monterey Bay was coming in, making a touch every single time they got an opportunity. That's exactly what they did. It leads to their third goal. And now Kane has even bigger heroics that they have to climb compared to Game number five in game six. They're now three goals down with 60 seconds to play. 
you know, 2 0, you got some daylight, 3 0, and you're practically in a different country by that point. 50 seconds left. And all you can see is the Otters looking to extend their lead, Juku with the save away. Real worrying signs if you're a Kane University fan right now. That said, as if on cue, I mean, look, I can cast a curse myself. Uh, yes, <laughs> we, we are one and the same here, Trippin. It's a nice infield pass, maybe a bit of complacency. Cal took a little slow to that challenge. It's one goal to find two in 41 seconds, not impossible. Is this the start of something exceptional? Well, this is why you have a three-goal lead. You can give up a goal and you cannot panic. You can take a moment to adjust, just calm down the nerves a little bit and say, guys, let's focus on getting to game number seven. We have to close out this game first. We need to make sure we don't allow Kane to get back into it. They've already shown that they ha certainly have that ability when given an opportunity. They'll throw this one oh, down. Man. Field is going to be oh. red going for it. They will get beat. This one coming down off the backboard. It's going to be 10-second average per goal. Has to happen here for Kane. Will they do the next five they're gonna close it down and indemnity needs to score this oh and they have oh it's a massive pre-read and flip into the trajectory of the ball that is that is going at a rate of knots as well to slice it in top right 10 seconds kickoff is it deja vu for csumb you literally cannot believe that right now 4k and they've got 10 seconds to score they win the kickoff they've got possession there's the cross oh. but no one's there as it's a little bit too spicy to come down off the ceiling zero seconds is all that's left for kane will they do it in the last second there's the pass no touch they're not gonna find it monterey bay will barely hold on to win that game number six relic and move on to game number seven just as Leighton predicted it's it's the Leighton effect it's game number seven it had to be and you know what it might not have been had Kane sorted had the right hand talk to the left hand because mm -hmm. they were all stumbling over each other call someone off make your decision early uh of course these things come with time and experience uh, you know, these are still young guys and, and you can't blame them for wanting to be the hero themselves. And there may still be a chance to be the hero in game seven. Not all over yet, of course. But surely you're looking now at Monterey Bay and thinking they're in the ascendancy. They mm -hmm. are not starting games slow. They're starting games fast. The passing lanes are open for them to exploit. Their defense is looking a lot better after that game three anomaly. The waves are currently uh, flowing in their favor, but game number seven, Champions Field, I guess it's not Champions Field right now, but sh we'll call it Champions Field for sake, right? You never know what can happen uh, in these scenarios. It's a final five minutes on the clock. And right now, the thing that's going to happen is Monterey Bay needs to open up this game confidently and quickly. The last two games, they've gotten out to early big leads, two and three goals in games five and six, respectively. With an early lead here, putting Kane on their back foot, I think that is the best direction for this Monterey Bay team to take. The only other thing they have to do, the thing that they have struggled with, is shutting out Kane in the last minute of the game. If they're able to get that far, it'll be a confident win for them. Otherwise, I think Kane certainly has their chances. If they can just get a lead, that is what they've struggled with in the last couple losses. I definitely like to see CSUMB get the demos out once again or just continue up their great shooting accuracy. Aftershock, that is a difficult shot to make. And we've said that a couple of times. I mean, we were highlighting him from the first couple of games. Seemed really out of it, but now into the groove. I mean, goodness me. <laughs> How close do you want it? 1-0. Yeah, and that's, again, part of the benefit of a best of seven if it gives some of these players a little bit of time to actually warm up into the series. And I think that's exactly what oh. Aftershock needed. Here's a flip reset from Garrett that ends up as a pass. Oh, and Aftershock, unfortunately, will throw that one off of the pose. But Calflick will keep up this possession. He'll get 50 on the goal line. It's finally cleared out. Pop to midfield. Aftershock is there. Woo! And a missile's on target, but that one will not go. That one's saved by Juku on this shot by Calflick. The shots are raining in for Monterey Bay, but the goals are not falling. It's time to whip out the, the Premier League cliche of it was easier to score. Not once, not twice, but thrice. Oh my goodness, the Otters. I hope that doesn't come back to bite them in the bottom. Still three minutes, 30 left. They are desperate to find that second. Deserve that second. Garrett's lurking around the enemy box. They just about get it away. Kane University looking to fight on the rebuttal here. Another great bit of blocking from Aftershock, however, leaves it. And again, that should be 2-0.
I, I like the worm burner approach on the shot, but the accuracy just not there at the moment. And the more that Monterey Bay struggles to get these goals to fall, the more they allow Kane back into the game. The low 50 will go in front of the box after Shock will push it out to midfield. Garrett will get out 50, but Cal Flick is there. A little bit of boost as well to take a little bit of control. Red will put this one towards the target, but they won't find it out. It's a two on one attack, uh. no 50 there. And Juku will try with zero boost to get a read on this one off the backboard out in front for oh. Kane, and they will not find the hole either. All right, that's evens. That's evens because Kane should have been 1 1 there, and another scuffed shot. Another moment of panic. Great demo on the keeper. But whoa, what a great counter demo from Garrett. Going to go all the way down the other end. Are they going to be able to get there in time? Yes, they are. Massive save. Massive power plays. Doing everything within the vestiges of their power, both teams, to try and either continue to extend that lead. And no, it's still not going to be extended. Juku, unable to score down the other end, makes a big save on his own. Kalflick infield once again oh my word how have we not seen more than one goal oh my goodness what can we not say right now about the keen squad defensively now they just need a little bit of offense to go with it there's the pass oh there's going to be word. another one harlem globetrotter style one off the backboard two off the backboard third shot coming in late here from juku is that gonna be a shot at all it's gonna be a pass out to red blur who will pop it up off the nose of that red and white domin as they will not be able to connect a back pass going now to juku as they will get it in front of the net off the wall there's a floater all three players are in the net for Monterey Bay, they get an initial save. Another infield pass will be pinched away, and Keane will not score on that final drive. Oh, what a save it was. A ping off the on the off the crossbar of all things. This much better. Another block away. The Otters defense holds, and finally the counterattack they've been looking for. Oh, Kane University. Got a feel for them. Still 68 seconds mind, but... It's another 2-0 breakaway for Monterey Bay. I mean, honestly, Relic, here's the thing. Keen plays their best Rocket League in the last minute of the game, and we have seen this in at least three of the six games this season. So I'll call that something that is no longer a statistical anomaly. That's almost something that you can bank on. Here's a counterattack. Here's a great pass. There's a shot on target. This is going to be a dunk as oh well. Words. It's free at the moment. It's just going to trickle in. And almost as if right on cue, I speak into existence a goal for Keen in just seven seconds. Oh, Count Juku channeling the dark side there. Some witchcraft, some wizardry. I know, that is really, that's that's blasphemous, I realize, taking it from different franchises. But look, <laughs> whatever way it goes in, that is massive for Kane University. Chasing down great patience from Aftershock, but really nice from Juku once again. That's going to go sideways. 40 seconds to do the business and find that all-important equalizer. 40 seconds, as you mentioned, to go. Indemnity and Kane need to break this ball out of their own half here in order to get an opportunity the other way to tie it up yet again late in a game. Now 30 seconds to go. This shot is wide of the target from Cal. The bounce is a bit favorable. Red will knock it down. It's going to go off the backboard again and now cleared. Here comes the counterattack from Kane. This one's going to be 50. That's off the side wall. Back in front of the net. There's an opportunity. That one will go wide as well. Garrett's. We're going to put this one to bed. Double tap. Oh, it's off the crossbar again. And now they're going to get back in position to rotate around. But no, Cal Flick was still confident. Stuck around, stuck his nose in, and he smelled blood. And now it's flowing out of the wounds as CSUMB tie up the game. Not to tie up the game. Tie up the series with a bow on top. You know, I really would have liked to see the double tap goal go, but still CSUMB getting that goal in, securing a two-goal lead this late in the series is almost most certainly going to be the end of the game, and they will hold on somehow. Will Monterey Bay down 3-1 in the series? They win it in Game 7, 4-3, and what a strong comeback from them. It's the gentleman's reverse sweep. They <laughs> allowed some some nice goals. And to be fair, what a cracking series, by the way. So many goals to, to dissect there. But Monterey yeah. Bay, uh, that is some steely nerves that you've got, despite that late game threat time and time and time again from Kane University, uh, able to weather the storm and, and find their berth in the dock. And now they can take a nice breath and relax. That's an all-important win here in week number two. Uh, and for Kane University, can't go away too disappointed, I don't think. Uh, ultimately, 
got to look at those last three games and say, what could we have done better? But that's the whole point of collegiate Rocket League, right? It's a learning experience. It's a learning curve. And there's an all important bump in the road that I'm sure that they will overcome. Yeah, that, that's the thing, right? Even if you end up dropping a series, there are plenty of things to learn from. A, a lot of opportunities in those final three games, I think, for Kane to take that one back to their Rocket League coach, or just any Rocket League coach in general, yeah. and just talk over what happened. But when you're talking about a team that came off of getting swept last week, and now they find themselves in a series where they go all the way to seven and drop it again, major improvement the season is still young we will see the honors move on to now two and oh on the season we'll see kane fall to oh and two on the season ggs overall to both teams GGs. though relic I, I really liked what i saw out of both of them oh yeah it was a fantastic series and we might be able to grab uh, one of the players and or coach so basically it's a bit of a choose your own adventure story we're either going to have a, a quick break and then return with an interview uh, or a long break before we head into our second series of the evening uh, either way feel free to stretch your legs grab some water uh, and be sure to be back here as quickly as possible just a vibe to the music maybe to catch the interview we'll see you after this the backboard and away it goes and a nice oh my word this is actually gonna roll in what how and One. both look pretty confident both eager to get more goals on the board that rattles the crossbar that goes underneath the crossbar indemnity and kane 2-1 Barely 90 seconds into game number one. We've already got 2-1. Oh, Make it 3-1 to one already. It's JCU with a third goal. This is from the Otters. Looking much better. Less than two minutes. Two goals. Not hard to find. Oh, it's another one that rattles the post. And as I said earlier, you create chance after chance eventually. It's awfully interesting. So make sure you guys... Get yourselves comfortable for the rest of this game. 90 seconds left on the Ooh. clock. That shot is on target from JCU. The Otters, I mean, they'd rather, I'm pretty sure they'd rather themselves be beavers at this point because the woodwork <laughs> certainly proving to be their biggest nemesis here in game number one. That's a miss. Cal Flake, double tap. Oh, what a read. What a punishment. And what did I say? Kickoff scenario incoming. First loss on the season. Both teams in unfamiliar territory. How do they respond? Well, Garrett gets two people. And Aftershock, probably uh, the biggest head in hands moment of all, just needed a bit of power. But that's it. That's a lovely flick. And that is surely redemption for us. We'll go wide as we enter the final 60 seconds of game number two. Cal Flick, that's another win. And that's on a plate for Garrett's. 3-0 and possibly Strong. the great rotations in their own third. Garrett, that's a lovely pass. That's a great passing play. Shot on target. Goal. C can't ask questions. There is the big booming clear down the sidewall. Coming back and Kane looking very aggressive with his positioning early on in this game. And oh, Juku nice. trying Woo! to show that that aggressiveness will pay off. And now Juku is there looking for a pass. Won't find it. Might work as Woo! a fake. That one will hit the crossbar out in front of the net. Not going to help. Oh. A very aggressive third positioning will backflip this one into their own net. In how Monterey Bay is going to react knowing that oh. Kane is going to have this very aggressive. Play. Oh, apparently it just doesn't matter because Kane is just built differently. And Red Blur is playing redirect simulator. Every single time the ball comes around the face of the net, that seems to be the touch oh, they're man. going for. And Garrett's going for the big double off the backboard. It's not going to get there first forward. It's Juku beats off the shot to the punch. And that's a tap in. And that's going to be put home by indemnity. Go with Garrett to pass it out to the infield. Great redirect opportunity. That one go off the backboard. Board. Will they get there in time Ooh. to shoot? They will. It's Aftershock finding the net. And here picks up that 100 boost on the way out. And it's a nervy game, afraid game. No real consistency, but finally a breakaway moment for Indemnity, who finds the go-ahead goal. Game number five, Kane University just one victory away here from getting their first series win of the season. Oh, like demo that. in front oh, of the net yes. is not going to help. The things have happened, but that's a good first sign for Cali Bay. Demo on Juku back into the center. Difficult, and they've done the full turnaround. He's got to remain faithful to his teammates here simply because he's not going to be able to challenge this the rest of this series on his own, let alone this game. There it is. Nice if he'll pass. See if they go to game number seven, uh, you would worry for them because that would be two games unanswered. This is going to be a oh, man. low goal for. You can see as the Otters looking to extend their lead, Juku with the save away. Real worrying signs if you're a Kane University fan right now. That said, as if on cue, Second I mean, average per goal has to happen here for Kane. Will they do it in the next five? They're going to close it down. 
and Indemnity needs to score this! Oh, and they have! Just get a lead. That is what they've struggled with in the last couple ones. I definitely like to see CSUMB get the demos out once again, or just continue up their great shoot crossbar. Of all things, this much better, another block away. The Otters defense holds, and finally the counterattack they've been looking for! You can bank on. Here's a counterattack. Here's a great pass. There's a shot on target. This is going to be a dunk as oh well. Words. It's free Ooh. at the moment. It's just going to trickle in, and almost as if right on cue, I see... Garrett's. We're going to put this one to bed. Double tap! Oh, it's off the crossbar again! And now they're going to get back in position to rotate around, but no! Cal Flick was still... I can't say that. I'll get in trouble. There's one for each game, so teams this weekend. Somebody's going to have to explain to TSA why they're coming home with an extra trophy. Fine. We're fine. This is going to be great. Why is everybody staring at me? I'm not even doing anything yet. Is it because I'm in a suit? It looks nice. It's new. I'm stressing. I'm stressing. It's all right. We win these. We absolutely win these. I've never seen us lose these. I love him. I, think, I don't remember his name. What is going on, everybody? And Oh, are we ready? I'll start over. Okay. What's going on, everybody? We are here at the Collegiate Esport Commissioner's Cup 2022 in Atlanta, Georgia. The players are just now entering the arena for day one. A lot of them had the opportunity to be here yesterday to get jerseys, to get familiar with the area, and to get to know one another. But today, the friendly gloves have to come off, and they are all here. Earlier, I was talking to these guys. This mannequin, when they didn't have anything else set up, I could see it from all the way down there, and I thought it was a person. And I stood there for like five minutes, and I was like, why is he standing like that? And I thought it was like a smooth criminal. I thought somebody was giving us like a Michael Jackson impression, and then it was a mannequin. I was really embarrassed to admit that. Oh my God, that's a lot of people. Hold on, let's go over this window. Let's go over this window. It just keeps going. There's so many people outside. There are so many people. A mighty series, a mighty conclusion. Welcome back uh, to Esports U number two, where we're going to break down this series uh, from the ECAC week number two, uh, a fantastic series between uh, Monterey Bay and Kane University, uh, a series which Monterey Bay came out on top in a best of seven, going the distance, tripping. Let's have a chat with Garrett. Yeah, welcome to the broadcast booth, Garrett. Glad to have you here. And importantly, coming off of that effectively gentleman's reverse sweep, you had a very solid performance in week number one with the 4-0 sweep. You go all the way to game seven this time. What was so much different about the Kane University opponent than what you had last week? How does that one end up going all the way to seven? Yeah, first off, thank you for having me on. Um, this week, uh, it was a lot different than our first week game. Uh, these guys played really good out the gate. Um, we could tell that it was going to be a lot uh, tougher competition. We uh, couldn't have our main third be on as well. Uh, so we had uh, Aftershock filling in for us in place of Sturban. Uh, so we were practicing with that kind of before this. But it was definitely a tough match. Uh, you know, after the game one, uh, we kind of had to regroup, refocus, just know how we play and uh, start playing our own game through that. And I think that's where we kind of found our strides, but a lot of it came down to the wire. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right to highlight game two there, of course, going from a seven-goal thriller to then a 4-0 a shutout in favor of you, of course. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself on the back foot again going through games three and four. Obviously, with Aftershock in there as, as not your regular third, uh, how did you guys bounce back was it just a case of geeing each other up you know giving yourselves that confidence boost necessary or, or was it just a case of, of quiet confident belief uh in your own teammates i mean that's certainly what it looked like from from our end yeah i i honestly think it was kind of a mixture of both like when they were uh when they were winning those games uh we decided uh you know we needed to pick up the comms we were getting a little quiet and uh we kept saying to each other like we're playing very stale right like just very very by the book, not really doing anything outside the normal. And uh, that's when I said we need to, you know, pick it up, play a little more aggressive, start going for some more higher, you know, level things that we know we can do and uh, and start start playing uh, more confident. And that really helped us out a lot. I love that mid-game adjustment, especially, you know, coming from the captain saying, hey, team, we, we got to do something. We got to make a difference. Uh, clearly, that ended up working out. And I do have to ask a very difficult question here of you, Garrett. Uh, what about Kane in the final minute of the game was so difficult for your team to figure out? It just seems like every last minute, Kane is just clawing their way back into a series and trying to take you guys out, forcing an overtime, nearly winning a game, uh, some zero-second opportunities. I mean, what changed in those last 60 seconds? I think, to be honest, a lot of it was just us, like, you know, getting into our heads, like, okay, it's the last 60 seconds, we just got to play through, and, you know, one thing just leads to another, you miss, I mean, in this game, it's so crazy, you miss a couple boost pads, and, you know, you're zero, and put yourself in a weird spot, and uh, 
just allow them to capitalize because for them that last minute they have to be going you know all out it's their do or die so you kind of have to prep for those moments i think and uh yeah they they were able to really claw back through a lot of that like you said but uh i don't know we just we had a hard time kind of holding it down in the last minute uh before we go uh happy birthday how are you spending oh. your evening uh i'm actually going to dinner right after this oh um, yeah what, what are you having uh i'm not too sure maybe like uh maybe like a steak something Ooh, like that not fancy nice yeah yeah it should, it should be good it should be good after the win well classy dinner classy on the field a class act all around it seems gareth thank you very much for joining us yeah thank you very much for doing this it was a really great uh show Oh, pleasure's all ours, mate. Take care. Have a great evening. Uh, Trippin, always nice to, to basically just check in with these players uh, more often than not. Such lovely dudes, and uh, what a great birthday for them as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a huge uh, a birthday present. And I mean, I'm not going to lie, steak dinner it sounds absolutely oh, awesome. Sounds great. Just, <laughs> just not on your birthday, just like any day in general. So I'm a little bit jealous there, Garrett. Uh, but, bro, like, that is not the only game that we have to worry about. We still have a whole nother matchup that is left still to go. I'm excited to see what Owen, you are all black, and Ben, you are going to have to offer here in just a few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. We're halfway through, effectively, but there's still the prime rib still to enjoy. So be sure to come back after the break uh, where we dig into second servings. Uh, it's right on the other side of this. When I come in, I don't really want to go outside. It looks like it's going to rain and the suit is new. So, oh, there's Doc Haskell. Hi, Doc. How are you? He, he brings a full notebook with him and, like, writes notes down. It was pretty insane. He had it yesterday. He's going to be coming through this metal detector right here. I don't know his name, though, but I recognize his hair. Jen. You're Jen? All right, we're going to interview Jen, who's supporting Kennesaw. I'm going to ask you like, a couple of very simple questions. Okay. Um, are we ready? All right, great. College. I really like Georgia College's uh, color scheme. It's just red, white, and blue, I think, but I think they did it in a really clever way. Mineral area wearing hoodies, even though it is 75 degrees outside here in Atlanta, Georgia. Absolute legends. If only Nick could hear you. Nick, come back. If he's over 100 feet away, he can't. And you were whispering something, and he started smiling. I'm like, are you whispering? Oh, yeah, because he's, he's got his headphone in if we're close enough. But... Bless you. Gesundheit. Gesundheit again. You're welcome. Right, I'm going to go find him. Oh, oh, there he is! Oh, my. Oh, okay, okay. Real real stuff is starting. Real stuff. Competitive integrity needs to be upheld. We got to get out of here. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to get in trouble. I'm really, I, I get really embarrassed when I get yelled at. 30 is Okay. Wow, it's not 1030 yet. It's only like barely <laughs> Woo! <laughs> All right, it's gonna be it's gonna be a long. Hey, what's up? Surprise interview. Join me over here, though, so we have a cool backdrop. What are we here for? Rocket League. Awesome. I'm not gonna ask what school you go to because unless you swapped hoodies, that seems pretty clear. No, nope. you know I got I got my jersey on with my name on it. Oh, you do. We show us your jersey. Look at John T. Turbo here. Yeah, exactly. That's not his name. I just keep calling him that. Yeah. His name is John, but it, my it, name is John Turbesi. Yeah, that's not John T. Turbo. Yeah, I get the message that I'm going to Nebraska where I met you. Oh, that's so crazy. <laughs> so context, if we're probably never gonna use this, but I want to talk about it. Turbo and I met at a LAN like over a year ago. That's so not crazy. Over. What is going on, everybody? And welcome back to the Collegiate Esports Commissioner's Cup. I am Septilence, joined by a man I have interviewed probably well over 10 times. It's going to be my good friend Neb here from Bay State Overwatch team. Neb looked at me and before he started his last series and he said, we are not dropping a map for the rest of the day. And so far, he has lived up to that title. But Neb, is there anybody you're thinking, we've got to get them out of the way. We've got to take them down. Uh, no. No? Just looking at it, each fights its own, every game. Going into it, just taking it as it comes? Uh, I have the confidence right now that we're not going to drop a single map. I, I love Neb because he, not only is he confident, but he's correct. Bay State is one of the best Overwatch teams I've ever seen. So it's it's always good to hear from I love the confidence, and I love Bay State, so I hope they do a great job this weekend. So what qualifier? Did you win a qualifier to get here? At large bid. We're looking at Rocket League. We're thinking high odds, low odds. What do, where do we think we're walking away? I think I think pretty high. I think we're, uh, we're doing pretty good. Is there anybody that you're looking at, you're like, please do not let us go up against them unless we absolutely have to? I mean, really, everybody's good competition. So. And sorry, what was your name? Ethan. Ethan, Ethan from Mineral Area. Yep. Very exciting. Well, Ethan, good luck. Thank you. We'll see you soon. What kind of pass? A player pass? Let me get your lanyard. No, you actually have to like tape it to your chest, like really awkwardly with masking tape. Okay. And it's gonna fall off. Yeah. Okay. It's, gonna, it's gonna be uncomfortable, I promise. That's a guarantee. Okay, cut that. I'm gonna sneeze. Okay, great. I'm great. Everything's good. Who do we interview? Who should we interview? I don't know. I'm just here. I need caffeine. Again, that, that's why we're here, right? This is why every, a lot of people are trying to figure out, you know, how do we replicate what you guys are doing? How do we, you know, how do they do what you guys are doing to a degree? Or 
why are you guys doing what you're doing to a degree but you know to kind of i think focus in then a little bit more i i want to talk about gameplay a little bit before we jump into to business and, and all of the other stuff you know jensen this one this one's for you right i want to talk a little bit about this because to to someone like me who's you know who's traditionally a league of legends fan and all that i know that you've been a coach that's been you know all over the world you've worked with a lot of different professional teams and different regions um my my question i i i i really want i think a lot of people want to know how did you end up at maryville and, and why north like a north american collegiate college what was the draw or what what brought you here how did you get to this point um when i first came to na i worked with the models uh with the academy team and i realized that there's a lot of culture challenges that exist in that's very unique to any and esports right but it's a very interesting intersection uh because in unlike traditional sports in esports uh, players they don't start training with under a structure or, or a system or a coach uh, from a very early age, which is what which is what happens if you want to pick up any other sport, right? Like you start going to community events or whatsoever, and then you start developing your skills and your literacy of the game from the from the age of six or seven, and you're very used to working in a team environment, a coaching environment. But in esports and for League of Legends, a lot of times uh, players they go through a they they go up, they climb the ranks in solo queue where everything is basically self taught, and then all of a sudden they need to be placed into a team environment. And I realized that this is something that the Asian teams got right, where they had this these B teams, this, they have the B houses in Korea and Taiwan. Um, you would spend almost close to a year just being a understudy or training partner for the team before you even join an academy team in the first place. And uh, in China, they have like these massive uh, B-team systems with like lots of players in them. The moment you hit a certain rank on the ladder, they fly you in. Uh, you are then boot camping for a month there at the facility. And depending on how well you do, uh, they then decide whether to regain you on as a training uh, partner or as a trainee in whatever capacity, given how well you perform in those scenarios. So. Um, the West was very lacking in all of this, and culturally, to do the same things and try to replicate the B-house environment or what they're doing in China or Taiwan would not be possible to do. Uh, but the West has a very successful model of developing sports and talent, especially in America, when that, that is in the collegiate space. So I looked at this, I saw the resources that was available, and uh, when then uh, when Clarity pitched its vision to me, it's like, yeah, this is, this is what I think should be the future for development in the NA ecosystem for esports. Right on. I think, well, maybe maybe let's follow up on that a little bit then. Because Dan, okay, so Dan, you you know, you pick up Jensen, you, you've got this going. Um, I think that's going to be my, my question then is, or to any other schools that want to be competitive like you guys on that level, is this something that we should be expecting to see in the future, right? Is this now, you know, the, the standard that, that you guys, you know, Jensen, you and Dan, do you guys feel that this, if, if every college of, across the nation is starts doing this, if they start you know, recruiting coaches like Jensen and, and trying to build this atmosphere. Is this going to be the, the next standard or is this something that's very successful that well, obviously it's proven to work, but is it sustainable? Is it possible for everyone or maybe not everyone, but right, the, the greater sense of the industry and the ecosystem? How do you guys feel about that? Uh, it's a it's a dream of mine, obviously, to get to a point in the future where uh, every university has an esports team that's taken seriously and uh, every day they report to practice, it's an improvement-driven mindset across the whole program. Um, I think for me, though, like, the reason isn't necessarily, like, to see, like, a March Madness with millions of dollars flowing through it. For me, it's a little bit more simpler than that. The reason why this is my vision is just because uh, it's best for player development and just players in general. Um, what we see in the in Tier 2 ecosystems almost across the industry uh that's like below academy, I would say, like right before you, I, I would almost, con I would consider academy professional uh, because you're, you're making a salary, higher salary than exists in a lot of semi-pro sports, actually. Uh, but in the tier two ecosystem, you kind of go from like your parents' bedroom making no money on a Discord server with a coach that hasn't been certified by any national body uh, to playing academy. And, and that's horrifying to me. So uh, while I don't see collegiate as being, or maybe, maybe it does end up being this way, but but it doesn't have to be the definitive pass to pro. I want it to at least be an option, like a parallel option, similar to how you can go through the Canadian hockey system where you can choose to spend a couple extra years developing and maturing physically and emotionally in, in the NCAA model before you go to the show in the NHL. Uh, I'd like to see that 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 reality in, 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 in esports. This isn't something where 
there's hundred there's 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 a century of, of history to to the competition so um it's a it's a very powerful tool especially when you're trying to convince your parents that this is a worthwhile pursuit that you can get a college degree um and it's one of those things where um at least in america w with how with how expensive college is uh getting scholarships uh after your first like after like your 18 to 20 year old years is usually harder academically uh, you usually get the majority of your scholarships going into school when you're when you're an 18 year old freshman and the way that the current path to pro is set up a lot of players are foregoing that 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 span of time to try to go pro for no pay and so um for me it's it's more about uh like a health of a pipeline health of the ecosystem health, health of of uh kind of the player experience of of, of pursuing this um, and, and, and that's the big thing for me. And obvious, obvious, it's a dream. Um, I want Mary able to serve as like a case study and a model for that. Uh, we want to show results. We want to eventually be competing to win proving grounds, um, to, uh, show that this can be a functional, uh, alternative to the, to the traditional tier two within esports, And that's what, that's what we strive for every year. I can add to that a little bit just from a business perspective. I think, you know, we're very fortunate to have Jensen and Dan here at Maryville, but I think if you're a university looking at, you know, just adding a coach, you know, maybe not to the magnitude of Jensen, but I think you have to look at the metrics. I think if you look at what the ROI and the business case of adding relevant esports within your university, uh, what that means to your um, student life and all those different things, all those things that they try to check boxes within higher ed. I think having a relevant esports program or a relevant system within esports, um, every university should be looking at it because their baseball players and their basketball players and football players are all playing gaming. And a lot of these esports, you know, figureheads and coaches, et cetera, um, you know, are the relevant people in digital media. And it, it helps the school with a brand perspective and I think just having any sort of relevant and adding bodies within the esports ecosystem at universities, you have two or three basketball coaches, you have two or three soccer coaches, you know, both on male and female. I think having relevancy within esports, it has probably a 15 to 25 X, you know, return versus like traditional sports. And I can say that with my background and everything like that, and just knowing how we look at it. But at the same time, if you're not looking at esports as a relevant, you know, not even revenue stream, but relevant digital eyeball within your sports and student life perspective, I think you are sort of behind the times. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Collegiate Esport Commissioner's Cup. I am Seth Lentz, and I get a really neat opportunity here. We get to interview Burns from EU United. Burns, how you doing? I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm doing great. We're on day two of the event. It's been a fantastic one. I ran into you yesterday, but yeah. we were running around like chickens with our heads off, and it has been, I mean, how, how has your time been here? What has this event kind of been like? Yeah, it's great. I just love being in the passion pit, seeing all the college kids go at it. Uh, reminds me of like an old school MLG event almost, but being like in the epicenter of the passion yes. pit, seeing Rocket League, Valorant, Overwatch, and Smash, just, it's amazing to see all of these schools compete against each other and get a shot to play on this main stage. Yeah, no doubt about it. And tell us a little bit about kind of what is what is E-United, right? Because we know that yeah, sure. you're here, we know you're here to represent them, but for the people that don't know, what, what is E-United? Yeah, E-United was founded in 2016. We're a professional esports organization. Uh, we've been in League of Legends, Overwatch, all the way to uh, Battle Ride, I think it was called back in the day. Uh, right <laughs> Right now in uh, 2022, we are in Gears of War, Halo, Rocket League, PUBG, wow. and announcing a new title tomorrow. Uh, I know, get, get the small intel here. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I went pro in Call of Duty when I was younger. I ended up playing my last event under E United, switched in 2016, and I've been wow. uh, the GM ever since. So it's, uh, it's a true blessing to be able to stay with an organization for as long as I have. And uh, we love giving back to the collegiate community. Uh, I actually graduated from Full Sail in 2013. I was a little confused yeah. about the jersey. I was yeah. a little. <laughs> yeah, so the Full Sail boys are out of the tournament, unfortunately, but I decided I would rep them today I in their it. honor. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just great. I, I love working with younger individuals who are trying to find their path in esports, and yeah. these college kids are really showing what they're all about. Yeah, so to be kind of an ex pro player, where a collegiate scene at the time didn't exist, especially not to the scale yeah. right now, what is it like to see? 
such high levels of success, such high levels of support for something that you weren't able to kind of get as much support in at the time, something that was looked down on a lot more. Yeah, I'm uh, extremely jealous, that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Full Sail started their program in 2017. When I was there in 2011 and 12, it was just a bunch of nerds running around, just right. creating their own clubs. I was still striving to go pro, but now you have these opportunities to play right. on main stage, play in front of thousands of people. We just had locals back in the day. You would show up and play for like $200, $100. It was like lunch money. Right. Now these kids are playing for scholarships. They're playing for fame. They could pop off here and end up getting a sponsor for ten dollars or $20,000 from somebody. Right. So the opportunities are just endless at the moment, and I think it's just great that, uh, you know, you basically can prove yourself and make anything happen right now. It's instead of kind of what you had gone through being in college and also trying to go pro yeah. these kids can try to go pro while being 100%. in college it's hand in hand instead yeah. of those two kind of battling kind of matchups so if, if somebody's trying to go pro right they're like burns i want to be you one day i want to be the gm of united one day what is that first step to really take it from a hobby to to a passion to a job yeah i think i've told this story a lot but it's really, I thought about going pro every night before I went to bed. Right. Like, I lived and breathed Call of Duty for years. It was my life. I skipped, I had to skip dinner sometimes. I had to skip family functions. And my family didn't really understand, but it was what I wanted to do. And it all worked out. But uh, at the end of the day, you always need to kind of be organized. You have to have the ability to not put all of your eggs in one basket. So even though it worked out for me, there are so many opportunities right. in esports. There's being a caster or interviewing <laughs> people. There's be working in production. There's helping people get waters. Like literally, there are so many opportunities. So, um, oh, this crowd's awesome. They're going right crazy, now. dude. <laughs> that, Regar they stayed on their last life right uh, now. Off subject, Smash, regardless if it's middle school, high school, college, it pops Five, off it all pops. the time. I love it. Well, Burns, so. thank you so no, much, yeah, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no it. worries. Thank you, guys. Maybe we'll have another. Professor Layton's still here bringing you all the pretty pictures. I'm still Relic. Uh, he is still Trippin. Uh, and break down this match uh, that we are about to witness, Trippin. A tale of two Marists, one could say. Yeah, uh, a very interesting situation happened last week where ONURL Black played the Marist B team and Bendu Esports played the Marist a team now what might happen Crazy. in them well one of those teams won and one of those teams lost ONU ends up winning versus marist b then you falls to marist a to make things even more interesting both of those series were in fact for two so mm -hmm. we have a very interesting tale between these two and again similar to uh the information that we got in the in the last series uh, it's going to be a little bit of a toss-up. It's going to be very interesting to see what these teams are able to do to kind of overcome uh, what happened last week with ONU, you know, dropping those two games. Obviously, you'd like to beat that to uh, go a little bit better for you if you can. And Ben, you just trying to recover from a series of loss. Yeah, I think it's a little too early in the season to determine what exactly all of that means. Mm -hmm. How much better is Maris Day in comparison to Maris B? Is that even the case? Is Maris be the better team? True. We, we, we don't really know, and we don't know many of these ranks, which is kind of half the fun of taking part in these collegiate scenes where there's about a bajillion teams to try yeah. and keep your eyes on. And you might know some of the more popular ones, uh, not to say that these schools are, of course, not popular. They are very popular in our own hearts. But you know what I'm saying? Like, in terms of just, like, I guess, statewide value right you know value for oh yeah i know that team well we don't know a lot of these teams we don't know how these guys are, are going to get on but i know for sure there's going to be a very exciting series because professor layton is here it's the layton it's the layton conundrum if he turns up on a broadcast in production uh and and is bringing you all of what you see on screen now it's gonna go to game number seven i guess the only question that we need answer in the next i guess 35 45 minutes tripping is which way is it gonna go yeah, which way is it going to go for sure? We already saw a gentleman sweep, and there is a missile on target immediately from the lean. That one does end up being saved, but what a very 
very Whoa. aggressive start here for Ohio Northern. They put another one on target, but that one is denied by the crossbar. Now Benedictine will go the other way. It'll come off the ceiling and down. Cleared away back out to midfield. And right away, Relic, we are seeing what I would consider a drastic change in pace from our first series. And oh! our first goal. Oh, it will go in. A little, little awkward, but it went in. Bit of help from Benedictine defense as well. Firm. It's a 50. That's going towards the net. That is off the post. Uh, but unfortunately, the last defender there runs in thinking that it's not going to go off the post. No faith in one's own woodwork, by the way. And ultimately, Ohio North, that early perseverance pays off. They get the 1-0 lead. Are they going to double it up? Well, they probably should have wide and not at all handsome. This one old dribble down. We picked up at midfield, Mac Daddy. Gonna get 50 off the backboard, coming down in front. Jenny just waiting for that one. There's the cross out to midfield. The perfect nice. passing play. Denied on the goal line here by Lean. Here comes Cathedral. They'll play this one off the back wall with 16 boosts, and that one is cleared away by Firm. Just outside of the first minute here, like game number one of this series. Up goes McDaddy, and he's home, not with the milk just yet. Off the backboard they go once again. And finally, Ohio Northern able to clear the lines, but Benedictine looking good, but that's a very loosey-goosey defense out to the midfield. Back in it goes to a dangerous position, but Ohio Northern preserving that boost, looking to recoup their losses. Now forward for another attack, double commit from the Benedictine defense. 1-0 still the scoreline as Ohio Northern press. Here they come. Big demo at midfield. The ball is just going to float the other way. Ohio Northern is right there. It'll be denied, and Jenny will chase it with a whopping four boots. He'll get the wave dash. They'll get the demo. How much will that matter? Some front post defense here from Benedictine. Rotating back is Mac Daddy as the ball is cleared out to midfield. That shot wide of the target and denied as well. Benedictine will look for a little bit of control of their own. They haven't really had too many opportunities. They'll pass this one towards the backboard, and Firm will play it all the way up into the air. They'll drop it back down. Can't Can make the touch. Cathedral to lean back to STN or Stan or Steen. I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. I've been confused before, Relic, on what some of these players' names might be. What I'm not confused about is those inverted chroma wheels. Love them. And love the car design overall. Got the shades on. Perhaps obscured the vision of himself. Not Jenny with a big save. Big clearance from Jenny once again. As that goes all the way back to firm. Helps it on towards the backboard. Lean backboard once again. Shadow strike. Clinical 2-0. This is a very solid goal here on the infield passing play as Firm gets some control, dishes it to Lean, who finds STN at midfield. And the worm burner shot keeps it nice and low on the ground, gets it in, and twos most of the way across the scoreboard. 2.22 to go, a 2-0 lead for Ohio Northern. Now it's on Benedictine to get themselves off the schneid to get a couple goals going, and they do it here starting from their own box. Yeah, 2,222 donuts sounds pretty great. Unless it's this very specific scenario where you find yourself in a Rocket League game, it's not what you want to see. Benedictine, they've had their opportunities, but there's another close, and there's another on. 3-0, not lean at all. It's a very gluttonous scoreline it's turning into. There's the dish from Firm, and right in front for lean, a relatively easy goal, and Benedictine honestly just caught out and completely outsped by this Ohio Northern squad so far. And a 3-0 lead that they are fighting with. Benedictine will win the kickoff. Firm will go back on defense. Uh -oh. Touch in front of the box and an opportunity for Jenny's denied by STN. There's a demo in the net as well. Nice. That will leave it completely open and Matt Daddy will score the first goal for Benedictine. Yeah, so it's not the first attack that's the problem, it's the second, because there's a demo on the way out. Lean's already moved out to get boost. In steps McDaddy, he's da 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 not sponsored by them, but he is certainly loving it. And that is at least a two-point lead now for Ohio North and Northern. They've been able to bring them back within that. One minute 50. If they can keep this up, then there's certainly a tiebreaker to be found. Roby Cathedral looking to get that tiebreaker at least a little bit closer to them with their first, or sorry, their second goal. Nice. They won't find it there. This one is a little bit off target. But Benedictine at least building a little bit of pressure here for really the first time all game. The last goal that they had was really just one touch and one goal. This has been more of a sustained pressure, and it pays off as Mac Daddy will find the second goal. Let's see if I can find many more food puns. Uh, oh my goodness, he's a he's he's an eggs Benedictine poacher. Hey, that, that, that's that's my analysis. It was a really nice shot, three two. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. That, that's one way to say it. You know what? I was actually just talking about Eggs Benedict with someone the other day. Oh, very uh, nice. And, uh... Yeah, so now I'm just gonna think about that for the rest of my life, and Benedictine is gonna think about how much they need to get that third goal here in the last minute and ten seconds of this game. And they've got that sustained pressure again, again doing a very good job locking down Ohio oh, Northern man. into their own half. This was a backboard. There's a bump as well. Lean won't get it. An aggressive third play. STN will clear this one out down the right hand side. Firm gonna look at an open net. It's gonna be Lean who ends up scoring the goal and extending the lead back to two. Who screams in here? Was that McDaddy? No, it's cathe Cathedral. Cathedral. You sold yourself far too short. Far too short. A dollar. Come on. You're running into the challenge. If you win it, sure. You're the only one that can have a follow-up shot. If you miss, well, that happens. And you find Ohio Northern going not just two points up, but a further three points up because the kickoff completely devolves into yet another defensive mishap. Benedictine yeah. architects of their own downfall. Yeah, and that's a hat trick goal as well for Lean. So congrats to them and take your hats off, ladies and gents, as that'll be a third goal for them in Ohio Northern, extending this lead up to three goals on their kickoff play. Looking for another one to add off of a kickoff play, but this time Benedictine is able to shut it down. They'll double commit offensively down that right-hand side. Eventually, we'll be able to regain a bit of possession here. Jenny just waiting this Ooh. one out, trying Ooh. to get a shot on target, and the solo play from Jenny. We got Benedictine within two. Are they red Jenny because they are something of a hero to the poor, or are they red Jenny because there's some red mist in there? Well, it might have been a combination of the two, certainly helping out a squad that's pretty porous in defense. Uh, maybe just a little bit angry that they have conceded so many. Some individual brilliance. And oh my word, Cathedral makes up for their error earlier on. One goal game, 30 seconds left. Which way is it going to flop next? Uh, Ohio Northern making what I consider one of the cardinal sins of Rocket League. When you are on kickoff and the last one back, you go for that corner boost. The ideal scenario, especially this late in the game, that you are winning turn back to your own net and make sure you're in a good position to play defense they don't do it there they get scored on they regain possession on this kickoff jenny will take it away and benedictine is awfully close to getting something to happen here goes jenny on the attack and that one they won't be able to put home oh the no the follow-up shot is going to be off and away and a huge missed opportunity relic that was it that was it they did they had two bites of the cherry and somehow managed to miss both Still another chance here. Lean force a bit off the backboard. Hits the floor before a player can get there. O-N-U. Uh, <laughs> O-M-G. Uh, that was a very, <laughs> very lucky getaway. And Benedictine showing that when they do flex their muscles, dangerous team to deal with. Watch out for them. Spicy in game number two, potentially. Yeah, I, I feel like we're just watching what we saw in that first series all over right? again here, which yeah. is that final minute of the game is like the only minute that needs to be played. Like, we may as well forget about the other four minutes of the game. Just play that last minute like your life depends on it, and then we'll see what happens in the series after that, because that's when Benedictine really turned it up. They got a solid goal. They got a kickoff goal right after it, and then they had that final opportunity for Jenny, narrowly missing a game-tying goal with about 15 seconds left on the clock which is unfortunate for them but that's a big momentum builder right going into this mm. game number two versus the onu squad is now you know that you can get those goals in just got to get them in a little bit sooner it's a strange thing to say given uh how many mistakes benedictine made but i feel that they're the better team at least on the basis of game number one i think that their overall passing plays and their directness towards net uh was a, a strategy that paid off time and time again uh but Mistakes in defense, obviously costing them a lot of goals against them. And then when it when when the time to clutch up arrived, uh, the, the clutch was not there to be found. Someone had ripped it out and thrown it out the car window. So Benedictine, there's not too much to be too worried about going into game number two. As long as they recognize the necessity to shore up the defenses a little bit. It doesn't matter if you score five, if the opposition scores six. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. I mean, the key to winning a game, of course, is scoring more goals than the opposition. And Benedictine will look to do that here in game number two of the series. The ball just it gets a little bit too out past a couple different nice. times there. And that time, the infield pass will go right to Jenny. The highlight reel continues for them as they will get Benedictine their first lead. It's such a cute pass off to Jenny as well from McDaddy. People are thinking that they're going to go hard into the middle. It wasn't a great clearance in the first place, uh, but really nice, subtle handoff effectively. Sets up Jenny perfectly, rip it into the into the net, and you should find yourself with a goal. That's exactly what's happened 1-0. This one now with 
4.15 on the clock. Ohio Northern now pressing forward, and there's a big beat. It's Cathedral versus two different defenders from Ohio Northern, and they will win that one big time all the way to the back wall. A nice pass from Lean looking for a teammate. It is denied. Cleared from the box by Cathedral. Going up the wall, looking for an infield pass, not going to find it. A bit of a lifty, lifty there, and the ball will leak out. Now Benedictine will have an opportunity to come back on the attack if they're able to win this 50 with lean. That's exactly what they do, but eventually Firm will get the save. Now, my problem with Ohio Northern early doors is that they're almost showing a bit too much respect to Benedictine. Rather than predicting those potential mistakes, they're trying to predict that they will eventually score them. Looks like they got the memo as I was speaking about it straight onto their backs. It's the woodwork. Unlucky. Great follow-up shot. McDaddy with the feels bad. Backflip. Tie game. Yeah, you know, sometimes it feels like we're just talking to the players in real time. and like telling them, <laughs> hey, just do this one thing. And then, you know. They all listen to the broadcast. Go. Yeah, I know. And they should, too. It's a darn good broadcast, if I do say so myself. That's very true. Yes. A pretty, pretty solid series. The first one that we had. And the second series off to a great start as well. Ohio Northern up 1-0 at the moment in the series. Tie a ball game, though, between the two. Great shot here by Cathedral. We turned away by SDN right in front of the net. Lean looking for that SDN connection. Finds it. Sniped wide and a double miss from Benedictine. The third's finally going to come through for them. Return to sender from STN. Up high to be chased down by Firm. Daddy on the scene underneath Firm. Finds the backboard lying in wait. Lean Cathedral on the floor. Takes it back up into the air. Got some boost to use. Hits that backboard nicely. Where's the follow-up? The answer's nowhere. A little bit too cautious, Benedictine, as Ohio Northern on the return track. Yeah, that's kind of a play I expect to see, like, in an overtime, uh, where that great pass happens, and then no one ends up going for the shot. I think Benedictine had an opportunity to be a little bit more aggressive there offensively, and unfortunately for them, they do not find it. This one is going to be lean on target, but Jenny will clear it away. And I think, bro, like, the longer that I watch this Benedictine squad, I'm kind of in the same boat as you, where I do think that they might be the more talented, Ooh. more mechanical team. But they just got to shore that up into a little bit of cohesion on both sides of the ball. If they're able to do that, surely this is going to be a game that will go in their favor. Yeah, because Ohio Northern was centimeters away just 30 seconds ago from taking the lead once again in a game firm that's straight back towards net that's not a great starting position but well read off the backboard that's a free net going sideways stn this communication in the back once again mcdaddy demoed and ohio capitalized beforehand that's a nice pass in field enough from cathedral shot again wide and there's so many warning signs you'd swear it's a hazardous area <laughs> a tripping hazard, if you will. <laughs> Got him. Got to use that one on broadcast. First time ever. Glad you were all here to see it. It's going to be a pass out to STN, who's going to find firm in the air. And that one will not go. We don't come in, try to clean that one up as well. That one won't go. But eventually, is. STN is going to get there. They'll send one home in Ohio Northern with a 2-1 lead. Sure is a tripping area because Benedictine stumbling over each other time after time after time again. And SCN's actually been quite quiet for the for the last couple of minutes in game number one, for the opening couple of minutes in game number two, after such a, a bombastic opening first minute from Ohio Northern. Nice to see him on the score sheet, and this is well deserved from Ohio Northern. That even more deserved. So what a pass, what a finish. Yeah, great job here by Ohio the Northern to just get this game back under control for themselves and not allow Benedictine to get too close. A perfect pass, an absolute pinpoint perfection of the placement of that shot to get that 3-1 lead. But it's not comfortable for Ohio Northern. We've already seen what Kane did in the last minute. Benedictine has done it in the last minute as well. And here they go with a minute 10 and a two-goal deficit. Peachy, uh, but not rosy for Ohio Northern. As SCN, another whiff off the wall. Clearance is a problem for both teams, actually. Lean able to find a gap in the storm to make its way out. Nice interjection once again. STN, lovely. Backboard, not so lovely. Should have been on target. We can forgive this one as there's 40 seconds left to play in game number two. And Ohio Northern just looking to lock this one down. A fourth goal and it's shortly over. And again... Just keep your hatchets down and ensure that Benedictine don't score themselves. It's as simple as that. Yeah, exactly. Just keep the ball away from them as long as you can. Lean kind of struggling with that one. It will come in front of the net, but Firm will end up getting the touch to collect and throw this one into the opposite corner, buying a little bit more time. All Ohio Northern has to do is just park the bus and wait. 
And eventually the kids will get out of school and you'll be able to get on with your merry day from the field trip here in game number two. Save in front of that here by Genity Stop Ohio Northern from getting another one though. Go in transition with five seconds left. It is not going to matter all that much. There's a redirect off the backboard on the ground. ONU take a confident second game victory. If Benedictine was a battery, they would have been sent in for servicing because that lifespan was far too short. Mm -hmm. Great first minute. And thereafter, not much to write home about. Uh, really, I mean, we talked about those warning shots. So many of them. So many of them uh, from the blue team. And they deserve those, those follow-up goals. They deserve the win. And it was, it was handsome in the end as well. Uh, I'm, I'm really worried about Benedictine for as much as they look good in patches, their overall consistency uh, is, is really shoddy. And especially once again in defense, too many goals let in. If you're not going to be scoring like you did there in, in game number one, the least you can do is try and keep a clean sheet and at least make your opponents work for it. Right, and from having an opportunity, you know, to play kind of in the land of inconsistency of Rocket League that is Champ 2, I think that what we're kind of seeing out of Benedictine is something where when you have three individually talented players, it can be sometimes very difficult to get them to work as a unit and to make the plays happen. And that's why you see those flashes of brilliance compared with those lapses. You see both of them from Benedictine because they do have the talented players. They do have the mechanics to do lots of great things they've had a couple great passes as well it's just about that consistency if they nail it down a little bit more it's a team to watch out for but for right now the thing to watch out for is ohio northern has a two to zero lead in the series i mean look if, if we look at the very top of collegiate rocket league right crl you get so many rlcs caliber players walking through those doors it doesn't guarantee success unless you have good synergy as a team you're not going to find series wins, maybe individual game wins, but not right. series wins. And I'm, I'm right on board with you. I think Benedictine playing as three individuals, not as a team. And when on paper, this is the team that should be winning. Ohio Northern, I guess, can consider themselves lucky, but also be proud of yourselves. You are looking like the better team. McDaddy all on their own. Again, doesn't find the finish. Ooh. There's another follow up. And then like, yeah, once again, you know, you've, you found two great plays. And there's no call to show for it. These are the moments where you simply have to score. Yeah, and not only that, but here's a pretty solid counterattack from Ohio Northern as they settle the ball down in the corner. And Jenny will be there for Benedictine, but they're going to get 50 by Firm. Lean trying to get out of the way, and they'll get an opportunity here to play this one. And I like this approach here from Ohio Northern, slowing the pace of play down, getting that control over the ball, forcing Benedictine to make solid defensive rotations and not give them the opportunity to show the mechanics that they have. 3.30 to go. We're still 0-0, but an infield pass to Lean. Maybe to some offense here for Ohio Northern. It'll end up being Jenny for Benedictine to get things started from the right side. I mean, hey, we shouldn't be too critical. What was the first thing that we were saying that you should do? Keep the clean sheet. Mm -hmm. Make your opponents work for it. And that, at the very least, is what Benedictine are doing. Ohio Northern maybe should be 1-0 up, but they're not. And that is what we have to walk away with as the analysis point. Benedictine looking to restart their attack here from the midfield line. Closed down. Here goes Firm. Trying to use the really nasty area between backboard and floor doesn't come off as Benedictine launching a counterattack of their own. That's on target, you know, and it's going to be the 1-0 lead that Benedictine was seeking. All right, that'll just float on into the net here. And it's a great read here by Mac Daddy just to get there in time and gets the best bounce they could ever have imagined off of the apron to let that one go into the net. Benedictine in the lead here. Now just has to find a way to pin Ohio Northern back. Do not let them get back into this game. It seems to be a team that when it rains, it pours. We saw in game number one, Ohio Northern was able to put three in pretty quickly. And a 1-0 lead is not going to hold up to a three-goal counterattack. Starting from the back once again. And straight into orange hands. With Daddy with the 180, but it's closed off. Firm, not able to read this one. Cathedral is able to follow up. STN. Not able to perform the same feat for his team. Ohio Northern misfiring and that not great. Jenny does so well to close it down. And Ohio Northern deal with it. They, they simply had to. Scrappy. A little bit all over the place. Both teams now. And that is going to benefit Benedictine massively. 
Yeah, it really is. Uh, the more opportunity is, again, that you give Benedictine to show off what they can do individually, the better that team is going to look. Ohio Northern starting to get into their face a little bit as they go for these clears, and now it's going to be Jenny in a one-on-one -on -one situation. They're going to win the 50. This one's floating in front of the net. Lean will get onto the backboard. Cathedral will read it. They'll drop it down, hoping that a teammate's going to get there for a shot. They'll back off here. Double commit by Ohio Northern, and now they're going around. Here we go. This one's settled down here for OSTN, and that one is going to go wide as well. 90 seconds left to go Benedictine still holding on to the lead slowing it down as well Benedictine I like that I like that a lot but there is a demo on Jenny a chance for Ohio Northern to make the power play sideways infield up SCN shoots scores tie game yeah there it is Ohio Northern just settle that one down again just waiting for the perfect moment to strike and it's a three-person passing play yet again where they get that one ready to go from the back wall. You find the person who's there to cross it in front of the net. The shooter comes in, scores the goal. Ohio Northern now ties it up with Benedictine. Benedictine with an immediate answer on the kickoff, but it's saved by Firm just in time. How will this one go? Eventually cleared by STN. Great play there from Ohio Northern defensively. 60 seconds left. Ohio Northern, another power play, another demo. They're changing things up on the fly, not in between games, but internally. Important point for Benedictine. It would be their first of the series. Important point for Ohio Northern. They'd be on to match point down the other side, looking for lean. McDaddy steps in the way, picks up the 100 boost, makes a nuisance of himself. Ball lost. Jenny pickpocketed. Defense in place. Demo on Jenny once again. Ohio Northern with the explosives out, looking to fully play disruption. Ball breaks away, but any time it does, it's straight back into Northern hands. Yeah, except for this one right here, goes right back to Benedine. And they will put one on target. It will not turn into a goal. And now STN will go the other way. Cathedral pumps it up into the air as we hit 10 seconds left to go in this matchup. It's a one-on-one -on -one opportunity. Firm slows it down, pops oh. it over one, gets it over a second. Oh. The air goes oh. all the way oh. heaven. Yes, oh. they will. Firm will send it home with seven seconds left to go. Best goal of the evening. You are going to see pop-up beats one. Aerial Pro S beats two. The assist from Lean. Beats number three, Ohio Northern take the lead, seven seconds left. Will they be able to hold on to get this victory? Has to get one out. Benedictine's last opportunity crossed out in front of the net. Lean is not going to be able to spike it. It'll leak back out to midfield. Boom the other way. The reception's wow. going to be there. And ONU is going to get a last-second thrilling win here in game number three. And as you said, really, they are on to match point. And they're looking to take this four-game sweep. How about them apples though? What a goal to go ahead. I mean, individual brilliance from Firm. Able to suss out the running paths of two defenders, uh, but that goal would never have happened without the communication and the strafing run across the goal to get at the very least a bump on the goalkeeper. From there on out, it's just about hitting the target. And when your ball is directly in front of you, that's the easiest shot you're going to make all day. So I'm so impressed with Ohio Northern coming from behind as well. 1-0 down to get back to 2-1. I mean, this could very well go the way of a sweep. Yeah, and there, I mean, if the best that Benedictine is going to have to offer is bringing this team to the brink and losing in the last nine seconds. I don't think there's going to be quite enough to get over the hump that ONU is putting up. It's not a team that's looking to me like they are going to have that option to reverse sweep. I could definitely see Benu mm. getting a game here, uh, making that move, putting themselves in solid position to take at least one victory away from ONU. But the, the unit, the play that we have seen from Ohio Northern has just been too much. It's been too strong. It's been too good at the moment. Benedictine has a lot on their plate to get a victory here. And you can definitely see it's it's two teams with two different sets of fortunes from week number one. You got yep. one team now 3-0 up. I mean, they won their first series in week number one. And you got the other team that lost their first series in week number one. And it looks like a, a team that's discordant, a team that's got plenty of potential. 
and arguably should be doing better in this series. They, for my money, should have one game, maybe two, but already first seconds of game number four, and they look most likely to go behind again. Yeah, a couple of As miracle saves. Yeah, a couple of miracle saves is really all that saved Benedictine from getting scored on uh, at about 452. Instead, they get scored on at 441 as the net is wide open, except for Ohio Northern players. The only person there just catching a Benedictine completely on their heels. The speed from Ohio Northern just too much right now. Kickoff one by Firm into Benedict hands. Benedictine hands, I should say. My apologies. Almost finds a double tap. Is going to find the Shadow Strike. Well, there is certainly a way to restore faith to your fans. 1-1. One, one, and we're back to square one. Yeah, and a great overall play here by Cathedral to just wait for someone to miss. Uh, this is something you're going to hear from coaches all across Rocket League. Just let your opponents do the work for you. Let them go for the ball and not hit it, and then just sit in a position where after they're done screwing up whatever play it is that they're going to do, capitalize on it. That's exactly what Benedictine do here. And then, of course, going the other way, Ohio Northern says, I am not satisfied with another time ball game. Let's score a second goal because we don't want to lose. We want to get this sweep done and over with. I, I feel for you, Benedictine fans. You get the ray of hope, and then it is just taken away it's almost like an eclipse every minute at this stage everything every ray of light the benedictine show uh, is well you know what they might still find a goal let's let's hold that thought shall we down and away from ohio northern double commit as well that's going to fall to jenny pops it up a two far wide and it's poor touch after poor pass after poor defensive rotation benedictine so much hypothetical potential but so many mistakes that said, no mistake there, bang on target, 2-2. Yeah, this is a perfectly executed play as Cathedral baits STN into the position they want them to be and flicks it up tall for Mac Daddy, who's just waiting for the ball to arrive. They don't even have to communicate the fact that that's where the ball was going. They're well aware of where that flick is going to end up, and they put a powerful shot into the net here for Benedictine, who now ties it up at two apiece, and Jenny will start it the other way. It's going to be a demo on lean all the way back to Cathedral. We'll see that offensive Benedictine start all over with Cathedral. It's been like trying to put together a Lego kit without the instructions. Well, it's time to get out the paper manual, kids, because you need to learn and you need to learn fast. Save away by firm, infield and outfield. Jenny, the challenge that's up, set up beautifully for Mac Daddy. Got boost to use as well. Miss controls, but that's almost on target and away by firm. Very hairy moment for Ohio Northern. Get away with it. Oh, and they're gonna go oh my word, no defense way. Defense and firm is just too strong. Just sitting in the middle of the field, waiting for this one to happen as they chase it down. And Lean gets ahead of him, and Jenny's touch. It didn't matter, matter where Jenny touched that one. Firm was scoring that one all day. I, I can't be too harsh on Benedictine on that one. That's no. The ball has a mind of its own sometimes, uh, and, and physics has determined yonder in this particular scenario a real shame there this might also be a real shame tickles the crossbar out and away they need as i say to get things together benedictine looking better in game number three and game number four sorry but needs to be even better still close angle and wide and away Ohio Northern clear their lines yet again. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that can be an absolute momentum killer for a team when you get that look and do not end up converting on a great fake here by Cathedral. But the shot coming in from that daddy is saved by Firm, and now it's going to be an early challenge here from Jenny. Just to do anything in their power to get that ball away from the Ohio Northern squad. None of it is going to work. Cathedral reading this one off the ceiling. That shot is wide of the target. Lean's going to be there, but now the net is free, and it's cleared out anyway, and Ohio Northern stands tall on D. I like the idea of long range shots. I think all too often in the current major of Rocket League, everyone's expecting the flip reset. Everyone's expecting the follow and nobody's expecting the hard shot with accuracy. Benedictine, I don't mind that one bit. However, score remains the same, 3-2. Two. two minutes left on the clock. It ticks by now. STN away. And is there a counter attack in Benedictine now? They follow this up, a miss. Infield, lean. And away into Orange Hands once again. A lovely follow-up. That's on target. That's on net. And that's 
in the net. 4-2, Benedictine falling apart again. Yeah, it's, it's an awfully close save here as well. I mean, Cathedral doing everything in their power to get back, oh. and they're just stuck with zero booze. They don't have the ability to go grab that corner to have anything in the tank to try to get them in front of that ball any faster. And unfortunately, the pre-flip is not enough. Benedictine will win the kickoff and try to get themselves back within one underneath two minutes left to play. There's the demo. There's the infield pass. It's read out perfectly by STN. And that one, I mean, honestly, quite a bit telegraphed. It's pretty easy to read for Ohio Northern as we hit the last 90. Yeah, you could tell that they're all just thinking a little bit too much, Benedictine, and it showed there in Cathedral's uh, choreography, really. Rather than front flipping and prioritizing getting to the danger zone first and potentially getting it off the woodwork, maybe risking an own goal, prioritized position doesn't work that way you need to get to the ball first rather than getting behind the ball first there is no luxury here and there is no luxury in a three goal deficit lovely placement from stn jenny prevented goomba stomped and that is a 5-2 scoreline now 1-1-1 one, one, one on the clock and that might be all she wrote for the benedictine it's un real unfortunate there for Jenny as well. It just, I mean, one versus everything. Uh, not a whole lot of opportunities there to really make any good plays. Saved the initial shot. Uh, got very close to making another one as well, but unfortunately the bump just kind of took him out of it. Ohio Northern awfully feeling very comfortable right now. It's a bit of a triple commit. It'll go around the other way in front. It's going to be firm on the Ooh. pass. It's going to be STN with the shot and the goal. They extend the lead now to four. Yeah, the ground has given way and the snow is on its way. Avalanche 6-2 and Ohio Northern. If I had a hat, I would doff it to you. An excellent performance all round, even in the face of adversity. Just a team that never says die. And that will bode very well as the league season continues on tripping. But Benedictine, I think the only reason that we'd be so harsh on them is because we see the potential there. This is a team that can definitely do better. This is a team that will get better as the season progresses. Maybe just a little too early in the season uh, for the glue to stick. Well, that's the thing. We're very early in the season. This is only the second week. So there is oh, yeah. plenty of time by all means to get back into this one for Benedictine. And again, like we said in that first series, Lots of learning opportunities for the squad as well. We, we can see exactly where this team is going. We see those flashes of brilliance. We know that this is going to be a team probably down the stretch to watch out for. An unfortunate here performance from them as they will clear this one out. It'll hit the ground and ONU will complete the sweep over Benedictine and move up to 2-0 and o in this young season. Complete. Complete performance. Uh, and most importantly, the latent prophecy has been dismissed. No more Game 7s. You can go to bed safe in the knowledge that you have just watched the complete opposite of a best of seven going the distance. Uh, and for, I think, let's let's maybe look on the positive side with Benedictine. Uh, inconsistent, yes, but lots of really promising moments. And there's no doubt that all three of these players, on their own, very talented uh, some roster moves in RLCS don't work because the team just doesn't gel. Mm -hmm. These guys are stuck with each other for a full season. Uh, either it doesn't work for the entire season or they learn how to make it work. How do they make it work, Trippin? I mean, honestly, I think just slowing down just, just a tiny, tiny bit. I, I think that when you have very mechanical, very skilled players, uh, the tendency, I think, at this skill level is to maybe try to go a little bit too quickly. Uh, yeah. And sometimes when you go for some of these faster plays, the rest of the team isn't ready to move with you or they will all move up at the same time because they all see the same thing and all think the same thing. And when that happens, that's when you end up in those awkward situations. That's where those counterattacks are going to come in and absolutely crush you. And like we saw a great play from Firm, from ONU, they stopped up at midfield, popped it over one, air dribbled it over two more. That's the kind of play that Benedictine can absolutely pull off if they're able to slow down just a tad. Well, Ohio Northern are cooling off. Hopefully we're going to grab one of their players uh, or indeed the coach to interview uh, as we slow down on this broadcast as well. Being a, a hectic day of action, two different sides of the Rocket League coin, a best of seven going the distance, a sweep. We'll be talking to someone from Ohio Northern after this.
right away, Relic, we are seeing what I would consider a drastic change in pace from our first series. And oh, our first oh, it will go in. The vision of himself, not Jenny, with a big save. Big clearance from Jenny once again as that goes all the way back to Firm. Helps it on towards the backboard. Lean backboard once again. Shadow Strike. Clinical 2 0. The last goal that they had really just one touch and one goal. This has been more of a Ooh. sustained pressure. Backboard. And there's a bump as well. Lean won't get it. An aggressive third play. STN will clear this one out down the right hand side. Firm going to look at an open net. It's going to be Lean who ends up scoring the goal. Side eventually will be able to regain a bit of possession here. Jenny just waiting this Ooh. one out, trying Ooh. to get a shot on target, and the solo play from Jenny. Pretty porous in defense, and uh, maybe just a little bit angry that they have conceded so many. Some individual brilliance, and oh my word, Cathedral makes up for their error. Number two of the series. The ball just it gets a little bit uh, too out past a couple different nice. times there, and that time the infield pass will go right to Jenny. The highlight reel continues. Too much respect to Benedictine. Rather than predicting those potential mistakes, they're trying to predict that they will eventually score them. Looks like <laughs> a tripping hazard, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Got to use that one on broadcast. First time ever. Glad you were all here to see it. It's going to be a pass out to STN, who's going to find firm in the air. And that one will not go. We don't come in, try to clean that one up as well. That one won't go. But eventually, is. STN is going to into Benedict hands. Benedictine hands, I should say. My apologies. Almost finds a double tap. Is going to find the shadow strike. Well, there is certainly a way to a position where after they're done screwing up whatever play it is that they're going to do, capitalize on it. That's exactly what Benedictine do here. And then, of course, going the other way, Ohio Northern says I Offensive am rotation. Benedictine, so much hypothetical potential, but so many mistakes. That said, no mistake there. Bang on target. Way to by firm. Very hairy moment for Ohio Northern. Get away with it. Oh my word, no Defense way. and firm is just too strong. Hey guys, KTAD here, and welcome back to another ECAC Top Plays of the Week video. Now, normally I know we like to switch the hosts out every week, and you know I know there's a roster that we want to bring up to you guys, and don't worry, we've got that coming with some returning faces from last season, as well as hopefully some new ones this time out, but... Again, you guys got me for one more week. It'll be okay. I'll see you guys at the end anyways. Now, in any case, as per the usual, we've got a bunch of incredible collegiate esports action coming at you with some of the coverage brought to you in partnership by Esports U. So, huge shout out to them. But, you know, I know you guys don't want to hear me talk about it anymore. It's okay. Let's just jump straight into the action. Here you go. Starting us off this week, we've got Gorilla as he power slams the ball into the net. At number seven, it's a play of the game from Shiz that has him jumping fearlessly into the enemy team to secure the second map for Savannah so College. So rare to see these, especially in a map like this one, where there's a lot of potential opportunities, but that means willing to make a complete change if necessary, and we didn't really see that for the start of the game. Shh. We've got to be a bit sneaky here as Matthew's got the huge flank to get the 3k and secure the round. That's a massive frag. They know Jet is heaven. Smokes are going to come down. Bomb is down in that corner of heaven. And now Nova's in a very tricky situation. She's going to all out. She doesn't have a, gr a great amount of visibility as she plays back now. Oh, Matthew with a 3k. That game, that round itself was on the brink of defeat for LC. Don't get turned around here as his Spaniard pulls the will over Michael's eyes to send him right off the stage. Oh, no, this is a very dangerous opportunity here. Let's yeah, see. He's, he's looking for the guard. A beautiful side smash. And I mean, no, oh. what a beautiful look. What a, what a beautiful reflector. Stopping the recovery from being able to come back on, forcing this into one sock. And we've seen what he's been. In our top half, it's Mr. Nene as he whips and does the dance with three different members of LIU to clutch up the round. He's the last alive, granted. He's got a Vandal. He makes the trade. Now a one-on-one. -on -one. Can he find it? Doesn't have the intel. If he's if he does heaven, he might understand that he's hell. 
First Shock Dart will come out. He knows he's there now. First Shock's still doesn't have all the intel he looks to peek he gets the kill it. third kill mr nene gonna close out that round four lc and welcome back here to esports u2 relic and tripping uh we've just watched uh, a very firm victory from ohio northern uh a 4-0 sweep as firm as it could get really in our oh, segue we got ourselves firm, part of that wonderful trio that led it all the way. Trip, and I'll let you kick off the question. Yeah, welcome, firm. I see you in the esports center there at O M U. Yep. Congrats to you and the team. And the first thing I gotta I gotta talk about is that air dribble play from yourself. Pop it over a couple of teammates. What's going through there? Like, how do you have that awareness to just slow that play down and just beat literally everyone? Uh, well, actually, in the comms, I saw that I, I had the opportunity for the solo. So I called him. I said, I'm going to fake the first one. So I, I kind of slow it down. I go around the first one. And then I go up. I see I only have one to beat. Teammate calls for the bump. I'm trying to go around him, but he bumps him out. So it didn't matter anyways. And so it kind of just worked out. I, I called it and I hit it. So absolutely simple simple i mean it's simple is that right and i i'm presuming that all three of you are there uh in the center together right and so and so how much of an advantage is it to have such a, a great facility to be able to just get together hang out in and, and not just of course play on the main stage like this but also to just scrim together and hang out uh it's it's incredible honestly i think if you if you don't have the 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 center or like even if you don't have the center but if you're not together and you're not playing together you're at a disadvantage than if you are playing together. I think being there with the teammates and being able to have that same energy and being able to feed off of one another and just really the comms are a lot better and just really the energy is so much better that it's unmatched. Yeah, it, it really is, honestly. I mean, you can you can tell how much of a difference it makes on the pitch as well. Uh, one thing I do want to ask, though, is actually about Benedictine themselves. We said on the broadcast multiple times, this is a team that has three incredibly mechanical players, um, but seem to miss a couple of really solid opportunities. Is that what you saw on the pitch as well? Did you see three absolutely nutty mechanical players and you had to find a way to stop them? Uh, yeah, I, I think they were all really solid together. Um... Obviously, there was a few misplays. Uh, I think you can say that on both sides. But uh, once we got into it, we, we kind of saw the speed. We were like, all right, let's play this at our own pace. So we kind of took them to our pace instead of letting them take us to their pace. And I think that was really helpful in getting us the win tonight. Lovely to hear you staying humble. You're up 2-0 <laughs> in the league and uh, well-deserved as well. Firm, you and the rest of the team, enjoy the rest of your evening. Good stuff. All right, thank you. You guys too. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you very much. Uh, and that brings to an end our wonderful broadcast trip in two very different series, uh, but four teams that can all go away, win or lose. And, and lots to look back on and lots of positives to take forward into week number three. Yeah, absolutely. I think all four teams that we saw on the broadcast today have a lot of things, you know, going well for them. A couple things that they need to work on going into that week number three. Uh, but solid teams all around. Great performances. A phenomenal seven game series to open up the evening. We see that sweep there and with that interview with Firm in the Esports Center at ONU. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I wish that that was a thing in college when I was in school many, many moons yeah. ago. Uh, just because it's just so darn cool to see what these programs are putting into and how much they're investing into esports for their students. And I just got to keep throwing this out there every chance that I get. Uh, if you happen to be an educator of any sort, please, if you do not have an esports program, just make one happen. It is the best thing you could possibly do uh, for your students. So ju just make it work. Amen to that. The industry is real. Believe it. And unfortunately, the reality is that our broadcast comes to an end. So thank you very much, Trippin, for your company this evening. A big thank you, of course, to the wonderful Leighton on production today. Many more weeks of the ECAC yet to come and plenty more to come here on Esports U and Esports U2 as well. Be sure to watch out on all the socials. Uh, lots of games to enjoy. Uh, no less Rocket League, of course. So thank you very much for your time, friends. I've just been Relic, and from all of us here, it's a very warm goodbye. Well, my name is Darren Wheeler. I'm a junior at Cornell College, and I play for the Overwatch and Smash Ultimate team there. I also play football and I enjoy playing Ultimate Frisbee as well. Wow, how do you have time for all that?
I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you just got to prioritize, right? Yeah. So how long have you been playing Overwatch and Smash, you said? Overwatch, I started playing the summer before I came to Cornell, which was in 2019. And since then, I've gone from bronze to master's ranking just by being on the team. Um, and Smash, I started when the game first came out, but I haven't played the game competitively until around the end of last year. And what made you want to start competing? At the time, our esports coach, we just started getting into like big tournaments and stuff. And so the t we went to a tournament where one of the PGR, one of the top 50 players in the world, was 